order to remove carbon from the atmosphere, you need to do two things. You need a machine that filters CO2 out of the air, and you need a safe and permanent storage space. Here in Iceland are basaltic rock formations, and they can very easily store CO2. You can inject CO2, the CO2 reacts with these rock formations and becomes solid carbonate one kilometer underground. Change only happens if you show solutions. Change won't happen by simply talking about potential solutions. There are ways to act. So we can act and we can do something about it. We want to spread this word and we want others to join us. Welcome indeed to the Direct Air Capture Summit for 2023. It's great to see so many of you here today. My name is Hannah Wise. I'm a journalist and moderator here in Switzerland, and it's my pleasure to moderate today's event. It isn't actually my first time here. I've been working with Climeworks now for about three, three and a half years. And if, like me, this also isn't your first time here at the Direct Air Capture Summit, you'll probably notice that it is bigger than ever. And I'm not just talking about the size of this venue and the fact that the people in the back row seem to be getting further and further away from me every single year. Uh, hello to you and welcome. And also hello to everyone joining us online. We have thousands of people from all different time zones uh, signing in to join us today. Very warm welcome to you as well. But it's important because of all the people who are joining us today, these are covering all sorts of industries. Everybody is starting to understand what Climeworks is doing. They are starting to understand direct air capture and the importance of carbon removal. So it's great to see so many different people uh, joining us today. Uh, but it's also, we have a lot to get through. Uh, through the course of our summit this year, which is why it will take place over a full day. And in that vein, our focus for today is high quality carbon removal solutions. Now, these are solutions that are permanent. These are solutions that are measurable, verifiable, and reportable. This is incredibly important for the industry as a whole. And we'll be deep diving into this topic along with things like the voluntary carbon market today, the challenges facing us when it comes to policy, and things like environmental justice as well. So we have a lot to get through. I promise you it's going to be a lot of fun though today. We have speakers that are at the forefront of this industry uh, to enlighten and entertain you today. We will have panel discussions where you will be able to put your questions to the panelists, we'll have keynotes, and we have some very special uh, video messages to share with you as well today. Now, before we get started, I do have a few health and safety uh, announcements to make for those of you who are here with us in person. Now, I know that it's 2023 and I probably don't need to say this, but this is obviously a no smoking venue. That includes e-cigarettes and vapes. If you wish to do so, then you can go out the front door to the right. There's a canopy and a designated place for you there. If you do hear the fire alarm today, please don't panic. Please don't go and gather your belongings from the cloakroom, but please do gather as quickly as possible in the assembly point, which is in the car park, just outside the front door here. If anyone requires any medical attention or any first aid, we do have a health and safety officer here with us. Um, he's just over here to the right of the stage as you're looking at it, but grab any climb worker here today and they will point you in the right direction. On a lighter note, as you came in today, you will have received a notebook and a pencil. Now, of course, that's so you can scribble down all the important information that we're going to share with you today. But also, and this is very cool, the pencil you can plant in a pot, and in a few months' time, you will hopefully have some cherry tomatoes. I'm not going to say whether or not I will be successful at that, but I'm sure we will all be uh, enjoying the fruits of these, this summit here today for many months to come, uh, whether that's cherry tomatoes or not. 
Okay, so let's get started. This morning we're going to dive into measurement reporting and verification. Uh, but before we do so, I think it wouldn't be the Climeworks Direct Air Capture Summit if we didn't hear from your co-hosts today. Let's look at the progress we've made since the last time we all met here together and a look at what the future holds. In a moment, we'll be hearing from Jan Wurzbacher, co-CEO and co-founder. But first, please welcome co-CEO and co-founder, Christoph Givald. Christoph, the floor is yours. I am so grateful to see so many of you coming, and I know many traveled for a very long distance, and it's night or a different time of the day. And I'd like to welcome you for this year's summit. Well, we're all meeting here because we're interested in direct air capture. And my interest and fascination for this topic goes back 16 years. And when I reflected this journey the past 16 years, I noticed a couple of things. The first one, I noticed nobody on Earth logged more mileage on researching and pushing commercial deployment of air capture than I did, which made me feel very old. So jokes aside, when I reflected the last 16 years, what I noticed is that the topic of air capture proceeds in widening circles. When Jan and I started 16 years ago, it was like day in and day out. Everything we did was technology development. The output of the global air capture industry at that time was one patent application per year in 2007. In 2022, this number increased to 100. That's the same rate as wind energy and solar had in the late 1990s uh, or 2000. And we all know what happened thereafter. The business model is shaping up. Only in the last month, in May 2023, more than $200 million have been committed to carbon dioxide removal services. And we're proud to hear from some of the champions on the market buying carbon removal. No. Nothing of that would happen without a powerful team. Since we last met here at the Air Capture Summit and today, Climeworks has been growing by 60%, and today we have more than 300 Climeworkers working on our mission. End of last year, we provided the world's first third-party verified carbon dioxide removal to the, to the market, and with that, we are advocating for high-quality carbon removal and we're setting the stage for policies to develop. And on a very big picture in the last 12 months, on the policy side, substantial development happens. The European Commission developed a framework how to certify high-quality permanent carbon removal. And in the United States, with the Inflation Reduction Act, we're seeing tax credits of $180 for air capture. And through the Department of Energy DACA program, $3.5 billion are in the room for deployment of air capture. Now, all of this is impressive development, and that's a strong pillar in working against climate change. But not only that, it's also the start of a new industry, and it creates a new job. And from our side, we, like air capture, makes the living for 300 people and 300 families. So air capture is real, and it is here to stay. Now, looking to the future, Bloomberg gave some numbers where the carbon removal industry could go. And they say, in 15 years from now, the market size of carbon removal can reach $1 trillion per year, which is very substantial acceleration from where we are today. Now, where are we today? Looking at a study published recently by Shell and the Boston Consulting Group, between 2015 and 2021, of all credits sold on the market, only 20% have been removals. Looking at the halfway, half time between today and the 15 years uh, mentioned by Bloomberg, it's 2030. Also, they're looking at how will the market shape up, and they're again uh, consulting a BCG report. The maturity of portfolios buying carbon credits at that time will have a share of more than 60% of carbon removals in their portfolio. Notable, 7% of all portfolios will run purely on carbon removals. 
This is the same takeaways from a different source. This graph is extracted from the Oxford principles. Don't take the numbers as exact, like take it as directional. What it says, it's exactly the same. In 2020, three years back, carbon credit portfolios, largely avoidance and some short-lived removals. In 2023 to 2025, like mid of this decade, we see high quality, long durations removals to pick up. They're in the low double digit percentage added to portfolios. That's the lower part of this curve, the dark blue part. By 2030, we have roughly a third of that in the portfolios. And by the point we reach net zero, which is assumed to be the case in 2050 on this graph here, the only thing as a credit that's to be allowed is high quality permanent carbon removal. Now, putting all of this together, this means very strong growth ahead for the carbon removal industry. And direct air capture will play a very critical role and a crucial role in scaling this market. Why? Because air capture can fulfill very important criteria. The first one, additionality doesn't get any easier than for air capture. Like, if we don't build plants and we don't run it, it's not happening. Like, again, additionality doesn't get any easier than that. Same on the measurement, reporting, and verification side, MRV. Other approaches have a hard time to have the same MRV as air capture has. We can measure exactly how much CO2 we capture, how much we store in the, in the ground, what the environmental impact is that we have that we need to subtract from the other two. And lastly, we don't need arable land. <clears throat> And the importance of this point can't be stressed enough. Some people say air capture can't be scaled to meaningful scales because it requires too much energy. In my point of view, this conclusion makes no sense. The world primary energy demand is 1% of the energy supplied by the sun to the planet, excluding water, just fo focusing on land mass, right? So again, Let's take a crazy extreme scenario. Assume we were to capture 40 to 50 gigatons of carbon dioxide from the air with air capture. This would require the same amount of energy as humanity is using today, the world's primary energy use, 170,000 terawatt hours. Or in other words, a percent of the energy the sun is supplying. Is it challenging? Yes. It's clearly a multi-decade, multi-trillion dollar effort to get there. Is it right to conclude air capture requires too much energy? No, in my point of view, not. And this is why not requiring arable land, which you can take as a synonym for energy, is such an important thing. And all of this translates into this graphic, which is extracted from the IPCC report, which gives the scaling potential of different CDR, carbon dioxide removal approaches. And in the low line, you see direct air capture with a lower bracket of five gigatons running all the way up to 40 gigatons. And well, I hope we never will use the right bracket and we have reduction efforts so we can focus on, on the lower brackets. But as the game ahead of us is a pure volume game, the importance of scaling and scaling potential can't be stressed enough. Now, relooping to the beginning, the widening circles. I'm sometimes asking myself whether in 16 years from now, we think about what we're discussing today and the output we're having today as the one patent in 2007. Probably it won't take 16 years, maybe only three years with the pace we're going. And I'm asking myself, what is beyond what we are currently thinking about? And once I've shown our plant close to Zurich to a person who I very much admire, and we talked about air capture and his vision why air capture exists and why it's so important. And he told me, in his point of view, air capture is so important because it can be a tool for the developed countries to pay back the debt it owns to the developing countries. And that adds another very important layer on a social and emotional level to solving the climate crisis. And solving the climate crisis is exactly what we are passionate about and what we care about, and this is why we commit to high quality carbon removal. Now, all of this is integrated in this plant. This is doing the job. That's the world's only plant currently capturing CO2 permanently from the air 
with third-party verification. Well, this is indeed a very beautiful picture, right? There's just one detail I would like to add here. The reality when operating that plant and many others out there in the field might, at many days, rather look like this. So with that, also very warm welcome from my end to the 2023 Direct Air Capture Summit. And thanks to Christoph for giving us a time warp of the developments in CDR, carbon dioxide removal, over the past 16 years, and in particular, the incredible momentum that we've picked up over the past two years. Thanks. thanks. <laughs> Now, when zooming in into what is it about actually doing direct air capture, I would like to share three principles or three thoughts, three topics with you that we believe are particularly important when predicting the scale-up and in particular the cost down or the cost development of direct air capture. And on top of only listening to us, to myself, what I recommend to all of you when thinking about that type of infrastructure and how to scale that and how to build that out is talk to the big industrials. Talk to those people who've built that type of infrastructure over the past century, not only the past couple of years. Talk to oil and gas, talk to the gas processing companies, and talk, talk to big construction companies who've done that for 100 years, who've built those plants, and who've operated them. And what you'll probably find out in these discussions is that when you look at this picture and think, well, this looks quite challenging, but maybe that was just a bad pick of a first location, being in Iceland with harsh winter conditions and, and so on, you might figure out, and then those people might tell you, well, you can take away the snow, but you can exchange it for a hurricane, or you can exchange it for a sandstorm, or just a lot of salt in the air. And at almost any location where you will build those plants, you will have at least one of them. And that makes it really, really challenging. Now, with that, topic number one. To successfully scale stuff like that, development needs to be driven from the field. So those people who will actually carry the majority of the work to de-risk those type of technologies, to make them more efficient, to make them more available, more performant, to scale them up, those will be the field engineers and the field operators being out there and making those, those plants alive. And those people will typically be faced with topics like this. Those are all original pictures from our Orca plant up in Iceland from the first year of operation. If you look at them, you might think, well, those, they are actually trivial. Those are problems the world has already solved. That's, that's not an issue. And you look at them and you might think, well, um, those are, those are trivial problems. They, they just picked the wrong material there for, for the design. Nevertheless, those type of problems, they were responsible for the vast majority of downtime, non-performance or underperformance or under-availability of the plant over the first year. That's, that's what it is really about. And also, just to give one example, if you zoom in there, it is not as trivial as it looks like. Again, if you look at the left-hand side picture, you might think, well, they just picked the wrong material. It is a corrosive atmosphere, and they picked something, something wrong. But you know, um, deployment in the field, it's not only about design. It's about multiple factors, for example, also supply chain. And in fact, this left-hand side picture is a result of a conscious decision of a compromise between wanting to install a new, a new type of design very, very quickly in the field, where, on the other hand, the lead time or the delivery time of the appropriate stainless steel part was more than 20 weeks. So just to give an example. So those are really, those are the topics that those folks are dealing with. Topic number two, I chose a particularly boring title, which is nomenclature. Now, it is a very important one, though. Because it happens again and again that two people talk about, in particular, a new industry, a new type of deploy technology like direct air capture. They think they talk about the same thing, but their numbers are actually a factor of two or three off. Not 20 or 30 percent, but a factor of two or three, because they are not talking the same things. And just to give one example, one tool that we have introduced at Climeworks and that I invite all of you to use when thinking in the space, and not only relevant to direct air capture, it is what we call the Capacity waterfall. So it's, it's a lot of details here. You don't need to look into, into all of that now, but just to give you a, 
the general concept. What, what is shown here is when we walk from the left-hand side to the right-hand side, we show what happens between the actual design nameplate capacity of a plant and then the actual tonnage of carbon dioxide removal that can be sold to a customer. And there are a couple of losses in between that will happen general, generally to, to all type of technology. So to name a few examples, the plant is never every time available. So you have to subtract. If you, if you, have, if you have design capacity, it will not run for 8,760 hours per year, which is the number of hours in a year. So you go down there. You will not recover all the CO2. There will be losses in there. People who work in CCS, carbon capture and storage, they know that very well. You will never be able to recover all of the CO2 that you have captured. And then maybe most importantly, here on the right-hand side, we have to think about net carbon removed. So we have to subtract gray emissions. So whatever the plant emits during this construction phase, during the operation, during the energy, we have to subtract that. Sounds trivial to many of you, but isn't if you look at the numbers that are out there in the field. And if you look at that as a whole, just as an example, if the nameplate capacity of the Orca plant, that's the left-hand side bar, is 4,000 tons, tons of CO2 captured from the air every year, then it's a real lot of hard work required to be able to sell 3,000 tons of net CDR to a customer at the end of the year. And there's another reason why I particularly like that graph. I think it's something really useful and handy. You know, there's a lot of dynamic in the field currently. A lot of innovation is happening, which is great. A lot of inventions coming up, a lot of laboratory scale developments. And from time to time, it happens to us, to me these days, that someone comes across and says, hey, I have this really new direct air capture technology. It's a $100 per ton technology. Uh, what do you think about that? How does it compare to other technologies that are out there? And what might typically happen is, well, I, I would ask two things. First, what are the dollars? We'll get to that in a minute. And the other thing I would do is I'll, I'll pull up this chart and walk through that chart together with that person and look at what it's actually about. And typically what we might end up is the finding that, well, maybe we're actually dealing with a $250 per ton technology here if and only if we can overcome those 20 challenges ahead of us, some of them we don't even know today. So building stuff like that is hard. And so we should at least get our numbers right. That is something that, that I want to make sure that as, as, a, as a whole domain, we can, we can get more scrutiny and we can get, uh, get better. And I think that that'll help all of us walking forward. Now, topic number three. The million dollar question, what about cost? And again, here we have to be careful with nomenclature and talk about the right thing. So when we talk about cost, that is a very simple way of representing what we mean. So cost per ton on the one hand, well, simple things everyone knows is capex and opex, which is typically together known as cost of goods sold, the cost. But then we should also add an overhead. We should add uh, SGNA, we should add margin. So that, that, that would be the total cost divided by the tons of CDR produced, so divided by the net, net CDR. Again, if you get that one by 30% off and that one by 40% off, you're a factor of two off, just roughly. So that, is, that is, goes kind of hand in hand with the previous one. And before sharing what our outlook and view on the cost of direct air capture is, I'll just want to show you this exemplary curve here, which is taken from the photovoltaics industry. And that's typically referred to as the so-called cost mountain. So what you see here is how the cost first estimates and then later demonstrated costs have developed over the decades, divided into three, uh, four different phases. And what you observe, and that was in the 1950s, you start with R&D-based cost estimates, which are typically ambitious, not too low, but also not too high either. Then you start implementing. So before you can start off reducing costs, you actually do have to walk up the cost mountain, walk up the cost curve. That is when you discover all the unknown unknowns. So you walk up, and you actually never know if you have really reached the top up until you are somewhere down there. That's, that's the tricky part of it. Well, at a certain point, you start with the deployment, you optimize, you make things better, and you go into maturation of the technology by maturation of the supply chain, making that more mature, uh, scaling up, building much, much, much more, 10x, 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 and then, then is the time when you really, really go down. Now, Obviously, I'll show a very similar graph for the direct air capture space. And again, I don't want to go into super detailed numbers here, but just show you the big picture, how we perceive the space today. If we start on the left-hand side, um, $600 to $800 uh, per ton, that's where our 
early first estimates were when we built our first plans. Uh, there was an a, a report back in 2011 stating that number. And we have walked up in the meantime. With current plans in the field, we are rather beyond the 1,000. Is that representative for long-term deployment? No, it is probably not, because we are relatively small scale. It's all first of its kind, but that's where we are today. And when we think about deployment and maturation, we think about the timescales of 2030 and 2050, with a big step, ch step change that is going to happen in this decade, in our opinion, going down to a range of 400 to 700 on our end, um, and then eventually, uh, when, when we talk about 2050, but not in 10 years from our 2050, we, we put a range of 100 to 300 uh, down here. We'll learn more about that. There will be speakers later who will say this is a very challenging range. There will be other speakers who might be more progressive on that uh, or in, in that range. But what is, what is common to all is that, that we have large ranges everywhere. And that is not due to unknown unknowns, which are there as well, but it also is really due to the fact that Wherever we build plants, what are the boundary conditions? Do we pay 20 cents per kilowatt hour or do we pay 80 cents per kilowatt hour of energy? How much, is, how much do we pay for sequestration? What's the cost of labor? All these factors will give you almost a plus minus 50% on the overall cost. So that is something that we should keep in mind. <clears throat> if we think about these two steps, just two words on why I said there will be a big step change this year, those of you who were here last year at the Direct Air Capture Summit, you remember those analogies I'd like to explain about how tricky it is to take CO2 out of the air. You have to move a lot amount of air. Uh, that means also that you cannot make a direct air capture system extremely small. Uh, there are just physical limits, so you cannot make it 10 times smaller. That's just physically not possible. But you can make it two times smaller, and that's something that we are working on. So we think we can compact the systems by a factor of two and at the same time, half the energy consumption. So those are by a next generation of sorbent materials, next generation of, of uh, uh, module design. This is what we will achieve, and that's what will lead us there. Over there, we will need not only one company, not only a handful of companies, but we will need the whole supply chain. We will need uh, maturation on the supply chain side. We need uh, maturation also on the project development side. We need low energy um, and low carbon uh, low cost and low carbon energy sources. We need cheap storage of CO2. So a lot has to happen down there around the core technology of direct air capture. And just very briefly, when we, when we discuss the step between here and there, what we do apply is learning rates. We're running many, many scenarios. And what we find is that for, for the direct air capture uh, modeling, we use learning rates at the range of 8 to 10 percent, broken down to the different components of a direct air capture system. We believe on the sorbent side, on the chemical technology side, there is a lot to learn. On other more mature uh, topics, uh, there is maybe less to learn. And when we compare this to other types of technologies, we see this, this could be even a bit conservative. If we look at very modular systems like PV, we saw learning rates of up to 20 percent. If we look at more uh, bulky systems, which are not that modular, like geothermal uh, or, or conventional process technology, then we are at, at 5 to 8 percent. So uh, that's where we park there in the middle, because a big DAC plant is, it has components of both of them. Now, going back to my very first principle, in order to do all this, what we need to do, first and foremost, is building stuff in the field. Another beautiful picture here, that is a 10x scale-up of the Orca plant. That is the mammoth plant that is up in construction in Iceland as we currently speak, with the main goal of keeping very fast iteration and learning cycles of our technology. So currently, what we are trying to do is, within every winter season in Iceland, deploy a new generation of parts of the technology to learn and get stuff more mature. In order to enable this, we need the market, and we'll hear a lot more about that. Just exemplary here, exemplarily here, a statement that we don't need to the whole market to buy direct air capture for any net, net, net zero targets. That's not possible. That's clear. There is an exemplary portfolio by the World Economic Forum saying we have 40, 40, and 20%, and 20% being the engineered solution. So this is something that can very well do the job. <clears throat> and on a more broadly picture, what do we need? We need the offtake. We need on the project development side, energy and storage. We need deploy technology. And I'm not saying when I speak about deployment that technology is not important. We are at the heart a technology company. We probably have the biggest technology team working in DAC currently. 100, more than 100 out of 350 people are working on the fundamentals, on sorbent material, on 
pore sizes, on functionalization, on, on materials. That is important, but what they do has to be driven from deployment and from the field. And we do need financing both on the public and on the private side. And with that, I'll finish for once, not with real pictures, but with images made by the computers. Uh, we're not talking about 10 next plants being built next year, but what you can expect by the end of this decade from our side is a handful of direct air capture hubs at the scale of a million tons per year. And you see a few pictures how this could look like. This is what is in our funnel today and we are working on, and you'll learn more about that in the next summits to come. I'm pretty confident about that. With that, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Christoph and Jan. I think that was a great insight into where we currently are, how far we've come, and what is still to be done. And that is the springboard for our next conversations. So our first guest today will be joined uh, just after his keynote speech by Jan for a small conversation. Um, but he is a pioneer in direct air capture with over 30 years experience. And he's going to tell us a little bit more about what it takes uh, for high quality carbon removal to reach scale. Please put your hands together for senior research engineer, Howard Herzog. Welcome, thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I uh, thank Climeworks for uh, inviting me to speak today. And um, I was going to say, the, uh, I was actually planning to come to the uh, first direct air capture summit that was to be held in 2020. Had my plane tickets and everything ready to go, and then COVID happened. So it's three years later, but I'm happy to be here and talk to you today. Do I have? Oops. Okay. So. Uh, what I'm going to talk about uh, is uh, trying to get up to scale, uh, CDR, carbon dioxide removal. There's quite a buzz about it, as we all know. Um, there's conventional wisdom, which I, I believe is that you cannot get to net zero without having significant amounts of carbon dioxide removal. The good news is there's a lot of options for doing this. Uh, the Things is, is also a lot of challenges. Uh, each of these has challenges. Some have different challenges, but they all are, are challenged. But even just the mitigation technologies of reducing our emissions, just about every one of those mitigation technologies is also challenged. So this is sort of par for the course in this field. So let me start by telling you what I believe the best way to remove CO2 from the air, and the best way to do it is not to release it to the air in the first place. I think that bears repeating. The best way to remove CO2 from the air is not to release it into the air in the first place. So, why do we want carbon dioxide removal? Well, there's a lot of hard to abate, expensive to abate emissions. These, some with energy sectors, such as airplanes, but there's also a lot in the agricultural sector. Uh, use of fertilizers puts up a lot of N2O. Uh, so we're going to really need these offsets to take uh, care of that to get to net zero. Uh, estimates for how much we're going to need, they vary over a large range. If you look in the literature, people range anywhere from uh, 2 gigatons a year to uh, up to 20. Um, what about going net negative? We see a lot about that. I, I feel going net negative is a big distraction at this point, talking about it. We can't even get to net negative till we get to net zero. That's not going to happen for at least uh, a few decades, uh, if not longer. And at that time, we'll know a lot more about the cost and the benefits of the different carbon dioxide removal technologies and can make informed opinions then about going net negative. In any case, uh, to get to net zero, we're going to need carbon dioxide removal to operate at a gigaton scale. That's a billion tons a year uh, or more. So. Why do we need to do it now? These technologies take a long time to develop and scale up. And if we don't start now, they're not going to be available to us at mid-century. I'm uh, going to focus now on direct air capture for the rest of my talk and on scaling that up. I wrote a book chapter that was published uh, in a book last August on different carbon dioxide removal technologies. And I'll be happy to send anybody a copy of the chapter. 
if they uh, email me at hjherzog at mit.edu and just refer to this uh, meeting here. So how do we scale up? I'm going to talk about three steps. In step one, you have to be brutally honest in assessing the challenges that you must overcome. I think Jan did a good uh, start here talking about some of the challenges that Climeworks has faced. Uh, for direct air capture, a lot of these challenges come out of the fact that CO2 in the air around us is very, very dilute, 0.04%. That means you have to process a lot of air to get uh, the CO2 out of it. Uh, this means you're going to have large capital, uh, large equipment cost, I'm sorry, large equipment sizes with uh, large capital cost. It also means you're going to have significant energy requirements. And these energy requirements really have to be fulfilled by zero carbon or at least low carbon energy uh, because as Jan told you, uh, you don't want to emit CO2 while you're capturing CO2. It defeats the purpose and you really only can take credit for the net amount of CO2 that you capture. And once again, you really need to operate 24-7 because you have expensive capital equipment sitting there. You don't want it idle and it's been all sorts of weather. Uh, step two is not to be fooled by simplistic analysis. And uh, over the years, I read the literature, and there are several things that get me, um, let me say, a little agitated. And I'm going to give three examples. Uh, the first example is people say, well, we use air as a feed stream, therefore we can site a plant anywhere. Well, it is true that there's air everywhere, but that doesn't mean you can site the plant anywhere. Siting uh, a plant is a, is a complex uh, process. It has many uh, aspects to it. Uh, you have to look at land availability, access to energy and other utilities, the permitting issues, uh, the meteorological conditions, accessibility of CO2 storage options, among other uh, issues. The second example is people say, since there's unlimited feedstock of air, you're free to choose any capture fraction you want. So I can take out 10% or 90% of the CO2 out of a given volume of air. Well, that statement is absolutely true and it's absolutely irrelevant. The capture fraction is determined by the design process. It's really a, a look at the trade-offs, the capital cost, operating cost, the operability of the plant, uh, the reliability of the operations. Example three, uh, since we use thermal energy for re regeneration in a lot of these plants, including the, the Climax plants, it can be supplied by waste heat. Once again, there's truth in this. There may be some opportunities to take advantage of this, but if you're going to be operating at a gigaton scale, those opportunities are only going to be a small fraction of the installations that you have out there. Step three, just do it, because that's how you learn. So look at this as a journey. You're going to have uh, certain requirements for the journey. First of all, you better have a good road map so you don't get lost. Uh, it's going to take a lot of hard work and determination, and it's going to take time and money. And it's probably going to take a lot more time and money uh, than you anticipate at the beginning. Uh, learning by doing is well proven and driving down cost. It, it improves it on many dimensions, you know, the designs of the plant, the operation, the materials you use. Uh, it also uh, is important in developing supply chains and understanding the permitting process and getting the uh, reporting and verification uh, systems down, among other things. Now, there is some good news on this journey. You may get help on the way. One thing uh, we hope we're going to get help on here is the availability of low-cost, low-carbon energy. As our grids decarbonize, if we can decarbonize them and keep the price low, that uh, is going to be very helpful. Then you don't have to go to places necessarily like Iceland to get this cheap, low-carbon energy. Also, uh, other things are being developed, like small modular nuclear reactors, which I think could be a very good fit for uh, direct air capture systems. Uh, a lot of work is going on today um, uh, in the uh, carbon capture community on, on developing storage hubs. And uh, I, I want to correct in the introduction, I haven't been working on direct air capture for 30 odd years, but on carbon capture and storage, it's only recently that, well, I wouldn't say recently, I, I've been following it for 20 years uh, uh, and, and written a couple papers. But anyways, these storage hubs uh, are an important part of the supply chain, and they can be developed uh, 
you know, outside of uh, uh, the, the direct air capture industry, you can take advantage of them. It gives you economies of scale for the storage of the CO2 and also broadens your geographic siting options. So I'm going to finish up here and, and come down to what I guess people always ask, what's the direct cost of direct air capture in the future? And I'm going to give you the definitive answer right now. Nobody really knows. Um, there's a lot that's written. Uh, numbers in the literature, you see a lot saying we're going to get $100 per ton of CO2. My analysis says, and the, uh, uh, the chapter I talked about talks about it in quite a bit of detail, um, says I just don't believe that's a realistic or credible goal. Um, and why is that important? Well, I think low-balling costs can result in a loss of credibility. And you really don't want to lose credibility, because if you lose your credibility, you're going to lose your access to the time and the money you need to scale up these processes. The good news is, though, that $100 per ton is not a magic number. What number does the direct air capture need to get to? Well, the answer is, what's the value of, of these negative emissions going to be in the future? And you just have to have a cost lower than that negative value to compete, I mean, uh, that uh, value of these negative emissions to compete in the market. So I'm going to just finish and say, let's see where the journey takes us. Thank you. Great, thanks, Howard, for, for sharing your, your insights uh, and, and uh, your uh, very long-standing experience in the field. And I think the good thing is that you saw many other industries, so you're not, you haven't started with direct air capture, but, but you saw uh, a lot of other technology maturing or not maturing uh, in, the, in the field. Uh, and, and I think that's, that's very important knowledge to dive into. So just want to follow up with a, with a couple of questions. Let's first start with the timeline and the speed. So you, you said, hey, let's just go and start. And so, so when I talk to you, I sense a, a sense of urgency. You say, if by 2050 we want to be there, we really need to get things done. Other people, in particular from other industries, might think, well, that's a really long time, 20, almost 30 years from now. Why, why, why do we need to start now if we want to be there in 2050? Or why can't we be there in 2030 or 2040? So what's your take on timelines when we talk about stuff like this? And why do we start, need to start now to be there in 2050? So, yeah, so I, I've spent my career in the energy industry. And um, you know, a lot of people look at sort of uh, the electronics industry, things like cell phones. They look how fast they came on and developed and, and, and the generations. But the amount of capital costs in a cell phone or other electronic devices is very small. When you're dealing with very high capital intensive industries, the timelines go a lot stronger. If we look at, the, say, some of the power industries, we have power plants operating today that have been over 50 years old. And so the, the generation time for turnover and, and, and for learning is hard. I, I can give you a, 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 let me give you one example that I, that I thought of. I went to the World Gas uh, Conference in uh, the mid-1990s, and at that point, uh, BP's chairman was John Brown, and he gave a talk there. And he talked about LNG and how LNG was going to be like crude oil, tankers going all over the world, and this and that. And, uh, and it was going to happen very fast. Well, that was you know, almost 30 years ago, and it's only recently that we start seeing his vision of the future starting to happen. And it still hasn't you know, hit the total scale yet, but it, it, it's, it's starting to scale up uh, thing. But that took 30 years, and uh, you know, there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, and par partially is it was some other innovations that needed to come in to make that happen. So um, I think you work on it, and there's going to be, I think, some innovations to come up because people are working on lots of different technologies that you can take advantage of, and you want to be primed when that comes to, uh, to move forward. Yeah. That makes, makes total sense. I think uh, those, those who are 
operating in the field, they feel it. Uh, things take long, right? Until <laughs> you build something, you, you learn from it, you, you can yep. translate it into a next learning that just takes time. We always speak about fast innovation cycles. Anything you can recommend to the players in those fields, how to become as fast as possible, even <laughs> though it's, it's an inert type well, of work you are, you're working on? Uh, yeah, I mean, what people have talked about in the design industry, obviously using computers and simulation so you don't have to go out and, and build everything. And that, can, that helps, and it, it, but only could take you so far uh, as you found out uh, uh, in Iceland when you, you go out and really learn. I think what's going to happen is when you start going into other environments, there's going to be a whole new set of learning uh, that, that, you, that you go there. So there's a lot you can anticipate, but there's always going to be things that uh, you don't anticipate. In fact, I, I've, projects I've seen is things that people anticipate, they do very well in, in getting it done. But then some simple things they, they, they don't anticipate, and it, it comes back to bite them. I remember a, a geothermal project, a big geothermal project uh, the United States government was doing about, uh, you know, what they call today enhanced geothermal systems. And they're so worried about getting the underground right. That worked perfectly. But the special pump they got failed, and it failed because the seals were wrong. And that not only delayed the project, it also gave the Department of Energy a, a reason to cancel the project. So uh, there, there's many components, and even, and even the smallest thing can come in and cause you a lot of trouble. Makes sense. I was speaking about harsh environments before, about hurricanes, snowstorms, mm -hmm. sandstorms, uh, all, all that that stuff. I think to sum that up, we can speak about the necessity for robustness of designs. If you were to judge, if you had like 100% of your time and effort, money to spend, uh, how, to what extent would you focus on robustness versus you would focus on, on efficiency, on performance upgrades of the system? So how, how important is this robustness, really? Well, I mean, Robustness isn't uh, sort of a, a sexy thing, you know, uh, because you, you, you know, it's like uh, putting a new roof on your house. It doesn't, you know, change as, as opposed to putting a beautiful garden in front of your house. Uh, you don't get the uh, acclimates, but it, it, without the robustness, it, 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 it could be trouble. And um, the, the thing is, you know, it depends. There's a whole range of uh, things you need to be resilient for. Some are, you know, once, one, uh, one time events that can happen, uh, uh, you know, once in a while. You know, say you put something in, in, in Texas and you have a hurricane come. So if you don't protect against the hurricane, it can knock your whole plant out. Um, but, you know, that may or may not harm you. You know, it, it may take, you know, it may not be this year or next year, maybe 20 years down the road. Other things are consistent, and if you don't do that, so say you're in an environment that you get a lot of, you know, say you're out in the desert and you get a lot of sand coming in. Well, you know, these, you, you use um, packing in, in these, um, uh, in, in the plants, and if that packing gets, you know, too much sand in there and don't need a lot to clog it up, I mean, that will just shut your plant down. So if you don't plan for that, so having the right type of, say, filters in your plant, then you're going to be... Uh, in trouble. And so, you know, these are, you know, so I think it's critical, but once again, you need, you just can't focus just on resiliency. You need to focus on everything. So, you know, I don't know what the correct percentage is, but um, uh, a, a lot of times people forget about resiliency because they just assume, you know, the best operating conditions. They're, they're in a rush to get out there. But uh, if you do that, you're going to run into big trouble. Makes sense. So let's talk about cost. Okay. You talk. You talked about cost. You gave your um, your expectations. You didn't give a lot of detailed numbers, <laughs> which which makes a lot of sense. Nevertheless, let me challenge you with the same I stated there. So I said, when talking about cost, we should know exactly what we are talking about. So I said, hey, it's not only important to have your capital cost, your operational cost, but there is a lot of overheads. Uh, you need to talk, you need to know are you talking cost per, per ton captured, cost per ton avoided, and so on. So what 
what are your what are the elements you have in mind um, and what so what is when, most important when there? I talk about cost I talk about all in cost and when you look in the literature of cost sometimes they just talk about the cost of the capture they don't talk about the cost of what we're going to do with the CO2 once we capture it so you really need to talk about all in cost you need to talk about it on a net basis net remove basis not a gross remove basis and uh, you know I I did give a number in my book chapter. I felt uh, compelled to. Um, and uh, so on that basis, I gave a number of between $600 and $1,000 per ton in the year 2030. I, don't wanna, I didn't want to look out further than that, because um, we'll see, we'll see um, how we progress then, and you can make the corrections. But I think that's still a fairly ambitious target. I saw your number, four, 400 to 700. We're not that far off in some ways, but um, you know, I, I think it's uh, still challenging. Uh, you and I were in a meeting uh, in the Netherlands two months ago, and we had uh, someone from Bechtel come in and uh, say, well, since 2020, uh, plant costs uh, in general of these type of plants have gone up 30%, the capital cost of it. So, you know, so when now when we talk about numbers, not only do we have to talk about numbers, but what year numbers are those and how the inflation will affect those also. Yeah, I think there's, there's one thing we can, we can probably certainly agree to. If inflation carries on as, as it currently does, we will never see a value of $100 per ton in the actual year, so we can only speak about $20, 23 so, so that's clear. So for a final one, let's uh, switch roles a little bit on, on your end. Uh, you've been for a long time, the person in the field who has raised the, wa the warning voice and said, hey, uh, we need to be brutally honest. Uh, we need to look at everything uh, that, that can go wrong, and a lot of things will go wrong. Uh, so don't be over-optimistic, because it'll lead us in the wrong direction. Now, I asked you for the last two minutes to switch sides. So let's, let's think about what do we what do you think needs to happen that we will end up in the very optimistic scenario? So, what, what, are, what are things that could go better than we so, thought? I mean, I think one thing, if you can get very cheap um, non-carbon energy, that would be helpful. And, they, and, and people say, oh, the, you know, the energy cost isn't that big a part. But if you get cheap energy, there's also trade-offs between capital and energy. So if you get cheap energy, that will help reduce your capital cost uh, uh, and it could be fairly significant. So I think that's number one. Second is, uh, you know, a materials issue. Um, the, the, you know, these are big machines. Uh, can we make them, uh, you know, they have to be hardened to the elements. So are there going to be materials? Are there going to be ways that we can build these big machines with uh, less, you know, uh, materials that are less expensive, you know, so automobiles, you know, they went from steel to aluminum and, and, and are still retained all their safety. Are there things like we can learn from that uh, that go into these machines? So I think those two things uh, uh, will be very important uh, to do. Which are other industries that you think this direct air capture industry can, can learn from, uh, which can bring such innovation? So you mentioned automotive uh, as one example, or the renewable energy industry. Um, I mean, I think, you know, in, in a system like yours, you're going to need replication. So, you know, so once again, solar, and, you know, I think solar is particularly um, benefited from replication uh, uh, of the uh, solar cells themselves uh, and, and getting those manufacturing costs down. And so I think, uh, you know, there, there are some examples you can learn from there. You know, as I say, a lot of the heavy industries, you know, the, the, the transportation industries, airplanes, cars, have gone to lightweight materials. Uh, I think uh, you can learn from that. Uh, so th those are a couple examples off the top of my head. I haven't thought about it that much but yeah super thanks well i recommend it to everyone uh, to not only listen to what is said here but also speak to those people who've been in the industry for years and decades and have seen that in the field so i guess you'll have 
pretty busy breaks uh, later on, so please make sure you take advantage of Howard being, being here uh, and, and ask him all the other questions you have open there. Thank you, okay. Howard. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'll take that. Thank you both very much indeed. Please take a seat. Now, it's very interesting what Howard was saying there about uh, what needs still to be done within the industry and innovating the technology that we already had is obviously a key part of it, but nobody can deny that while this industry is fast-paced, it is also already bursting with innovation. So maybe it's time that we take stock and look at exactly where we are when it comes to uh, the state of carbon dioxide removal. Our next session is going to be a panel discussion. Just a quick reminder that we'll be opening the floor to questions uh, shortly afterwards. And if you're joining us online, you can just type your questions straight into the event platform. So for this session, it's going to be hosted by Anka Gordso, who is a climate and energy journalist for Cypher, which focuses on clean technology. Anka, the floor is now yours. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. As Hannah said, my name is Anka Gurzu. I'm based in Brussels. I'm the EU correspondent for Cypher by Breakthrough Energy, where we cover the intersection of climate and technology. So we just heard in the previous uh, sessions about what it takes to build a carbon removal technology like DAC and the, the process that's, that's involved in it. And we also uh, heard about the momentum in the industry right now and what's at stake. So we know that carbon removal technologies are in the spotlight this year. So to prepare ourselves for the rest of the day and the uh, rest of the summit uh, discussions that will take place, we will take a bit of a step back right now and, and take a bit of the pulse, let's say, of the industry and discuss the state of the carbon dioxide uh, removal options have, out there. So for that, I'm going to uh, welcome on stage our uh, three panelists to join me. Uh, we have Julio Friedman. He's a chief scientist at Carbon Direct. We have Aaron Burns, CEO of Carbon 180, and Greg Nemet, professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Please join me. Have a seat. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Um, so we'll have an opportunity now to unpack some of the things that, that you heard were mentioned in the previous sessions. And I thought maybe one spicy way to start this panel discussion, uh, let's say, is to discuss something that has ruffled a bit some feathers in the last week um, in, the, in the carbon uh, dioxide removal community. And experts in the room and perhaps people watching online know what I'm talking about. It is a controversy around the draft assessment from a advisory body um, of the UN who described in a draft uh, version that a carbon uh, engineered carbon removal tech is, quote, technologically and economically unproven. And obviously, this has uh, provoked a strong response um, from the industry. And I think we're getting a bit of a sense of some of the nuances and um, how we got there. However, I do think um, it's important to, to get a reaction to that, to, to see what that reflects um, in terms of uh, the, the debate that's going on right now. And I would like to start with um, Aaron and maybe get your reaction to that and also um, if you can tell us a bit more um, um, of what, what you do and how that kind of uh, weaves in into this discussion. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Uh, can I... I, when we were doing our prep call, I asked if I was allowed to disagree and say slightly controversial things. My personal, not official Carbon 180 take is that honestly, one of the things that for me, seeing that controversy and the response from the sector, it was kind of exciting because, Julia, you remember this, but I remember when it was getting them to talk about carbon removal at all. It was that it's not the same as solar geoengineering. Um, and the fact that there's like a sector to respond. I don't know. You know, Carbon 180 started in 2015. My former colleagues, Noah and Gianna, who are both here today, uh, started at a time when people, you know, they called it carbon renewal. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, one of the perspectives I had in the work that we do, which 
candidly, is focused on U.S. federal policy, and so, you know, we don't spend a lot of time at the sort of U.N. level anymore, it was one, too, of, like, a moment where we could say at Carbon 180, we focus on U.S. federal policy because there was such a really robust response. I will say one one thing that did align with our work that we were really focused on and thinking about how we responded, you know, we did put a little bit of information about where the sector landed in our newsletter. And one of the things that, that does intersect with what we're focused on is really setting high quality standards. And I think that's something that's really important as we talk about creating a proven industry, creating one that is viable, that we have to think about what are high quality standards and making sure that we're doing carbon removal really well. Thanks. And, and Julio, what's your take on this uh, controversy? Um, uh, it's hard to be charitable about the UNFCCC's post. Um, this weekend in Bonn, it was a topic of substantial discussion, and it already seems like the UNFCCC is walking back mm. that particular document. Um, uh, it's not clear that it followed UNFCCC process, among other things. And so they're revisiting this. They have actually extended the comment period another two weeks for people to weigh in. Like Aaron, I was delighted by the response of a big, broad community, 110 comments or more coming back. One of the more uh, feisty comments I thought actually came from developing nations mm -hmm. that said, excuse me, are you going to cut off our revenue streams already? Which I thought was a useful point to make. Countries like Kenya and Uruguay and uh, Indonesia and uh, India are actually looking at Brazil. They're building plants. They're commissioning these plants now. I also think it was rather noteworthy that the UNFCCC note that came out, packed with errors and questionable things as it was, came out the same day that Microsoft spent $500 million buying 2.7 million tons of CO2 removal from a BEX plant that was built and operating already, that was already capturing and storing CO2 in the North Sea. So um, I believe that this will prove, uh, I'd love to get Greg's thoughts on this too, uh, that actually uh, there will already be substantially strong response to this in a way that will, in fact, liberate more opportunities around Article 6.4 uh, that will strengthen desire to do things under Article 6.2. I think we're going to actually see more exchange, more bilateral, more multinational action, and more investment as a consequence of this note. So what I'm hearing is that, yes, it wasn't like the, the right thing that came out, but the discussion that followed was very beneficial in a, in a way. Greg, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, spicy encouraging, but to me still puzzling because, you know, I spent the last three or four years working with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and the word that we use for carbon removal that was not only coming from the 200 or so scientists, for from, but from 193 countries was unavoidable. Mm -hmm. So that's one point. A second point is some follow-up work with some other IPC scientists on the state of carbon dioxide removal. We find that we need four to 10 gigatons by mid-century for net zero and that we only get about half of it, looking at the IPCC scenarios, from the natural carbon solution. So there's about half of the problem that's not being solved by this uh, solution. And the third thing I'd say is just that if you look at other technologies, we heard of some of this already, it takes a while to scale up. And so there's urgency in terms of developing these technologies. And so we need to be focusing on getting policy and getting action and getting MRV and all the other things we need to do uh, so it's puzzling to hear this comment, but I'm glad to think that response is actually uh, encouraging to hear what people You wanted to add something? Back Just to. very yeah. briefly, because I know we're on time. It's also, I want to go back to something Howard said at the beginning. All of the CO2 removal pathways have challenges. Mm -hmm. All of them do. That includes the nature-based pathways. And we've seen an awful lot of that this year, too. So, uh, and I'm not throwing shade or, or, or anything. We know we need the nature-based solutions in scale and abundance, but we need all the solutions in scale and abundance. I think that's, a, that's an interesting point. And, and before we get further into to that discussion, not to, to take for granted that everyone knows what all those solutions are. So I wonder if we could um, have a, like perhaps from Aaron a, a short sure. overview. We saw some slides um, before uh, outlining very briefly nature-based engineered solutions. But if you can walk us through a little bit what we're talking about. Sure. And Anke, you know this, but I just sprinted from the airport. So I missed those slides. So apologies <laughs> if I'm being repetitive. Um, so I will say, at Carbon 180, we sort of, at this point, think about them in three buckets. The engineered solutions, so things like direct air capture, some you know, bioenergy pathways, you know, the work that CHARM is doing. Um, 
The second is the land-based pathway. So we're looking at forestry. We spend a lot of time on agroforestry, in particular carbon-180. We spend a lot of time on soil carbon. Um, but the third bucket that we think of is actually ocean carbon removal. Uh, and we're really excited about the potential there. They're engineered. They're, we don't love the term natural uh, carbon removal, in part because of exactly what Julio said. Uh, if we look at the impacts to communities, nature-based solutions have very serious impacts. And we don't want to just talk about something that is, um, you know, we, we don't want to uh, sort of assign value. We want to talk about the opportunities of all of these pathways. Um, and I would say across all of those, what's really exciting is that we're seeing new technologies. We're seeing new opportunities. And, and that includes in land base. We're seeing new information and new sort of ways to think about durability in soil carbon. We're looking at you know, biotechnology and engineered biology. Um, you know, the, the ocean carbon removal space in particular, my colleague Dr. Si Feng Chen just put out our first ever uh, white paper on ocean carbon removal. There are tons of companies starting to scale up in this space. And so um, the, the last thing I'll say in this is um, to Julio's point too about trade-offs is um, if you're new to carbon removal or when I talk to reporters in the space, I always refer them. I need to remember the, the names of the students who made it, but there's a very simple online game called Road to 10 Gigatons. Mm -hmm. um, it's interactive and it's like a really great way if you haven't uh, spent a lot of time thinking about those trade-offs with carbon removal uh, to get in there, recognize we're going to need to scale massively and that, just like Julio said, you've got benefits and trade-offs to all pathways. So what I'm hearing is that there's a lot of options at different level of maturity um, so far and the, the, the message that I'm hearing is that we'll need to work with all of them, but they also have some limitations, right? Um, which ones are you putting your, your bets on, let's say, that, that would be a driving force in this field? Who wants to take that? I, do, I would bet on a broad portfolio because all of them have limitations, and the scale is so tremendous. If we're talking about 5 to 10 gigatons a year or 400 gigatons over the rest of the century, any small issues are going to become big issues, and you can mediate those issues by having a broad portfolio of bets. And some of them will learn, OK, the land use issues are just not acceptable, and we'll have to switch gears. Or we'll try something else and say the energy intensity is just too much, or the costs are too much, or whatever it is. But that's why some experimentation is really helpful, some deployment in the field, like we're actually seeing with DAC that we heard about this morning, to learn about these issues, to learn about the biodiversity effects, all of them. But a broad portfolio at this point is really where we need to go. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, sorry, so, you wanted so, to add? You know, Carbon Direct has voted with our feet. You know, we have a platform and we sell a portfolio in our platform, and the portfolio includes nature-based and engineered pathways. There's a few that I think are going to prove to be big players in the market. Uh, afforestation and reforestation is one of them. We're going to keep seeing that. It's going to keep being good. Biochar is coming on strong. Mm -hmm. uh, various forms of BECs, and I'm so pleased that we are now using the term bikers on a regular basis because, <laughs> you know, biomass carbon removal and storage. Biomass is not necessarily great energy, but it's great carbon removal. And so, not just charm, but also, again, this Ersted plant mm -hmm. uh, or Stockholm Exergy or these kinds of, of systems all look kind of interesting. I really believe that direct air capture is going to be huge. It, it is the backstop for all of this. It is the thing that we know we can deploy if we must. And I believe that things like mineralization and enhanced weathering are going to play big roles as well. For ocean removal, I'm optimistic, I'm interested. The challenges there are chiefly ones of things like monitoring, public acceptance, the London Convention of the Seas. <laughs> Is it legal to do it? These are a different class of questions, mm -hmm. but again, I could see those all playing a big role. One of the things that I, I wanna make sure is said in that context, on a gross level, these don't really compete with each other. Like Greg was saying, we know we need huge amounts of them. We need 10 gigatons right now. We're at tiny volumes. Like, we know we need to scale all of them. In point of fact, within the voluntary carbon market, they do compete. Mm -hmm. They compete on price. They compete on durability. They compete on time to contract. There's a number of other terms in the voluntary carbon market. And that has, uh, it is unclear how that will play out in the next, like, three years. It's easy to think about 2050. It's much harder to think about 2026. And so I do think we're going to see these different pathways competing for turf. I am hoping that we can all compete positively because we all know that we have to grow everything at incredible speed and scale to get to where we need to go. 
the other thing I would add quickly, and, and sort of in the context of what we were talking about, to, you know, with the UNFCCC is, these are also, when we're talking about carbon removal, we're talking about something that largely is, it's not creating a product, it's not creating energy, you're not, you, it's gonna cost something, that we're talking about a public good. And so, you know, obviously Carbon 180 focuses on US federal policy, and there are a number of reasons that that's true, but we're also not talking about these solutions scaling up and sort of, I don't even say a vacuum, just the, the market pieces that Julio's talking about, though those are important, is, you know, the US just spent, it's, you know, invested $3.5 billion in building four megaton director capture plans. The way that people, the UNFCCC, the way that federal policymakers, international policymakers understand and interact with carbon removal is going to be one of the biggest decision, like um, one, one of the biggest factors in deciding which of these is successful um, and if they are successful. And I think, you know, going back to standards, thinking about, you know, we use the term accountability a lot because we think about MRV, but how is MRV a t tool for accountability? My colleague Anu is going to talk about that later. And my colleague Agbad is going to talk about our environmental justice work. And so I think all of these pieces when we're talking about what's going to scale and those trade-offs, we have to think really holistically and we have to be thoughtful in how we communicate to policymakers about it because that, you know, again, that's going to be one of the biggest factors in, in how this scales. I just want to, that, that's very helpful for context, and, and I want to come back to this idea of a bit of, <clears throat> excuse me, what you're saying is going to be a competition for turf among these mm -hmm. technologies, and what you have said will be a broad portfolio of various um, kinds of technologies. I wonder if we can, like, do those kind of arguments go together, or do you see a little bit of a different perspective here? I mean, there may be something about the time frame, as mm. Julio said. In the near term, there's a lot of intense competition for capital, for policy support, uh, but in the longer term, because of the scale, we're going to need a broad set of technologies. So, but I think there's a, if there is some convergence because of near term cost advantages or other components that seem to be favorable, uh, it'll be helpful to have policy support for diversity because we want to have technological diversity and not pick a winner that looks low cost in the near term and put all our eggs in that basket. So preserving options for later is going to be an important part of the, the policy regime that's helpful here. Did you want to add something else? Yeah, yeah very much so. So uh, I think that the way that these, this competition will ultimately be managed and resolved is in fact through portfolios. Mm -hmm. We will end up combining these things as a function of cost and risk and speed and all these things. And already, our Carbon Direct, we see our customers are choosing different things. Some of our customers want 100% nature-based, because that's what they want. Mm -hmm. Other customers want 100% engineered, because that's what, we, what they want. And the fact that already the market is beginning to differentiate on additionality, on durability, on environmental justice, and they're beginning to invest along those lines, I think, again, suggests that we are going to see ultimately these things working together and combining in different portfolios to get to market better and faster. Mm -hmm. And of course, we're, we're here to talk about carbon dioxide removal technologies particularly, but if we are to uh, zoom out a bit in a net zero world, which is the world that we are aspiring towards, what role, like what percentage would these technologies play compared to, let's say, emission mitigation, right, emission okay. reduction? Carbon yeah. dioxide removal is mitigation. Carbon dioxide removal is mitigation. It is not reduction. There's reduction and there's removals and there's avoidance. Those are different things, but they're all mitigation. To your question, we don't really know, honestly, but the IPCC gives us numbers of 10 to 20 percent. That's a very robust number. 10 or 20 percent is the re irreducible fraction. It's the residual fraction. And one of the things I have to remind people is if we succeed at everything, if we succeed at efficiency and renewables and nuclear and electric vehicles and buildings and hydrogen, if we succeed at all of that, we will still need 10 gigatons. That's 20%. Like, it's, it is a huge number. And it's not because we hate those other things, it's just the arithmetic drives us to that outcome. Yeah, and I would say very specifically, you talked about net zero. We really focus, we're talking about net negative, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and in particular, we focus not on carbon removal as a way to offset and to get to net zero, but as a way to address legacy emissions. You need all of those other things, like Julio said, but we've put yeah, too much CO2 in the atmosphere already. Um, Sasha, my colleague, sent me, I forget exactly the PPM, but hitting a new record, maybe there was a story yet. 424, uh, we have too much CO2 in the atmosphere. We got to pull it out. Mm -hmm. Did you want to add something? Yeah, I mean, no, just to, 
I agree, it's 10 to 20 percent. I mean, the, the, where those numbers come from, we're doing 40 today, we need to get to net zero, and so that means four to eight is gonna be negative in 2050. That's, it's pretty simple math that way. But it also means, you know, one of the first things I say when I talk about carbon dioxide removal is near-term urgency is to reduce emissions, because that 80% or 90% of the problem, that's a really urgent imperative, and so those go together. And so when we start to talk about moral hazard or CDR taking away from emissions reductions, that's not the way to think about it, and I really hope people don't think about it that way, because we really need both. Okay, right. so, so but, but that gets to what Howard said. He, in his talk, he said, the best way to reduce, pull CO2 out of the air is to not emit it. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. we are all enthusiasts. But then, yeah. but then Greg already m uh, made a mention of the moral hazard, so maybe now it's a good time to, to tackle <laughs> that one as well. Um, so one, of, and I know you, you want to say things about that. Um, <laughs> so we are, when we are, the, the moral hazard, um, argument is the, the people who are against the, these technologies that we're discussing here today are, are afraid, let's say, that it will offer like a, a blank check for the uh, fossil fuel industry to keep emitting. And it's, it's important to just like unpack a little bit that also because there needs to be a response to those concerns. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering what your take is on that. And we'll start with Julio because I know that uh, you have a strong opinion. Yes. <laughs> so I, I don't even know where to begin. I could take 10 hours talking about why I disagree with the moral hazard perspective. Um, at its heart, it basically says you can't trust humans, they are too stupid to do the right thing, so we're gonna tell them what the right thing is to do. I don't believe any aspect of that. It also ignores the arithmetic. We must do this, that's the math. Um, I also don't think that CO2 removal in any way, shape, or form is business as usual. It's the opposite of business as usual. You're saying I'm taking stewardship of our emissions and we're paying a very large amount of money to manage it. Um, and and so, so sort of every aspect of it doesn't add up to me. Uh, it is easy to say, if you do this stupid thing stupidly, it will be stupid. And that's at the core of the moral hazard argument, and I simply can't agree. We just need, and, and I believe we're already in a post-moral hazard world. The moral hazard people slowed down deployment of point source capture for 20 years. They slowed down the deployment of adaptation investment for 10 years. They're slowing this down now. They have a 0% record of success. Hmm. And they don't speak for anybody, as near as I can tell. They don't speak for the global south. They don't speak for Eastern Europe. They don't speak for the Americas. I don't know who they speak for or claim to speak for. Erin, what's your, how, do, how would you address them? Because, you know. Sure. I think it's a totally, I mean, I, I guess I pretty strongly disagree with Julio in that. Um, I think it's a totally fair concern to have that people are going to do this poorly. Um, and I think for m most people, this is a, n you know, carbon removal is relatively a new, con you know, when we're talking again in the U.S. Po context, it's relatively new to them. And they're seeing a couple of groups talk about it when they're talking about oil and gas companies, not the most climate forward folks. They're hearing it from U.S. federal policymakers who are sometimes talking about this as a way to continue burning fossil fuels. There are policymakers, senators who are saying that. And so mm -hmm. to say that there's no basis for that concern, I think, is untrue. Um, but I do think that there is an opportunity to build trust with those folks. Now, look, if we break it down who they're talking for, you know, look, there are going to be some actors who I think are probably not um, particularly genuine, who have different theories of change, who are, their whole goal is to shut down carbon removal, and they're gonna use a more hazard argument, and it's, it's not a, a genuine concern that they have, it's just a tactic, and that's not who we work with. But I will say, the work that we've done with, say, environmental justice organizations, who very understandably are extremely concerned about how carbon removal might be deployed in their communities, how it might slow down uh, uh, reductions, uh, efforts, um, and the impacts that climate is already having on their communities, I, when we talk to them, a lot of that is building trust around sharing those values, understanding that. Again, the work that my colleague Ugbad, our Director of Environmental Justice, has led with her team, and it's been really successful. So I think that the other thing that I would disagree with uh, Julio on is the sort of, and it depends on the audience, but the approach. You know, I think for us it's been sort of starting from a place of listening with environmental justice organizations in particular to say, you know, like, what's going on? Like, why are you concerned about this? Let's talk about it. Let's talk about what our goals here are because I think that they're pretty shared. And, um, and I think the other thing has been changing how we think about carbon removal. I think we would have had a different answer at Carbon 180 
um, before UGBA came on and ran our started our environmental justice work. Um, and the outcome of that has been environmental justice organizations who are extremely excited about carbon removal. Mm -hmm. um, maybe not extremely, let me say. They're enthusiastic right. about carbon removal. Um, mm -hmm. and But in particular, we're seeing some of the environmental justice organizations that we work with go from saying, you know, I'm interested in soil carbon removal, I don't want to talk, talk carbon removal, to saying, you know, I'm actually really interested in direct air capture. Can we talk about what that would look like in my community? So again, there are certainly actors who are not mm -hmm. serious about that, but I also think it's, I don't know, to say it's not a real concern to that, you know. Well, but I didn't say that, and I want to be really clear about this. There, there are legitimate concerns that many groups might have about the deployment of carbon removal. Okay. That is not the same thing as the moral hazard argument. It's really, the moral hazard argument is the existence of Diet Coke means nobody will lose weight. It just, that, that, but in fact, there are going to be real questions, and I agree with everything you said, actually, that the, the legitimate concerns that communities have, that actors have, that politicians may misrepresent aspects of it, I think that's all genuine and accurate. I, if I may, I think one of the main differences between you two is that you're saying even if there are not very legitimate concerns, you would still be listening, right, to understand what, what mm. they're worried about or try to find a messaging to... Yeah, and look, we have, we work with different audiences, but certainly when we work with environmental justice organizations, it comes from a place of, you know, starting with shared values and understanding that the... <clears throat> The experience they have with climate change, the experience they have with extraction industries is extremely different than ours. I mean, you know, I just flew to Zurich. I'm sitting in this beautiful place. I talk to members of Congress. You know, I have, uh, you know, all of this access to power and change and I have this ability to, like, you know, make uh, big decisions for my family and what my life looks like. And I think starting from that place of understanding that our job and the carbon removal space, if we want to get to what is good carbon removal, not just carbon removal at scale, not just 10 gigatons, but 10 good gigatons, highly accountable, equitable and just, uh, focused on legacy emissions, that, that takes a lot of reflection for the carbon removal sector, where I think a lot of times, and I saw this in the point source side, I think we can think of ourselves as the underdogs or mm. the little guys in the room because you know we have to fight for attention or the UNFCCC is saying something negative about our work. But uh, in reality, I think that that's not the power dynamic at all. We can probably keep talking about the moral uh, hazard argument for a while, but I want to jump to Greg um, and shift a little bit. Um, one of the, the topics that came up um, also earlier today was the issue of cost. And I know that you wrote a book kind of tracing or tracking a little bit how the costs for solar PV have come down. What have you learned there that you think will be applicable in, in this situation? Yeah, the cost question. I mean, I like the way Howard put it um, this morning is just that we don't know what the cost will be. Um, but that doesn't mean that we're completely ignorant mm -hmm. about what cost will be. And one of the basis of evidence that we can use for an emerging technology that hasn't been really developed at megaton or gigaton scale yet is historical analogs. And things like solar give you an analog because, okay, solar's grown at 30% a year for more than 30 years and above 30% the last couple of years. And if we need to get, say, direct air capture to a gigaton a year by 2050, that's scaling up about 40% a year. So taking what we've done with solar and going a little bit faster but in the same ballpark, and then, but not as fast as what we're doing with electric vehicles, that's even mm. faster. And so we're kind of in between where we need to be with those two. But then you can look at these previous technologies and say not just how fast did they go, but how did they grow so quickly and how did the cost come down? And that's where things that come up, we heard this uh, word several times this morning, iteration. Having lots of chances for learning by doing, to improve, to change processes, to look at what's happening and to change it. It's a lot easier to do that with a small modular design where you have many, many units and many, many iterations than doing, say, a million ton a year plants and you only do a few of those and see how big you can get with those. There's just more chances to improve and if we're gonna take solar or wind or electric vehicles as an analog, that's the kind of processes that we need to look at and that involves standardization, equipment that you develop specifically for making these plants, developing infrastructure, developing supply chains, we heard about that all too. So that's not a 2023 problem, that's 2023 to 2030 something, but that's what worked with solar, and if we're gonna do something similar with direct air capture, that's what we need to look at. On the other hand, if you're going to go big, 
then you need other models. And I have a postdoc, and we've been looking at analogs for really large-scale direct air capture. And the one that we've come up with that seems to tick all the boxes as quite similar is an old one, and that's ammonia synthesis, mm. is creating ammonia for fertilizer and for munitions. That was something that happened over 100 years in the 20th century, but also grew at a rate that if direct air capture grew at that rate, would also get you a gigaton by 2050. And there it's things like system integration, really strong policy support, and making it a national priority, which it was for ammonia synthesis. So we've got different models to use. Small modular has gone quickly, like solar and wind and electric vehicles, but then we have large system integration intensive that have also been able to scale, but they use different techniques for that. So we've got a couple directions to go. Yeah, and the research is ongoing as well. Ongoing, yeah. yeah, all, yeah. So before, by the way, we're going to open for questions very soon, um, so think of them. Uh, but before we move to that, just want to get you, uh, all of you to reflect in maybe just a few words, max one sentence, um, of what do you think needs to happen in the next year, so just very short term, one year, um, to, to see even more momentum, to see more development in this industry. Greg, we'll start with you and come this way. Okay, yeah, I would say just keep it short, experimentation across a broad portfolio and developing many different ways with technology to do monitoring, reporting, and verification. I would say those are priorities that in a year from now, if we're seeing a lot of progress on that, I'd be very encouraged. In the longer term, it's about expectations that there'll be this rising and growing demand. That has been crucial for electric vehicles and solar and these other things that have grown. Expectations are crucial. And then at some point, not now, but in maybe 10 years, convergence on a dominant design. So we start building a lot of the same things because we know they work and they're reliable, and then we really can get the costs out. And Jan's curve that showed costs going up and then starting to come down that convergence section is where you start to really go down. And so that's beyond a year, but that's coming up. So you give me a year, medium term and long term. Yeah. <laughs> but just one year, what do you think would be important? Um, really strong standards and the beginning of big infrastructure investments. Got it. Julio? Buyers. Buyers. There's not enough buyers. And frankly, if in the next year we can get a handful of governments, like the US government or the Canadian government or the European Union, to buy CO2 removal as a service, that would go a very long way towards deployment. Got it. So buyer. So now um, Hannah is going to come back on stage, and we're going to take some questions. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Indeed, That was really interesting. Do we have any questions uh, to start in the room? Yes, if we can just bring a microphone uh, to you here. It's just coming along your left-hand side. And that makes sure that uh, everyone joining us online can actually hear your question. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Axel Michaelova from Perspectives and University of Zurich. My question relates to ocean removals. We've seen certain carbon cowboys trying ocean removals more than 10 years ago on the Canadian West Coast that contaminated the whole field and led to the London Convention, London Protocol, essentially prohibiting it. Now we see all these starts up, startups that don't consider this regulatory environment. And Julio, you mentioned it. How do you think we can overcome this problem? Who would like to take that? Maybe Aaron, because... Uh, my quick answer is my colleague, again, Dr. Si Feng Chen, has a paper, carbon180.org, um, talking exactly about what, what's needed for responsible ocean carbon removal deployment. I do think that small-scale trials, you know, again, we're focused on the US, but more proactive regulatory work uh, through the Environmental Protection Agency at the US, more coordination at an international level, and starting small-scale trials. But I think you need to build up that policy infrastructure quick, because folks are moving forward. Yeah, Axel, to your point, I, I, first of all, I agree with that. Second, I, I agree that small-scale pilots managed would help. If you know something, that will go a long way. At heart, people love the ocean. There's a deep personal connection to the ocean and human beings. And we tried this 20 years ago, and the response we got back overwhelmingly was, we've screwed up the air. Do you want to fix it by screwing up the ocean? And we better have a better answer for that before we start deploying. Thank you. Do Thank we you have very much. More Any other questions here in the room? Yes, we have one in the middle towards the back, down the center aisle. Thank you very much. Just wait for the microphone, please. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Uh, Nicholas Seidsberger, Global Thermostat. Uh, I just want to first thank Jan and Christoph for hosting us again. This is 
just amazing to see all these people talking about this. Um, Julio, I happen to agree with you 100% on your point about buyers being top priority for the near term. Um, can you elaborate uh, for the rest of us why you think um, in the position that you sit, not in a direct direct capture company, but in looking at the broad uh, marketplace mm -hmm. and its ev evolution, why you isolated buyers as your top priority? Uh, happy to. Uh, let's start by the fact that I was schooled years ago by uh, Mr. Wurzbacher and Mr. Gebald, who basically said the only thing we lack is customers. If we had customers, we could build faster. Um, in point of fact, in our business in Carbon Direct, uh, this is the point. Broadly, there's no supply, there's no demand, there's no transparency, there's no market, there's no contracting. Other than that, it's perfect, right? So uh, the, the challenge, though, is the rate-limiting step is actually demand. There are companies that want to build. There are projects that want to deploy. They need a firm offtake before they can go to the bank. And it's hard to get a 10-year offtake for 100,000 tons a year. It's just hard to get that. It's part of the reason why I'm so enthusiastic, and Aaron uh, and Carbon 180 have been leading in this arena for a long time, why I think government procurement will prove to be an essential piece. All, all, all important technology over human history has scaled through government procurement. Hmm. Doesn't matter whether it's semiconductors and flat screen TVs, in energy it's LEDs, it's batteries, it's solar panels, wind farms, nuclear plants, all of these were bought by governments. The idea that somehow this can be birthed Athena-like into the world without buyers of that scale and commitment is, I think, hard to believe. Thank you very much indeed. I, I would like to get to some of the questions that have been sent online um, as well today. And quite an interesting one. I mean, you were talking earlier about all the battles that are being fought and won all the time. But what about the more internal battles within uh, the industry uh, on the, the importance of standards? Do you see fault lines, for example, emerging between the CDR communities on the question of, you know, say, for example, how we define high quality or, or permanence? And how do we ensure that we maintain the ultimate goal, which is, of course, um, trying to fight climate change? Maybe, Greg, you could Yeah, start. I mean, I think it's time for a robust discussion about that. I think we're appreciating that these technologies work so differently, and they're measured so differently. The oceans, the, you know, agriculture or forest-based solutions, and the uh, machine solutions, all of them have different elements that require life cycle analysis of some sort and accounting for time and, and potentially accounting for the liability that happens when a removal no longer is stable and there. And so people have talked about a carbon central bank to account for some of that. And so, yeah, it's a time to come up with technologies, which U.S. Department of Energy is working on for sensing fluxes of carbon and storage, and then also thinking about policies that can create the right incentives for that because we're appreciating that these technologies are quite diverse in how they function and, and where the carbon goes and, and how much it stays. Well, I certainly hope we have some of that discussion, or at least start that discussion here today. Yeah. Just one final question in the last minute or so. Um, in order for direct air capture to truly reduce atmospheric CO2 concentration, it can't just be used as an offset. Any idea of who actually pays for direct air capture in a scenario when it truly reduces atmospheric CO2 concentration and not just used as an offset. I know many of the partners here at Climeworks already do that, but you know, is, the, is there a real understanding you know, between the differences of, you know, offsetting and really, you know, reducing the historical. Yep, so I want to hear what Aaron says in just a second. First of all, we at Carbon Direct, we do not use the word offset ever, ever. It's carbon avoidance, carbon reduction, carbon removal. Those are the services that are provided in this space. When you call things an offset, it rather deliberately conflates these things. So keep the services separately. If you're talking about CO2 removal purchases as a service, Right now, that's being done by the voluntary market. I think fundamentally for this to scale, it will have to move to a compliance market. And in fact, in Canada, they are developing these exact standards for compliance with their $170 a ton carbon tax. Mm. And they are trying to create a pathway that car direct air capture is, and they are making standard for direct air capture, for BECs, they're doing these different things, just like Greg was saying. Those standards, that clarity is a compliance mechanism with the carbon tax is in fact a way to, to move that market and scale it? I don't think there's a great understanding about the need for this mm -hmm. to be, in, in our perspective, almost entirely focused on legacy emissions. And I think that even when there is a bit of that distinction between, um, you know, functioning as 
an offset or uh, you know, allowing the continued use of fossil fuels or addressing legacy emissions that a lot of folks are really talking about this as, you know, unfortunately still, at least in the U.S. context, um, as something that's going to allow us to continue to emit fossil fuels. As we all know, looking at the climate math, that's just not the case. Okay, super. Thank you all so much for your insights. Obviously, still a long way to go on many fronts. Um, we'll be digging into uh, standardization within the industry next, so I think that's an appropriate topic for us to jump to. We'll be back at the top of the hour. Uh, for now, though, it's time for a uh, much-earned coffee break, networking, and collaboration. Enjoy. Hello, hello, welcome back. Please come on in, take a seat, because we're going to start part two of our session together today. And I hope you're all feeling refreshed uh, and energized after our short break there. Now, in this section of time, over the next 90 minutes or so, we are really going to dig down into high quality carbon removal solutions. So, what are they exactly? How do we achieve this? How do we verify and monitor them? And that really will be the focus of the next session. But first of all, we're going to hear uh, from our keynote speaker for this session. And he is going to talk a little bit about how carbon dioxide removal really fits into the conversations that we're having right now when it comes to climate and the challenges there. He is currently the Chief Climate Solutions Officer at Time CO2, and he's the former Chief Scientist at XPRIZE. Please welcome Dr. Marcus Extavor. Hey everybody, I hope you had a good coffee. Uh, thank you for the warm introduction and thank you to our hosts, not just for doing the work that you do, but for putting on events like this where we can actually get together and exchange ideas. So I'm still thinking a lot about carbon removal day to day, week to week, but I'm also thinking a little more broadly about how that conversation and how this topic fits into the broader climate change discussion. Um, I'm using a metaphor, these little circles on my title slide, the, uh, the big circle is the climate change conversation, and the blue circle is the carbon removal community. We're not quite in the in club yet. It's taken some time to get to this point, um, but I think we're making great progress. It's a question of mutual understanding. What I'd like to do today is offer just a couple of ideas to reflect on and, and hopefully say some things that maybe you disagree with so you can uh, come find me later. I'm here representing Time CO2, which is a new business trying to help other businesses take credible action on climate and nature. But it's also connected to the media company Time. And I'm explaining this because I'm thinking a lot more, even though I am a physicist and engineer in disguise, I'm thinking a lot more about things like narrative and analogy um, and mood and conversation and storytelling. We do this through uh, portfolios of quality solutions, but also storytelling. So this is what I do, and this is what I'm going to talk a little bit about more broadly today. This is a mental model that helps me personally think about where carbon removal and climate action fits into today's conversation. It's extremely simple, um, but I personally find it helpful. Uh, there are three stages of climate action. Uh, I, used to, I, I originally conceived of this thinking about carbon removal, but I think it applies to climate action. So in the beginning, there was nothing. In fact, we didn't even realize that our fossil economy was a problem. A few people did, but I'm talking about a couple centuries ago. This is the blissful ignorance period. Um, it's responsible for our quality of life today, but we now know we have a serious problem. For the last generation or so, we've been in the second period, climate action one. We knew there was a problem, but we didn't really want to do anything about it. We delayed, we convinced ourselves, some of us more than others convinced the rest of us that this was not a real problem, let's delay, it's not a real thing. But the point is, I think we're entering a new era, and that's where I want to focus on today. I don't think we're fully there yet, but I think we're at the cusp of this new era, the Climate Action 2.0. It's opportunity seeking. People are realizing that not only is this a problem that needs to be solved, but there's actually an opportunity for community building, for new investment, for growth, um, for actually solving climate and nature problems. And this is drawing in a lot of outside actors and new energy and new conversation. This is very exciting. It me I think carbon removal is part of this. It's a topic that wasn't part of the traditional flow of climate conversation, has now entered that flow. 
but this also applies to things like climate finance, economics, community building, business, media. Five years ago, a lot of those communities just weren't focused on climate, and they are beginning to. This is a good thing. It's confusing. It means there is different languages we have to navigate, but it's overall a good thing. But we're at the beginning. Carbon removal is in its infancy. In some ways, it's like a child. Okay, so this is my bullet point list of characteristics of children. I'm going to talk about the couple in, in bold. The point here is that it's early days, and it really depends on your point of view how you see this new thing. This is a picture of my daughter, my youngest daughter. When I whip up my phone and ask her to say, hey, post for the camera, sometimes she does things like this. All right? Now, I'm her father, so I look at this and I think, oh, what a sweet kid. Imagine the person she'll become one day. But you, you could be forgiven, if you don't care about her like I do, for just thinking, what a ridiculous child doing an impersonation of an adult. It's crazy. I think CDR looks like this to a lot of people, especially a lot of climate people. What a ridiculous child pretending that it's a real climate solution. Who do they think they are? These are some of the dynamics at play in the broader climate world for this year in particular. I'm not going to read all these points, but there's a couple things to be familiar with. As we head into COP28, this is the year of the global stock take. This is a formal um, Paris Agreement process by which we're taking stock of how far we've come against our Paris Agreement goals. Uh, I'm going to speak a little bit about more of that later. Uh, yes, we are still debating exactly how to achieve those goals. There's going to be a lot of focus on the energy system because COP is in the UAE, uh, which is an oil-producing nation, as we all know, not the only one, but that's going to be at the top of the agenda. So this is a little bit of the context. Article 6 is in here. We're going to hear more about that today. Some of the context for climate and carbon removal conversations, in particular this year. This is uh, my interpretation of how I spoke about those two circles coming together, how carbon removal has sort of being perceived and is slowly being integrated into the mainstream climate conversation. But look, let's face it, it's been kind of a bumpy road. So on the left is a rough timeline of mentions and conversation around carbon removal in the UN FCCC world and, and the accompanying communities. And on the right are my sort of casual interpretations of that mood. So at the beginning, not at the beginning, but even as far back as the fourth assessment report, that was 2007, there's no mention of carbon removal. Carbon removal wasn't really considered a thing by that community. There was a little bit of mention of CCS, so I call it just not a relevant thing, at least you know, in that interpretation. Cutting ahead to 2015, yes, there was some mention of carbon removal, but look, it was a little bit hostile. Maybe this is necessary, but probably not, so please shut up about it. 2018, for me, was a real turning point. This was the publication of the 1.5 degree report. This was the first time that that community said out loud, uh, there is no way to achieve 1.5 without significant overshoot, without some carbon removal. I think for a lot of people in carbon removal, this is uh, how they started to count time as time zero. Um, a lot of people have been working on it a lot longer than that. Um, that's around the time that, uh, 2015 is around the time that I personally started to think about this topic. Um, we have gone through and are still going through what I'm going to call the trillion trees conversation. OK, let's remove carbon, but let's do it with trees. No, trees are stupid. Yes, it's all trees. No, it's not trees. This is sort of ongoing. It's a little bit exhausting. But it's part of the conversation. Uh, if you have been ever asked, why do you hate trees, uh, join the club. Let me find the camera and say into the camera, I love trees. Uh, the, those are obviously part of it. But th that's, that has been a conversation that persists in the background. Most recently, we had the sixth assessment report that started to get a little bit more fine about estimates of how much carbon removal we need, et cetera. I won't touch on the recent Article 6.4 discussion. I think others are going to speak to that, but that is bubbling in the background. Interesting to see how the progression um, has come. I think that something that we see in that progression is the changing attitudes towards carbon removal, its role as a climate solution, and what role it can play. I firmly believe that there are a lot of misunderstandings between all kinds of communities about how carbon removal works, what it is, and how it should proceed. And I think a lot of those are related to language. But one of the reasons, I believe, is that we often discuss carbon removal at this level. This is a picture taken out of the CDR primer. Uh, this is me reproducing an image reprodu which was produced by somebody else, Glenn Peters originally. It shows carbon removal in the context of this cartoon drawing. Uh, you know, in physics, we call things like this cartoons. It's not data. It's just a sketch. 
but it shows global greenhouse gas concentrations. This shows the global outcome of carbon removal. But remember, carbon removal is an outcome. The thing with this figure is that it's fantastic for discussing the outcome, but it gives you zero information, exactly zero, about how to finance a project, what the risks will be, whether you would want to live next to that project, how to proceed, who might be impacted, and what it looks and smells like. Even pictures like this, and some of the photos that uh, Christian and Jan showed us earlier and others, already give us more information about what might be difficult, what the strengths and weaknesses of different carbon removal solutions might be. I believe that the sooner and the more rapidly we get into discussing specific solutions and their specific implementation, a little bit like we are today with direct air capture, the more we can reach understanding, but also figure out where the risks and trade-offs will be. I'll just say too that, you know, whereas this is the domain of, let's say, climate scientists, this is the domain of project developers, many of whom are in the room as well. All right, this is a busy table. Um, it's not necessary to read all the words. Let me just explain what it is. This is my attempt at starting to come up with helpful analogies to test uh, different climate solutions, but also uh, test different carbon removal approaches against climate solutions. But also, in my, in my journeys and in my, in my work, I try to explain these things in terms that people already understand. The left-hand column is a list of uh, commonly discussed carbon removal pathways. I put direct air capture and storage right at the top. In the center are some of the very high-level features, not of the outcomes, remember, but of the nature of the system and the service itself. And on the right-hand side, this is a work in progress, but I'm starting to sketch out analogies for existing systems. Greg, in the previous uh, session, mentioned uh, ammonia as a possible analogy for DAC. So I'll just, I'll just point out a couple to you get the idea. DAC and storage, what does this look like? I'll put on my engineer's hat. It looks like an air handling service. It has steel and construction. You use phrases like feed and fid and it's infrastructure. It's engineering language. It's a closed operating system. Some possible analogies might be ammonia, onshore wind, it's reminiscent of drilling and pipelines for subsurface injection. Uh, soil carbon, on the other hand, has to do with soil handling, tilling and mixing, agriculture, thinking about microbiome. It is closer to communities. People tend to live near where food is produced. Uh, it's an open system. Some analogies there might be, obviously, food and agriculture. I think you get the idea. I then did an overlay because sometimes, you know, the engineer in me might think these are very helpful operational analogies, but even language has power. It's important to recognize that for some of these things, for some of these words, uh, they're, they're not actually helpful. They may push people away or raise the type of concerns that are really important to address. Moral hazard came up on the previous panel, and we're going to see something like that here too. Green is good, red is bad, orange is uncertain. These are, this, is, this is not very deep, but I'm really trying to work through. So, what I'm trying to indicate here are common positive or negative associations with these type of analogies. In North America, where I live, or in Canada, where I'm from, or the United States, where I work, pipelines are bad. People are generally against pipeline. If you start talking about pipelines and drilling, you're not going to get a positive response. So the unsuspecting engineer might come in all happy and gung-ho with a great project plan, and as soon as the conversation turns into those topics, uh, the mood might change. On the other hand, for enhanced rock weathering, for instance, the idea of mine tailings, generally mining is not publicly loved, remediation of land is considered good, and agriculture, depending on the style, is mixed. I think you get the idea. Again, this is not data. These are uh, ideas that I'm working with. This is a little bit of data. This is a reproduction of a public study of, on the horizontal axis, how much do you dread this solution, or how little do you dread it, on the uh, sorry, on the vertical axis. On the horizontal axis is how well known is the solution versus how unknown it is. And the colors represent whether people consider these solutions to be natural or unnatural. This is totally subjective. This is one step up from an anecdote. Only about 100 people were surveyed. Um, I'm citing the reference of this article published a couple years ago. Um, I find it quite interesting, and I'm looking forward to seeing more of this. Not, not surprisingly, re- or afforestation, people have a pretty positive view. When I say people, remember, 100 people were surveyed. Direct air capture in CCS is the black dot, uh, only because it was considered to be the least natural, and I'm going to speak more about that later, and all the other ones fall in between. Again, this is very interesting, not just because I think it informs public attitudes, but I really think this informs some of the conversation in broader climate communities. Zooming out, 
It's a challenging time for climate solutions. This is a list of bad and scary things. These are all things that are happening in the world that will be difficult for the carbon removal community and all climate solutions. Um, the global stock take I'll highlight, I think we should prepare ourselves for bad news. In the same way that news headlines are often bad after COP, the global stock take headlines might be also bad uh, because it's a, a broader and more deliberative and longer term process. These aren't showstoppers, these aren't things we cannot overcome, but they are challenges. One of the things that I'm most optimistic about is things like this. These are things that have also changed. These are broader social dynamics that have changed in the last few years. Climate is a part of culture now. Every media organization talks about climate. Every business is expected to have a climate strategy. That was not the case a decade ago. Young people are beyond motivated. I realize every time you say young people, I think you might age a decade. But yeah, as I'm getting old, I can talk about young people. We know we have the money. We have more private capital than we ever have in our history. It's not a money problem. And there are a lot more people and ideas coming into this space. So I'm just going to close now with a couple of ideas to share with you. I talked about language and analogy. There are a few ideas that I think may be holding our community back. Moral hazard came up earlier. Here are a couple others. Um, you've probably come across these. I think these are all truthy. They're not quite true, but they seem or sound like they could be true. I never uh, get upset for anyone for asking a question, but I think some of these questions do have answers. I'm not going to answer all of them today, but I'll answer uh, the second one. Carbon removal gets too much money. That's not the case. It gets, uh, type on my slide, less than 0.1% of global philanthropy, $800 billion of global philanthropy total. Thank you, Climate Works Foundation. Um, about 1% of that goes to climate change mitigation. Of that 1%, a smaller fraction goes to carbon removal. When we look at public and private spending, uh, this is from IEA, World Energy Investment. You can see the dark green, renewables are going up, wonderful. Uh, in the very top dark purple slice is all things connected to low emissions fuels and CCUS. Carbon removal isn't even split out. Uh, it's a tiny fraction. Uh, I haven't written down the number, but it's about 1%. These are ideas that persist. They bubble around in the community. You'll come across them. Um, you, may, you may think that some of these are absolutely true. You may think they're myths. Uh, I'd love to chat more about that at coffee. But I'll just close there and say thank you for your attention. Um, I hope I've given you some ideas about the power of language and analogy and different ideas to think about how carbon removal is situated in the broader climate change conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Marcus. I think it was really interesting what you were saying about um, all these questions that still remain when it comes to carbon uh, dioxide removal. And I guess our next topic goes somewhere in addressing that because if we want to progress, we have to garner trust. And the way that we are going to do that is through three little wet letters, M, R, V. It seems that there are lots of three letter acronyms in this industry, but M, R, V, is monitoring, reporting, and verification, because this is what's really going to drive the industry forward, help shape the future, and win trust with our partners. So let's dig into that in a new panel discussion. And for that, I'm very pleased to welcome for a look at some of the challenges and opportunities with this. Uh, I'd like to welcome Dr. Claire um, Nelson from Columbia University. She's also the co-founder and chief technology officer for Sela, which actually removes CO2 and turns it into rock for safe and permanent storage. So Claire, uh, the floor is now yours. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Thank you all for coming, and thanks to Climeworks for hosting this summit. So, as Hannah just said, we're going to talk today about MRV, which hopefully everyone knows what that is and why it's important, but just in case people still have lingering doubts, we have an excellent panelists here today to share with you their insights. Um, so, I'm Dr. Claire Nelson. I'm the co-founder and chief technology officer of Sela, 
and we do in-situ mineralization for permanent carbon storage, and I'm also a research scientist at Columbia. So we'll take a minute for our panelists to introduce themselves and their organizations, um, starting with you, Ted. Yeah, thank you. And first, I just want to say a big thank you to Climeworks for organizing this. It's really great to have an event to bring everyone together, and big shout out to Tristan and, and Julie who put this all together. Um, yeah, I'm Ted, uh, I'm Director of Carbon Removal at B Zero Carbon. Um, my background's really in the policy world. I used to run the climate research at Think Tank in London called Onward. Um, and I actually had this uh, one of the light bulb moments that got me into CDR when I was there was actually a conversation with Christoph Butler. I don't think I've actually ever told him that um, uh, back in sort of 2020 uh, when I was doing a lot of work on future tech innovation and industrial decarbonization um, and then got into this. Uh, and so I'm now uh, at B Zero Carbon, which is a, a global carbon credit ratings agency for the voluntary carbon market. We rate carbon credits from everything from uh, avoided deforestation through to direct air capture. Uh, and the real sort of purpose behind the mission of the company at the beginning was that there was this lack of correlation between price and quality in the voluntary carbon market. And that market failure was really stifling a lot of things in the market. And so the rating is to really try and cut through that. And we see the market not as a binary market of a sort of a credit or not a credit, but actually more like a bond market where there's a huge variation in quality um, within it. Uh, so yeah, really excited to, to be here today. Awesome. Hi, everyone. I'm Anu. I lead the science and innovation program at Carbon 180. Uh, for those of you who might not be familiar, Aaron briefly mentioned Carbon 180 is the first and only US federal policy NGO focused exclusively on carbon removal. And our mission is to design and champion equitable and science-based policies that bring carbon removal to gigaton scale safely, responsibly, quickly. And that's why I'm really excited to be on this panel today, because I think the thing that lives at the intersection of equitable and science-based actions in the carbon removal industry is really accountability, and MRV is the tool we use to get to accountability. Thanks. Hi, I'm Natalia Dorfman. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Kita. Kita is a carbon insurance company, and our purpose is using insurance as an enabler to drive more financing to help scale high-quality carbon removal solutions. And clearly, as we'll talk about more in the panel today, MRV is core to that in terms of enabling us and the wider financial service, services industry, the data, to, to do these insurance products, and also to help build the trust that will enable and unlock that level of financing. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, so let's start with what constitutes high-quality MRV, and really what is it? So it sounds like it could be pretty technical, but really it's just accounting. So Anu, could you please just tell us what is MRV and the various aspects of a removal that should be accounted for? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for this question. Um, if you've been forced to interact with me in the last year, you know that I'm sort of obsessed with what is MRV. Um, so I think on a really basic level, MRV is the robust quantitative accounting of a carbon removal project that enables accountability. In most contexts, we talk about this as accountability between buyers and suppliers, so you know that you're getting what you paid for. But at Carbon 180, we believe this is also accountability between project developers and host communities so that they know that they're getting what they signed up for. And similarly, we believe that carbon removal is a public good. It will be largely publicly financed in the long term. And that means we also need to think about accountability for the public. Are we getting, as a society, as a community, the removal service that we believe we're getting? So really, the big picture is robust quantitative accounting. And the first message that I really want to kind of drill home here is that we can figure this out. Accounting exists in other industries. This is a thing that people know how to do. Carbon removal is hard in some unique ways, but it's very doable. And we're starting to see with, for example, the work that Climeworks is doing with the first third-party verified tons that we're going to move towards this solution, and it's very doable. That said, I think um, since we're having a whole panel on MRV, I want to dig a little bit deeper below this sort of surface level of what is MRV. And I think there's four important steps to consider in this process. The first is standards. The standard tells you what are you trying to accomplish. It's your target outcome. Then you have protocols. If the standard is the what, the protocol is the how. How are you actually going to do this? What are the steps that you take? After that, you have project implementation. So you're actually doing the work according to the protocol. And then you have outcome assessment. So did you actually do carbon removal? 
And each of these steps requires some degree of validation and verification. So is this standard fit for the purpose that you set out? Did the protocol actually meet the standard? Did you do the project according to the protocol? And did you get the outcomes that you said you got? And I wanted to outline these steps to emphasize my second sort of main point, that MRV is an ecosystem problem with an ecosystem solution. It's not just going to be one entity that comes in as like, we did MRV, check the box. It's really going to be a number of different entities. And that's great, because there's tons of opportunities to bring in expertise from other fields. And that's why I'm super excited to be on stage with Natalia and Ted, because they're building some of these solutions in this ecosystem. Thank you. That was a really robust and detailed explanation of the what behind MRV. What is it? So you mentioned something about like it's an ecosystem problem. But just breaking that first M into two subset Ms, that it stands for monitoring. But kind of within that is measurement. So this is a DAC summit, and I think Jan mentioned earlier that DAC has a little bit of a leg up in terms of a straightforward pathway to accounting, but not all removal solutions can say the same. So within specifically that measurement part of the M, how do we account for differences in both our scientific ability to measure and also the uncertainties? So maybe I'll ask Ted, because your organization rates different, different approaches. So how do you define high quality for a given solution? Yeah, so I think it's probably worth, I don't think everyone will be that familiar with carbon credit ratings. So how we fit into this puzzle is, um, is a bit like if you're looking at the bond market, you've got, as you said, MRV is basically accountants and auditors, right? So there's that side of it in the bond market. You've then got insurance, and then you've then got ratings agencies. And I see this market, the sort of VCM, and within that, the CDR market, really as a, a similar makeup uh, to that. So. It is a slightly different part of the ecosystem to MRV. We are, um, and the MRV providers really create that credit, they certify that credit, and then we are really putting our opinion on the likelihood that that, that carbon credit returns a ton of carbon removed or avoided. Uh, and so within that, you know, our framework really looks at a number of factors. You know, additionality is really important. Overcrediting is really important. Non-permanence risk is crucial. Things like policy, things like leakage, all of these things feed into the public methodology that we've got that feeds into our ratings methodology, um, and in our eyes, is, is a really key part about how you look at the carbon efficacy of these carbon credits. Um, but it's also worth noting that we also have a, a barrier to entry. You know, there's not all credits are rateable. You know, in the voluntary carbon market, we've got about a fifth are unrateable credits because they have poor transparency, poor disclosure. Uh, within the ex post, so the sort of retireable. CDR market, engineered CDR market, almost no credits are rateable. Um, and we are working you know, day in, day out, working with registries, working with developers, really trying to push that disclosure and transparency requirement. Because I think if we don't get that right, you know, some of these issues we've seen in the avoidance market will be sort of perpetuated again in, in this market. Uh, and I'm really concerned that if we don't get that right now, um, then we might follow some of those similar pitfalls. Um, but that criteria that we have, we have, we want a third party verification of the LCA. So we don't say certain people, we, because it's a fast evolving space. So it could be DNV, we could be looking at isometric, it could be Puro. Um, but we need a third party validation of, of the LCA. We need all of the data that's being used to feed into the rating to be in the public domain. And that is for the ex post market. And that is a really crucial point. Um, that, that I was touching on, and then thirdly, an additionality test. So, so for us, that is the kind of that's the framework, that's the criteria to, to get rated. And then the last point is really when we're looking at MRV um, and we're looking at it within that within that framework. What are the sort of things that we spot out for? Because as you said, it, you know, it, it varies hugely between methods. If you're looking at an enhanced rock weathering company, the MRV practices are uh, significantly different for direct air capture. Um, but within that. You know, there are a number of areas that we look at, such as we want to see conservative um, emissions calculations that are being used. We want to see really an evaluation of the, the life cycle of emissions, sort of cradle to grave. We really want to be able to, to see where they are. And if, if they're not being put in the PDD or the documentation, we want to know why that is and where that is. Um, and then on the monitoring point that you were touching on, we really want to see uh, you know, robust protocols and, and frequency of monitoring throughout the process. But it really is it's difficult to say 
you know, trying to put DAC and ocean alkalinity enhancement in the same breath is, is a very challenging thing when looking at MRV. Um, but it is, you know, we can't do our job if the proper accounting auditing, okay, the MRV, um, isn't done. And so we really think it is critical to get robust MRV, and then that is when ratings and insurance can really come into play and help scale this market. Great. That was a great segue to my next question to <laughs> Natalia. So yeah, you mentioned something about the data being in the public domain, and I think transparency is so crucial. We can all agree that um, we need trust in this industry, like uh, Marcus said earlier. Um, but also, I mean, the panel is called how it matters in more than one way. So let's kind of shift gears and talk about how we can leverage high quality MRV um, to finance some of these things. So could you tell us, Natalia, about your perspective and why MRV matters from a financial perspective and more about your insurance? Yes, of course. Um, and there's a few, a few aspects to that question. So I guess first let me say why it matters high level from a financing perspective. Second, I can talk about how it matters from an insurance perspective. And third, I think I'd like to touch a bit on that uncertainty point because I think that actually does also play very much into financing and different financing mechanisms. But first at a high level, I think one great thing about the CDR industry is that there's many people coming from other industries and looking to bring in the experience of other industries into helping scale this one. And so thus, it comes as no surprise whatsoever that in order to enable financing in any industry, the base level of what you need is transparent data that is auditable and that has third-party verification. Right? Without that, you are going to immediately hit a block on any significant form of financing, and that is obviously MRV. From the insurance perspective then, when we're looking at what we are able to insure, you always need data and you always need third-party verification. It doesn't matter what type of insurance it is. It could be car insurance. You know, if someone hits your car and you tell the insurance company, they're going to need to see some pictures of the damage of your car. They're going to need to see a mechanics report. They don't just trust your word for it. In carbon removal, the type of data we need to be able to insure you depends on what we're insuring. If I was insuring political risk, MRV doesn't really matter. In all honesty, I need to know what country you're in, what engagement you've had with the government, et cetera. But for what Kita does and carbon removal specific insurance, I say what we do right now is insure delivery risk. So we're looking at a carbon removal project at the point at which it's forecasting its expected carbon sequestration over coming years. And we're trying to assess what is the likelihood that that carbon actually gets removed from the atmosphere. So MRV is key to that, both in terms of the initial data quality assessment, like can we actually, do we know enough about this project to be able to assess it and insure it, going to what Ted said, but then even more importantly in a way, because even with bad data, we could insure you theoretically or just be very expensive. But what we can't do is pay a claim. Because if we don't have a third party, that at the point of that loss, our client comes to us and says, I've had a loss, I haven't received the carbon that I expected, and there's no third party that can validate that loss, there's too many conflicts of interest. Because we can't be the ones who say there's been a claim. Our client can't be the one who says there's been a claim. The seller of carbon can't be the one who says there's a claim. There's too many conflicts across those three parties. So we need a third party verifier. And I think that's great where Climeworks has come to, you know, the ability to have third party verified carbon credits. But that's clearly something we haven't yet cracked across the, the wider spectrum of carbon removal technologies. And then I suppose that brings me to the third point of uncertainty. I think. Uncertainty isn't necessarily a bad thing. We all deal with different levels of uncertainty on a daily basis. Where uncertainty becomes a bad thing is where there's no parameters to that uncertainty. If you are just uncertain, it stops decision making. And finance at the end of the day is a decision, right? Whether it's insurance or the uh, investment, somebody has looked at the data and they have made a decision of whether or not to proceed with this project. And if you have too much uncertainty, you can't make that decision. And so one, I guess, sort of report uh, that I quite like in terms of looking at uncertainty is from Frontier and Carbon Plan. And I recognize some people from those organizations might be here, so apologies if I mess this up. But my interpretation of it is it's giving parameters for how buyers can look at uncertainty so they can make an educated decision. And so you look at it in a high level of three categories. So one is, Looking at these uncertainty parameters, what is the impact on the likelihood of carbon removal? So if I'm a biochar producer and I'm looking at this feedstock versus this feedstock, what impact could that decision have on my ability to re remove carbon? High, medium, low, negligible. 
What is the type of uncertainty that we're talking about? Is it execution uncertainty? So the ability of that specific carbon project to execute versus scientific uncertainty, like the science is not yet clear, versus a sort of counterfactual uncertainty. How certain am I that without my investment in this project that it would happen, et cetera, et cetera. Or what, how certain am I that that feedstock wouldn't be used for another purpose? Um, and then finally, whose responsibility is it to deal with that uncertainty? Is it the project's responsibility or is it that sort of systemic-wide responsibility that we all need to work together to improve the science? Clearly, from a financial perspective, when you can get the uncertainty parameters so that they're more geared to project-level uncertainty around execution risk, it's a much easier thing to ensure than it is scientific uncertainty with a systemic problem. Um, and then I think we can touch on this more in terms of financing, but the other thing I liked from that report was then building down those uncertainty parameters into two types of carbon you can buy, which are, they termed, exploration mode. So I am investing in this project, recognizing that there is uncertainty, but understanding that we need to be fostering innovation. But I recognize I might not receive a carbon credit, and I've come to terms with that, versus ton mode, which is where the uncertainty has been mitigated. Like you're pretty certain that you should receive this carbon unless there is an execution problem. And thus, those ten ton mode projects are the ones that can start to be scaled up and can start to receive that significant type of project financing that I think the market very much needs. Thank you so much for those fantastic points. There's a lot that I personally want to say about that, but I'm sure that you guys both <laughs> have stuff to add as well. So maybe we'll start with the project execution uncertainty piece and go to Ted, because I know that's something you're thinking about. Yeah, it's a, it's a, I agree with a lot of you, what you're saying there. And that uncertainty point um, is, it feeds exactly into a new product that we actually launched yesterday, which is our ex ante rating. So um, for those that are not familiar with us, to, to date, we've done ex post credit ratings uh, for the voluntary carbon market, and now we will be able to do the ex ante market. And I think for people in this room, that is particularly exciting because, you know, as we all know, it's what 98% of the credits being bought are um, you know, undelivered credits. Uh, and there is a real need to start to properly price and manage risk in this market. You know, when we look at what Stripe, Shopify, Frontier, and Microsoft have done. You know, they've kickstarted this industry into life, and it has been an incredible thing. And applause to everyone who works in those companies that, that has done that. Um, but if we're being brutally honest, this market is not really alive yet, right? Like it's it's not it's not getting that big project financing that we want to see uh, for big infrastructure projects across the board. Obviously, Climeworks done a terrific job at, at raising capital, but it's not got a proper correlation between price and quality. There are a number of uncertainties in this market that if we want to move from the marketing budget to the treasury budget, if we want to move from the Kickstarter campaigns by Stripe and Shopify through to the biggest banks in the world, I think they really need to have a way of, of pricing that risk. And so that is what this ex ante credit rating um, will do. Um, we, we talked a bit about MRV ratings and insurance. Actually, Natalia and I did a report um, uh, on basically this, which we call the three pillars of integrity in the market. Uh, and I genuinely do believe if we can get the robot rust MRV, we can get ratings, and in this case, ex ante ratings, because that is where this market is living at the moment, and we can get proper insurance, you know, that is the model that the bond market scaled to $123 trillion value. You know, I mean, that, that, is, that is a, a, um, a model to follow that can really help boost this market. Um, so, you know, for us, our ratings, our, our clients, our main clients are some of the biggest energy companies in the world. We've got four out of the five biggest banks in the world using our rating to, in, to inform their investment decisions. And so when they will look at, you know, we're already getting orders for, for these ex ante credit ratings, um, we really hope that will help unlock the capital that's needed and move us from that, that early stage through to that, um, that next phase. Uh, and the key sort of differentiator between the ex post credit rating and what we're doing now is this sort of core element of project execution risk. Obviously, let's not kid ourselves. You know, this industry is, is very nascent, and there is, you know, a lot of the time it's first of its kind projects that we're doing. So there is a lot of project execution risk in the things that we are doing. And so factoring that into the rating is going to be really, really important. Um, but crucially, how we're going to be communicating that is, you know, firstly, the reports will be private ratings, so we'll be discussing about what circulation we do between us and the person that's doing the rating. That could be a developer, that could be a buyer. Um, 
Uh, but it's also um, uh, the project execution risk is, is really going to be important in allowing those banks or those big institutional investors to properly price that cost of capital. Um, and as we're talking about that uncertainty, if they can price in that uncertainty, I think that is hugely beneficial for this industry. And so um, I'm really excited to be launching it. And, uh, and we've, we've got a sort of a big, a big year ahead at sort of rolling this out. But um, yeah, hopefully, you know, hopefully some of you can be involved. But it'd be great to um, yeah, touch base with anyone. I'll be, I'll be out there later if anyone's interested in, in hearing more. But um, yeah, hopefully that sort of feeds into how we're thinking about this stuff. And I would add just one thing on the sort of nexus of quality, uncertainty, and funding. Uh, from the policy perspective, the US federal government has a pretty robust toolkit to look at pathways at different levels of development. So it's not all direct purchasing. So if you think about the things that DOE, the government as a whole, is doing, uh, particularly with the recent climate legislation, Inflation Reduction Act, we have R&D funding for really nascent pathways, but also to help reduce those systemic scientific uncertainties that Natalia spoke to. And then we have demonstration support, so something like a direct air capture hub where you have cost share for demonstration projects. Then we have you know, support financing commercial scale deployment through things like the Loan Programs Office. Um, we have MRV infrastructure support, so we have something like uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which creates measurement infrastructure that can support on MRV. And then you have kind of tax incentives and direct purchasing for those and tons of removal. So thinking about the market, but also thinking about this robust pipeline of tools that we have through policy, through government, to support the entire ecosystem. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great point. And congrats, Ted, on the launch of that um, ex ante rating. So um, going back to what Natalia said about the scientific uncertainty, and Anu, I kind of wanted to ask you to elaborate on this a bit, is that you mentioned how there's different pathways in the kind of public sector and government space that we can leverage MRV to really scale. But just kind of backing up a little bit on the scientific uncertainty piece. So I'm a scientist and I'm also on the supply side of carbon removal and there seems to be this like race to get MRV quality as high as possible. And so right now I think a lot of the tech is just climbing this curve up but hopefully at some point we'll level off as these technologies mature. Um, but of course, the different approaches have a different <laughs> rates at which they'll reach that kind of plateau. Um, so how can we account for the differences in quality today without discouraging the kind of lower level, I guess, the, the more nascent technologies that have a long way to go scientifically from evolving and scaling? Yeah, absolutely. I can start there. And actually, I'm going to uh, pull on another thread that Natalia raised, which is the work that Carbon Plan is doing on uncertainties and differentiating different purposes for our tons of removal. I think really the key thing here is that MRV regimes, particularly standards, need to be fit for purpose. So if your purpose is one-to-one -one accounting of residual fossil emissions, that's a specific standard. If your purpose is perhaps um, exploration mode, beyond value chain mitigation, supporting a broader portfolio of climate solutions, managing large scale carbon reservoirs, those are different purposes with different standards. And I think there's a coming back to the sort of portfolio of solutions and MRV as a whole, we need to be thinking about reducing scientific uncertainty, getting the best possible MRV we can, but also thinking about what are we trying to accomplish? And what is the standard and the MRV that is fit for that purpose? And I think there, there will be different purposes in the overall market and the portfolio. Natalia, would you like to add anything to that as well? Since you brought up? Yeah, of course, I'm happy to add to that. I mean, I agree on the fit for purpose. Um, I also agree, of course, we need to be scaling up I think I agree on the point that we need to scale up MRV and then it will hit a plateau at some point. I think where we will, at that future point, need to come, I suppose, to some kind of compromise, which might cause challenges or disagreement in the industry, is but where we need to get to is a more systematic and scalable form of MRV. Right? So right now, when you have your buyers that are, broadly speaking, catalyzing these solutions, but I would say broadly speaking, not really expecting necessarily a return. They sort of have the potential, they've understood they might make a loss, but they're looking to catalyze the industry. 
but they do a lot of due diligence on these projects, right? When you look at the due diligence that these buyers do, it is intense and it is not scalable and you can't expect those mid-market adopters, which is what we need to do that kind of due diligence. And so we need to get the ability of MRV to be scalable and more systematic in order to bring in more buyers. I think that will inherently come with a compromise in terms of the, I guess, quality of that MRV. And I think that's where the industry will probably have some forms of conflict. But what is the sort of level that is a high level, but an acceptable level, at which point we can make it more systematic um, in order to bring in more people. And I think we'll always have a debate to some extent with some people wanting that to be higher, but we will have to come to a compromise because we can't have this really expectation that each individual buyer does all of this due diligence before they engage in the market. It's just too slow. I don't have a view on where that level should be, um, but it's probably, I mean, from our perspective, I think ratings and insurance, we don't really have a horse in the race in terms of who we want to win if there's any particular type or any particular company. We're just there to be a supportive mechanism. Um, and I think to help lay out some of the risk frameworks and data points that we will need to be able to ensure projects, which might be able to influence some of the wider conversations. Have anything to add to that? <laughs> no, I think I will just say, I mean, that, that the challenge with you know, trying to make consistent MRV practices is, as we we're talking about, <laughs> so, so variable. We're talking about these methods that are sort of so dissimilar, but we sort of clump them all in, in the same list that we've all got um, and think, how can we make something that works for everyone, which I think in practice, you know, if you're looking at enhanced drop weathering, you're going to need maybe a water sample, maybe a soil sample, maybe a, sort of a gas sample. I mean, there's, there's so many different, <laughs> there's so many nuances to some of these technologies that I think it's going to be a real challenge. But yeah, as, as Natalia uh, mentioned, you know, we are kind of agnostic on who is doing that work. We are there to really use that data, and, and we will be <laughs> judging the robustness of the MRV through that process, uh, but really here to be collaborators more than anything else. Interesting. Yeah, Natalia, you brought up something about setting like the high bar and who sets that. Is it the buyers? Is it the science? And Anu, like, what role does the public sector play in that, in the, po in the political framework? Yeah, absolutely. So first, just to kind of build on the points that we've already discussed, um, I do think there should be a really high bar. Um, as you've heard from Aaron, we don't believe carbon removal is an excuse to continue emitting. We're really trying to decarbonize as rapidly as possible and then also have carbon removal in our toolkit. So we want a really high standard for what counts as carbon removal. In terms of the policy and public benefit uh, piece of it, I think it comes back to this theme around accountability, accountability. You're going to hear me say accountability over and over again. Um, and to be more specific, I think when you implement a policy and you're trying to achieve a specific goal, it's really important to be able to demonstrate that you actually did that thing. Um, so if we're funding carbon removal, if we're funding DAC hubs and we're saying we're building megaton facilities, we need to demonstrate that we're removing megatons of carbon from the air. And what that enables, particularly in the early stage of the market, is more ambitious policy going forward, right? Because one megaton facility isn't where we want to end up. In 2050, we want gigatons of removal. And doing MRV well now enables that. And so I've heard here a few times, um, and you'll probably hear it again, what we need in the near term is demonstrations of CDR projects that we can show people and say, hey, it's working. I would agree with that. And I would say, yes, and we need those projects to have unassailable MRV that is really trustworthy, that is transparent, that is accessible to communities. So we're not only demonstrating the technology, but we're building the trust along the way and saying, this is working, we're doing what we're saying, and we're laying the groundwork for a really robust MRV ecosystem. Yeah, that's an interesting point about how we need kind of airtight MRV at this stage to really enable growth and scaling. So I'm just curious about like what pathways that actually looks like? Like, how can we leverage robust, airtight MRV today to actually get us to scale this industry? So maybe let's start with you, Natalia. Like, what financial pathways exist that can actually catapult this forward? I think on that, I'll go back to the earlier point on the exploration mode tons and then the ton mode tons. <laughs> <laughs> because I think they matter greatly in terms of the financing paths. I think the majority of the financing now is that exploration mode ton, and that is your grants, it's your VC funding, it's your small pre-purchase agreements, it's 
it's very positive to enable innovation, but it doesn't scale the market. You need, I think, those exploration mode tons to get to that unassailable level of MRV, or at least a level in which we have a, a high or well understood uncertainty level that we can price into our purchases, and then you get to that ton mode ton. And I think, I mean, our goal from Kita, when we were looking at this market, to some extent, we're trying to develop insurance that works with the market today, you know, forward purchasing and sort of one off purchases, but we're also trying to be flexible, as flexible as insurance can be to be there for when that larger level project financing, debt financing type structures start to emerge, because you don't get that without insurance. But I think you need the ton modes so that the, those large investors that significant finance can trust what they're buying. You know, they, they can convince their CFO and their procurement and their risk and their board that actually they're making a strong investment and that they understand the return that they're going to make get on their investment and that they have protection in place in case that investment doesn't pan out. And so I know I'm not taking into account here government sort of public financing in large part because right now our focus is on private sector and you can probably speak much more in terms of the government level financing which is also obviously going to be very, very important. But in terms of that private sector financing, once we've gotten out of that exploration, exploration mode into the ton mode, I think insurance will be a huge enabler to get in that just significant institutional capital. Yeah, I think, I mean, what this boils down to, I think we probably all agree, is that like MRV is like the crucial piece of the puzzle we need to get right for any of this to be unlocked. Whether it is ratings, whether it's insurance, whether it's getting all of that private sector institutional investment into these, into these solutions, or if it is the public sector as well. Like, we're not going to do any of this. The, the governments are not going to pile in behind all of these uh, consistently for time to come. They're not going to go into the emissions trading schemes in the UK and the EU if we don't sort out MRV. In what world do we have direct air capture in an emissions trading scheme where the MRV hasn't been sorted out? So, I think at the end of the day, it is like just pivotal for, for all of these different parts um, that are moving. Great. Yeah, I think we covered a lot like why it matters and in terms of unlocking financing and also how it's important for technologies and suppliers, but also buyers. But Anu, could you just talk about like who is MRV for other than what's already been talked about? Like what are the other stakeholders that we haven't mentioned yet? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you for this question as well. So we've talked quite a bit about how MRV unlocks finance. It allows us to have the appropriate risk management tools within the industry. But there's also this huge piece around trust that we have touched on recently. And we think of that largely as, you know, of course, the market piece, but trust with communities, trust with um, people who have been harmed by extractive industries in the past. And now we're trying to come in with a new industry and say this one is going to fix things. Um, we need to think about trust with the public and with taxpayers who will, to some extent, be funding this or supporting this work. And we need to think about trust really broadly, globally, in carbon removal as a solution. And I think the really only way we build that trust is to have good MRV, to, to have receipts. MRV is the receipts that says we did the thing that we said we were going to do. And one way that I think we could think about this that is a little bit uncommon, but I'll pitch it to you all, is MRV is a tool for accountability, which is a step on the path to achieving more just outcomes in the CDR sector. And if you think about it that way, MRV then becomes a tool for achieving more just outcomes. And you can ask different questions when you think of MRV this way. You can ask not just how do I build in transparency for financial institutions, but how do I build in data accessibility for communities so they can see what's happening in a project? How do I build in measurement, not just of the pure carbon aspects, but of environmental aspects that are extremely important to communities that are going to host these solutions and make sure that that is in the package of MRV? How do I build in direct community-based monitoring, for example, to build trust, again, more directly? And I think when you think about MRV as a tool for achieving more just outcomes, you arrive at a more robust and rigorous accounting of what a CDR project is doing in a way that today and going forward is really going to build trust, and that trust is necessary to unlock scale. Thank you. I think that was a really great way to conclude this panel, and I'm sure you all have so much more to say on this topic, so 
Um, we're going to take some time for questions right now, but if anyone doesn't get to ask their question, find them later, because they all are industry leaders and have a lot of really important insights. Um, so I'll turn it over to Hannah now Absolutely. to take questions. Thank you so much. Indeed, do we have questions here in the room? I know that we have one right at the very front. Any more takers and one here? So uh, first, we'll go to the front. Thank you. Uh, thank you. This was a fascinating and important panel. I'm really glad you're here. Uh, you talked about a great number of things that I care about. The one topic you didn't really tackle is who pays? <laughs> who pays for MRV? Right now that's all falling on the project developer's shoulders solely. Do you have thoughts on this? I do, in my view, at the end of the day, it will go through to customer pays. So I think we are sort of agnostic in exactly the device in which that, that happens. You know, I know some newer carbon removal registries are doing it in different ways. Some are making it that the payer pays, some are making it that the developer pays. Um, we, you know, we're, we are a, a kind of third party in this, so i uh, happy with any model, but um, I do think that the, the voluntary carbon market to date has really worked on the, the assumption that, um, that the developer pays, and so I think trying to rewire that whole process might be a challenging, <laughs> a challenging thing to tackle, um, but uh, yeah, I'd be interested to know what you both think. No, I, I agree. I think the cost gets passed on at the end of the day to the buyer and the cost of the carbon credit. Um, and if we can price that uncertainty, and or if you look at it from the flip side, price the quality of the MRV, so price the level of trust, I think if a buyer is saying, you know, I'm buying this ton of carbon, or I'm, I'm, pay, I'm financing this facility such as that it removes a ton of carbon, the certainty that they have actually removed a ton of carbon is what they are paying for. And if they want to be certain that their financing has actually had that impact, they should pay more. And if that's the instance, then if the seller of carbon can price that, that sort of confidence level into the carbon, then they should be able to, in essence, get this buyer to pay for the MRV, would be my, my perspective on, on how the financing, the sort of profitability of it should play out. Um, one thing that I would add to this, I love this question, I think a lot about financial incentives, and so the question I have is not only who pays, but what is the payment structure, and what do those financial incentives imply for the integrity of the market? Um, I think we're all familiar with some of the stuff that's happened in the voluntary market, and we don't want to see in the durable removals market, and specifically there's a few things that I think we should be looking at critically um, within this structure of who's doing what and who's paying them to do it. Uh, Volume-based transactions. Uh, I was just having lunch with an environmental economist who was saying, like, imagine if Moody's rated bonds based on how many got a good or got paid based on how many got a good rating. Like that would probably not be the best system. So volume-based transactions is something we want to look at, and then also a high degree of vertical integration in MRV steps, where you can press a lot of levers in order to drive down costs, but also to drive up your margins. So thinking about financial incentives within MRV, not just who pays and where does the cost end up, but how are these payments structured such that we are maximizing public benefit and minimizing the risk of fraud? Maybe if I can just jump in, because there's a great question that's actually come in from um, our audience online, which is related to this. It's not, you know, who pays, but how much do they pay? How much does high quality MRV cost in a CDR portfolio? I, I wonder if this is even a possible answer. Pass. <laughs> oh, I'll answer this. I love this question. Go ahead. Please go ahead. Um, I think we shouldn't be thinking of MRV separately from the cost of a ton of removal. It's just baked in. If you can't verify that you did the removal, then how can you sell it? So MRV is just part of the baked in ton, uh, the cost. And so if you're selling a ton of removal at 600, 500, 400 during are going down. Um, your MRV is also improving alongside the other parts of your CapEx, OpEx, all of the things that uh, we heard about earlier today. It's, it's baked in, it's not a separate cost. Yeah, That's very interesting indeed. Uh, we have another question on the floor. <laughs> Hi, I'm Francis Robson from Itachi Energy. Um, I'm quite new to this whole topic, so my question might make no sense at all, but I'll try anyway. Uh, you talk about uh, ratings agencies and things like that get involved in the ratings of the, the credits and, and we're looking at you know, high quality carbon credits in the future. Um, and what you were talking about brought to mind the film The Big Short. <laughs> <laughs> and so I wondered if you thought that might be a risk in the future that when uh, 
big banks and big investors get involved and then it becomes more pressure on sort of return on investment and things and then how do you maintain your sort of independence as a ratings agency and make sure that we can all trust exactly what's being rated and that the, uh, the, the quality of the credits is as high as uh, the rating says it is? Yeah, someone actually asked me this at the drinks last night um, and I was like, you definitely just watched the big short. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I think... Uh, it, it, you know, it, it's a good point. We are we're working in an unregulated market. Um, the ratings agencies got uh, you know regulated as a result of that after 2008. Uh, so you know, I think lessons have been learned from those mistakes. Um, and you know, all I can say is we, as an organisation, uh, will really work our utmost to make sure that some of those issues were not um, created in the past. I mean, there was instances where they used to get in 2008 sort of uh, bundles of junk ratings and then relabel them as a as a triple a rating i mean that sort of thing is never going to fly um uh with with our model so um but it's a it's an interesting point i think you know as we move towards the regulated space towards compliance markets um i think also some of those worries might be um might be lessened Okay, thank you. I have a question here, actually, which is probably quite related to a question that you asked earlier, Claire. But who is the ultimate decider when it comes to MRV? Is it the voluntary carbon market themselves? Is it private players? Or is it even governments, you know, that, that will establish and enforce MRV in the future? Oh, I mean, I have Please to say go for it. Yeah. Please do. Um, I think you're the best place to take this first step. Um, so I think it will change over time. When we're in a voluntary market landscape, there are going to be buyers who are thinking critically about how to assess their own risk and how to protect their investments. Um, I think, as Claire mentioned, there's a lot of scientific uncertainty. So the scientific community will play a big role in saying, hey, this is our consensus about the level of MRV that is possible today. And if you hear something wildly different, uh, don't believe them. So there's definitely a piece for the scientific community. And I think as the field matures, we move towards more compliance or regulatory mechanisms, there'll be an increasing role for the government to step in and say, this is what qualifies. So a good example of that is the EPA has MRV rules and guidance for 45Q and geologic storage. Um, so in order to access these tax subsidies, you need to meet these requirements. So I think in the long run, we're, we're heading towards government, but I have to say that because I work on policy. <laughs> all right, thank you all so much indeed for your insights. Please take your seats back in the audience. Thank you. So our final speaker from this session is one of the most influential economists uh, around the world today formerly of the World Bank, of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, Professor Lord Nicholas Stern. He really paved the way and designed the roadmap for um, how we deal with climate change. He can't be with us in person today, but he sent us this video message on the urgency and the economics of direct air capture. Thank you so much for allowing me to join your very important uh, summit uh, remotely. I'm very sorry that I cannot uh, be with you. And I should say at the outset that I am not an expert uh, in the technology side of things, particularly around the very important subject of direct air capture. What I wanted to try to do was to offer a strategic context within which the case for, the arguments for, the details on uh, DAC and, uh, and uh, carbon, uh, carbon dioxide removal could be expressed. And that strategic context, I think, is very important. So let's start where we are. We are, according to the WMO, likely to pass 1.5 degrees uh, on uh, at least one year in the next few years. Second, emissions are still not falling. Third, we're keenly aware now with the work of the IPCC of the dangers of exceeding 1.5 degrees centigrade. And indeed, uh, of course, there's very severe dangers of exceeding two degrees centigrade. And we know logically from the science that net zero is uh, a necessary condition for stabilizing concentrations and temperature. If you put all that together, it's crystal clear that carbon dioxide removal and direct air capture within that story is an imperative. And I think we should also remind ourselves that unless we go quickly in showing 
that uh, this can be done, it is feasible and it can be done at reasonable cost. Unless we can do that, we risk the whole uh, challenge of um, rather more sinister forms of geoengineering. We also know, and this is the second conclusion, that it's the whole path that matters, not just the net zero at 2050. So we're going to have to move very strongly and very quickly on decarbonisation. These two things work together, the CDR and DAC on the one hand and the uh, decarbonisation on the other. And we also note that um, probably it will not be that fast to get to uh, CDR on scale and that further underlines the importance of very strong action on decarbonisation now. Now, as we think about that whole story, we've got to be clear about the world's objectives. The world's objectives are Paris, uh, including, of course, well below two degrees efforts for 1.5, but they're also the sustainable development goals. What we're trying to put together as we decarbonise it decarbonize here is a whole uh, development story, which is um, involving mitigation, carbon reduction, but also involving um, resilience and adaptation and indeed natural capital. So much of what we have to do has to be seen in that overall context. And CDR and DAC will flourish best if that context is embraced and welcome. And that includes, of course, the natural methods of renewable, of, of removal around um, mangroves, restoring peatland, restoring degraded land uh, more, more generally, afforestation and so on. So that's the basic scientific and global context for all this. So with that, let's turn to uh, CDR and DAC themselves and particularly comment on scale method of of removal and cost. First on scale, if you look at the work of IPCC and UNEP, it's pretty clear that over the course of this century, whatever you assume about scenarios, um, we're likely to have to remove over the century around 500 gigatons of CO2, quite, quite probably a bit more if we do not decarbonize at the rate that we should. And if you look at the flow rate of that, how much we're likely to need carbon dioxide removal uh, each year, by the middle of the century, that's likely to be at least five gigatons per year, more likely something like 10 gigatons per year. So that's the scale that we have to think of if we look at the temperature targets that we've quite rightly set and the possible flows of emissions taking into account policy. So that's the likely scale. If you think of 10 gigatons per year at a price of $100 a tonne, that's a trillion dollars. If you think of five gigatons a year at a price of $200 a tonne, that's a trillion dollars. There are various ways of thinking about that, but it does seem to me that an overall scale of the market of a trillion dollars a year by mid-century is really quite likely. So that's the scale on which we have to act. So let me suggest five policy uh, measures in order to finalize what I want to say. First, given the dangers and urgency, we have to look across all the methods for carbon dioxide removal, within which, of course, direct air capture is of special importance. Now, my good friend uh, Julio Friedman is the place I usually start in trying to be informed about different methods. I won't go over them in any detail because I know that Julio is speaking to you. But we have to look across them all. And my first policy recommendation would be a systematic assessment of the different methods including, of course, their physical constraints, their costs, and in particular also, very relevant for direct air capture, the permanence and the confidence in additionality. So the various criteria for assessment, cost is just one, but it's an important one, but there are others too, and the physical constraints would be a very big part of that. And as I say, permanence and additionality. So let's produce, as a world, a systematic assessment of where we are now. Number two, we're going to need research and development across the whole range of possibilities, including direct 
air capture, but also algae and becks and soils and so on, and all the ideas on offer. And I do meet enthusiasts for all of these, and their case uh, is often quite strong. We need R&D across the board. Third, we need support for going to scale, because we've already recognised just how big that has to be, and that's going to involve very substantial international public funding in the billions or many billions in order to support going to scale. Fourth, we must keep pushing for high carbon prices, at least $100 a tonne very soon and rising from there. Fifth, we have to begin international discussions of how a future industry, uh, which will be, as we've remarked, in the scale of many hundreds of billions or trillions, how that can be financed at a global level. By mid-century, that might be half a percentage point of world income. A modest price, I think, for the kind of security that it would bring and the kind of catastrophe it would avert. But those monies have to be raised, they have to be raised internationally. And my own view is that some kind of tax on international transport, sea and air and so on, would be one of the possible sources. So, in conclusion, let's be uh, clear that there are two big statements to make. We have to drive emissions down, and if we do that well, with the right kind of investment, that will be the growth story of this century. But it's crystal clear that we will also need car carbon dioxide removal, and within that, direct air capture will play a major role. We have to start preparing for that right now. Okay, well, I hope that has uh, gone some way in whetting your appetite because it is now time for our lunch break. There is still plenty more to come. We'll be digging more into the challenges of policy after lunch. We'll also be looking at environmental justice and voluntary carbon markets. Very crucial indeed. So please enjoy. We'll be back here at 1.30, which is in one hour and 15 minutes. Bye-bye. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. I hope you're ready for our session this afternoon. It was so good to see and hear so many people talking and building on the conversations that we had this morning over the lunch break. The job in hand now is to turn all of those conversations into real action. Now, we all know, or at least we should all know this at least a little bit, that um, a credible climate strategy for any company heading towards net zero isn't just about removing emissions. It's also about removing historical emissions. It's also about removing unavoidable emissions. But how to do that uh, is very key for these companies because these companies that take action now will be much more competitive than those who are failing to take any action whatsoever. But it's not easy. Taking those first steps can be very difficult indeed, but leadership is key, and that is what we're going to delve into in this first session. Our keynote now comes from the CEO, who other CEOs turn to for advice. He is the global chair of the Boston Consulting Group. Please welcome Rich Lesser. He'll also be joined shortly by Christopher, uh, Christoph Gibbold for a brief discussion after. Please take the stage, Rich, thank you. So good afternoon. It is so wonderful to be at this DAC summit with all of you, to see the passion and energy to advance this critical technology. Um, this is a topic that's been on my mind for quite a while now, as BCG has looked to make its own commitments to being net zero by 2030. And, um, and I think we have opportunities, but I think the starting point for this conversation, indeed this whole day, is a simple and uncomfortable truth, which is the world will not get to 1.5 degrees uh, on a reduction strategy alone. We need to be in every company, in every industry, reducing our emissions footprint as much as we can, but reductions will not get us to 1.5 sufficiently. And, and that means we need to be able to remove carbon and remove it at huge scale if we're going to have a chance 
to keep within reasonable planetary boundaries, whether it's 1.5 degrees or as close to 1.5 degrees as we, can, as we can possibly get. Within that scheme, we're going to have to pursue a range of removal technologies. We're gonna to have to pursue nature-based solutions like uh, regenerative agriculture and reforestation. We're going to have to pursue engineered solutions like carbon capture and storage and like direct air capture. And of all of them, direct air capture offers some enormous benefits. It's scalable, it's verifiable, it's extremely high quality. Um, and, and so, on, and you can have a lot of flexibility on where you locate it. But of course, the elephant in the room is actually a big elephant, which is it costs way too much today. And that at the 600 to $1,000 a ton that direct air capture costs right now, um, you know, you can find a few companies, particularly when you add in the IRA subsidy that came about in last year's legislation. So you can find the BCGs or Swiss Re's or JP Morgan's or Microsoft's that are ready to make some commitments, even at very high prices. But the truth is that the vast majority of companies are not going to be ready to make commitments at those prices and certainly nowhere near the volumes that we need to really take on this challenge. So that brings us to a simple question and the research, one of the privileges of being the global chair is that sometimes you get to really push something you think is important. And for me, among the most important topics in the world right now, and certainly for us in our own internal thinking and the work we do with our clients is, well, can we really dramatically lower the cost of direct air capture? Can we get it down to $200? Can we ideally get it substantially below $200, approaching $150 or even $100 a ton? And we, I've had the privilege of having some amazing colleagues who've been digging into this topic for most of this year and actually engaging with many in the industry and beyond to look into that. And the conclusions of that, which I'm only gonna do the very top lines today, and I have colleagues who are much more expert than me that are in the room if at a break you want to dig in more to it. And we just published a report online yesterday around this. The conclusion is that getting to 200 and even well below 200 is possible, but it's going to take an enormous amount of work. It's going to take government support, it's going to take new models of collaboration, and it's going to take building at a scale that is much faster than the pathways we're currently on. And therefore, a business-as-usual approach is not going to get us where we need to. And the question is how we can all work together as an industry and with many beyond it to try to change those, uh, bu that business-as-usual approach and go faster. So I'm just going to highlight a few things quickly before Christoph and I have a chance to, uh, to talk. Uh, the first is something that probably many of you have seen in different forms, but simply that um, uh, removals is a key part of the strategy, and that's not a BCG conclusion. That's a conclusion of many others, including here the IPCC. Uh, they produced a number of scenarios about how we can get down to a, a, a 1.5 world, a net zero world. And what you can see here is that the green part, bringing down the, the dark green, bringing down the reduction part, bringing down emissions, is obviously absolutely critical, but it is not going as fast as we need it to. And I think I hear in the opportunity to talk to CEOs all around the world, all of the challenges that companies are facing and moving reductions forward as fast as they would like. And that puts more of a premium in a world where we can't reduce as fast as we would ideally need to, to be able to complement that with removals at scale, not removals with you know, plants here and there, or small amounts of agriculture, but removals at gigaton level scale. Probably there's a range of scenarios, there's no pinpoint number, but probably an order of magnitude of 10 gigatons of carbon back in the ground um, uh, by 2050 uh, per year. And if you look at it growing, it grows over the course of the century under this sort of midline scenario to closer to 20 billion gigatons. As I said, there's a range of technologies that can do that. There is no one solution, but DAC is and should be a critical part of that journey to bring the removals to the scale that we need at the unprecedented speed that we need to create this entirely new industry. The second point is why do we need to lower the cost? I mean, the, the, I'll come at it from two ways. First, what's on this chart, and second, the conversations that I get to have and the work that we do with our clients. This was work uh, that we did with EDF 
Um, and, and basically, we surveyed hundreds, hundreds of potential customers for various carbon uh, reduction and removal technologies. And we asked them, at what stage would you begin to take this as part of your voluntary package? And what you can see is at the very high price points we're at today, it's not zero. I named a few companies earlier. But the truth is, it's very, very few companies that are willing to make this a part of their voluntary removals. As the costs get lower, you start to see many more saying, we would want this as part of our voluntary removals uh, package. And the inflection points that we would observe are one is around $200 a ton and one is around $100 a ton. And, and I realize, you know, we don't get to wish this and have it come true. It has to be technically feasible. I'll get to that in a second. But we have to be honest in acknowledging that if we're going to have this be a big part of the solution at gigaton scale, which is what the world needs, then we need to be able to find ways to lower the cost. And I'm going to come to that in a second. I will come at it from the other angle, too. A lot of BCG's work with our clients is helping them draw essentially carbon abatement curves. So how much does it cost? And in some cases, how much do you save by removing carbon from the most advantageous ton to remove to the most costly ton to remove? And we do these across industries, value chains, and companies. And what we see over and over again is that the actual first, say, um, 40 to 50 percent can often be done at low to no cost with renewable energy, sometimes even with a, a positive return. There's another 20 to 30 or 40 percent that you can reduce at quite moderate cost, well below these 100 to 200 dollars a ton. But for most companies, and for sure for most value chains, you end up with 20 to 40 percent of the abatement curve that costs north of 150 dollars, sometimes well north of 200 dollars a ton. So if we can take DAC and bring it down to a reasonable cost in this range, in this $100 to $200 range, we not only have more people wanting to use it as part of their voluntary emissions, we have more companies that, as they draw their curves, can suddenly cap the last part of that emissions line and use this technology instead of much higher cost technologies, which comes with real economic benefits. So then the question is how to do it. And uh, this has gone in, in much more detail in the, in the report, so I would refer you to that. But I would just highlight our business as usual approach doesn't get us there. You know, that, that we believe that if we're on our current pathways, we're more likely heading to three to $400 a ton, which by the way is well below where we are today. We're not at all saying we can't get better than we are, but that that pathway doesn't get us close to the sort of gigaton plus scale that we need. The energy prices we modeled in a base case scenario are pretty high. The weighted average cost of capital, will you include debt that looks at this as a pretty risky proposition and is not willing to come in in big ways and is relatively high cost, combined with equity owners that also see it as risky and demand high equity returns, means that the overall weighted cost of capital are pretty high, less than, less than the cost of capital for um, for uh, you know, a whole new venture space typically, but still quite high for what this industry needs. And that we assume that the traditional learning rates, even if we do better than classic learning rates of 9, 10%, even in the 11 to 13% range, we're not dropping the cost fast enough. Then we looked at two scenarios. What does it take to get below $200 a ton? That would mean, we believe, getting to cumulative capacity such that we'd be at one to two gigatons per year of annual volume. That's the sort of volumes we need where we believe you get enough cumulative learning to drive down the curve. We need substantially lower energy costs. We need to find ways to lower the cost of capital. I'll come back to that in a second. And we need to be able to have good learning curves that go along with that. And if we want to get to in the range of $100 a ton, probably below 100 is quite optimistic, I would say. But even getting close to $100 a ton, then we're going to need to be even higher in terms of the amount of capacity we build. We're going to need to be even cheaper in terms of energy. Uh, we're going to have to treat this. I want to come back to this weighted average cost of capital. There's an interesting analogy that came about in doing our work, which is to think of carbon dioxide in the air much as a municipal waste. Um, and if you think about it as municipal waste, we pay $170 to $200 a ton in the wealthier countries to deal with municipal waste as end-to-end -end costs. So if we think of the carbon dioxide that's in the air as waste, 
a range of $100 to $200 a ton is not a crazy range to be in. But how do cities and governments handle that? Well, they make it as cheap as possible for people to put capital in. They, they, they provide municipal bonds. They do other ways to lower the cost of capital to get it closer to a 5 to 7% range for capital rather than the sort of 10 plus range we're in. And then finally, we need to push as much as we can to get the learning rates up. If you look at gas turbines, they were on a 15% learning curve in terms of capital costs, meaning every time volumes doubled, you could lower costs by 15%. Those are the sort of ranges we're going to need in terms of the capital we deploy here, which is tremendous amounts of capital to be able to bring the cost down. And in order to do that, in order to do that, we need to think about learning as an industry, not just learning as individual companies. Individual companies' learning will be relatively slow. Industry working together, often with prodding by government or other investors to say, not on core technologies that allow you to be differentiated, your sorbents or particular aspects that give you competitive advantage, but on all sorts of enabling technologies, from fans, and pumps and handling massive amounts of carbon dioxide and putting it back in the ground. We need the industries w working together to drive cumulative learning as fast as we possibly can to get those learning rates as high as we can possibly get them. And that if we can do those things, if we can start to view this as a necessary waste removal like we view so many others, if we can accelerate collaboration in the industry, if we can locate this in places and support it with the cheapest energy that we can find, and if we can create all sorts of incentives and government support to drive volume, then we can get it to the kind of cost range where this can really be a part of the long-term solution. So let me pause there. Christoph, I think you and I were going to talk for a few minutes and uh, look forward to getting into stuff. Thanks. Rich, you're one of the most renowned people when it comes to leadership and sustainability. And like having someone like you and educating the most important leaders of this planet on sustainable uh, sustainability, having you, having someone like you on this conference is big news. This morning I talked about widening circles and I reached out to you and asked you to join this conference. This was one of the bigger news of the last year. Now, even bigger than that for me to see is that someone like you, working on a level like you do, being knowledgeable, that knowledgeable in air capture and commissioning the work that you commissioned, which is crucial to our industry, is, an, is very important for us going forward. So I'm wondering, how did you come about air capture? Yeah, uh, it's, well, first, I just have to admit that for me, the starting journey, much as we do so much work for clients now, was about what BCG needed to do to become net zero ourselves. Because if you look at our footprint, our footprint is 78%, our baseline footprint, it's gotten better since then, but our baseline footprint is 78% um, aviation. We fly, I mean, we're here, you know, we're going to clients all the time, and when you fly, you produce carbon in the atmosphere as well as other things. And, and so we've been on a journey ourselves for how to decarbonize BCG and how to be truly net zero by 2030. And we quickly concluded that um, one, we can reduce the amount of travel intensity you know, per person in BCG quite substantially, but we will still, even in 2030, be flying a lot, which means we'll be putting a lot of carbon in the air. Avoidance related offsets, we didn't feel were real enough, so we needed to remove. And while some of our removals can be nature-based, that we felt it was critical for people like us to be early catalysts to be a part of the engineered solutions world. So then you get to the second question, well, sustainable aviation fuel. Why don't we just buy tons and tons of sustainable aviation fuel? And we are buying a lot and we will buy a lot. I guess I'll give you an analogy, which is what I think about all the time. I think, um, Sustainable aviation fuel is the equivalent of a solution for AB positive blood. If someone had a blood disease and they were AB positive, you'd say, we need a solution for AB positive blood, and you would look to invest to create that solution. But the truth is only 3% of the population in the world has AB positive blood, so you'd come up with that solution. Wouldn't it be better to invest, if you're going to put tons of money in, wouldn't it be better to invest in O negative blood? Because if you invest in O negative blood, you not only solve your problem, your AB positive blood problem, you solve it for anybody, anybody's blood, because O negative is the universal donor, and you can put it anywhere. In my mind, DAC is the universal donor 
in the carbon capture world. If we can make, I know it's super hard, I know it's way too expensive, I'm sure you all who work in the industry every day come up against all the obstacles to do it. So I would, it would be arrogant to tell you, you know, there's some easy solution. But if we can solve it, it is the O negative uh, blood of carbon capture, of, of, you know, carbon removal, which we desperately need in the world. So we started putting more time into it. We tried to understand the landscape. And then with this, we're trying to, you know, come to our own conclusions about how much effort to put into it. And we believe it's worth a lot of effort. Well, with the business model you're, you're having at the Boston Consulting Group, you're obviously seeing a lot on the market. And again, you're consulting a lot of corporations on right. sustainability generally, but maybe also on carbon dioxide removal specifically. And I think it would be a waste if we didn't ask you, what are you seeing on the market when it comes to sustainability in general and carbon dioxide removal specifically or air capture specifically? So. I'll give you the good news and the challenges. The good news is, in all honesty, I see a lot more companies at the most senior levels realizing that being a part of moving to a net zero world um, uh, is an important part of their responsibilities. And I would say equally encouraging an important source of future business opportunity because we all know it's much easier to commit time and energy and investment when you think it's actually going to help your business be more successful than when you do it as an obligation to someone else or to society, but it's not going to help you. And I think more and more companies are realizing that the tailwinds provided by three to five trillion dollars a year of global investment in sustainability, that those tailwinds make it more likely if you're playing with those tailwinds to find sources of growth in your business than if there were headwinds. So that's the, that's the encouraging part. And you see it in the number of people signed up for SBTI. You see it in a lot of things. The second encouraging part is um, I think some of the measurement frameworks, I, I had a chance to listen in on the MRV discussion earlier. I really thought it was well articulated how important that is. And I would say that, you know, having measurements that people need to report that require, that force transparency are very good. I love what ISSB is doing. There's some other reporting initiatives I think may be more challenging, but I think what ISSB, International Sustainability Standards Board, is doing is great. So that's good. Now, that's the, the good parts. The hard part is one, it's just not fast enough. It is just not fast enough. And, and I think most people realize just how unlikely it is we can get to 1.5 degrees. Probably not impossible, there can always be breakthroughs, but extremely challenging. But the honest truth is if we don't get to 1.5, we need 1.6. And if we don't get to 1.6, we need 1.7. And we need to push as fast, as fast as we can. And the second is, because of some of the pressures from society, because of the way things are counted, I see a lot of emphasis on reductions, and I don't think enough companies are embracing where removals fit in that journey. And, and so part of what I try to do in almost every discussion, of course, is to encourage every kind of reductions that they can do as fast as they can do them, but then to get them to acknowledge that between the risks of permitting delays, the risks of uh, access to materials, all of the challenges that they have to work through, that probably won't be at a pace they desire, and they should be looking at different kinds of removals as a part of that mix, and I'd say we're very early on in that journey. Yeah. Well, I can share with you what we are seeing on the market, and I had I a sneak uh, preview at the report you, you published last uh, uh, yesterday, and I saw that there's a cost potential of $70, if I'm not wrong, for like the low temperature. We, when we did capture. the best case, we came out to $70 to $90 a ton, but I didn't talk about that here because we think so, that's a real stretch to be. So here. I can all already imagine that some people out there will think, oh, wow, that's amazing, like $70 to $90 in 2050. Why don't I wait until 2050? It'll be a good deal until then, right? So, and this we, we're seeing quite often. What, sh what should we tell them? If, if people say, hey, tw you know, net zero in 2050, that's a long time to go, why should they act now? Like, what should we tell potential buyers yes. of carbon removal to act now? So it's a totally... It's really the wrong way to think about it. I mean, I don't know how blunt you are in your conversations. I tend to be pretty blunt, so you can decide. But I think that we have a responsibility, every one of us, in every firm that we're in, to be looking at how we accelerate on that journey and how we help others accelerate. And the first way we help others accelerate is we look in our value chains. We look at the suppliers and the customers we work with, and we think not just about what we do, but what we do to create the right mindset, incentives, shared learning to do that. But then second, we all have to lift our heads up from our own value chains 
and look at the broader industry view. If people don't step, I mean, the charts were very clear. If we don't get to gigatons worth of capacity in 2050, we have no shot to get the cost down to where we need them. So, so it's, like, it's like a vicious cycle. If they take that mind, if everybody takes that mindset, not my problem, come back to me when it's $100 a ton or whatever the number is, or 125 even, you know, we'll never get the early investments that we need to do this. And I think one of your speakers earlier talked about the role of government in that, and I really agree with that individual. I do want governments to step up, and I was making a big push a year ago to make sure that we put as much support in for removals as part of the IRA deal. I hope that, you know, when Europe eventually comes up with something, removals will be a part of that. I believe in government, but I believe companies have a responsibility too, and they can choose. For some of them, it will make more sense to do regenerative agriculture and soil. For some CCUS and really focusing on that will be important. But for, like I said, it's oh, negative blood. So like every company should be trying to find at least a little slice that they can do to, to incent the growth here, which will then benefit everyone. Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out BCG is one of our early clients. Like you were yeah. the very, one of the very early ones moving and actually buying carbon dioxide removal from Kleinbergs. And I'm wondering whether there are any experiences you can share like over the time, like you have been in the market uh, for quite some while, and I'm wondering whether there are any experiences based on the carbon removal procurement you right. did you, you can share with the audience. I think, look, the one thing I would say, and, and, and I know many of you are probably in the industry talking to potential customers, it is really complicated to sort all this through. And I would just say from our end, you know, we have a fantastic team working on this, a number of whom are here today, you know, that are working on it. But, you know, even with us, it's taken us a really long time to feel like we really understand that we understand the obstacles. We can pressure test the economics to feel good. We know how things like the incentives in IRA get worked into your plans. And so I think that you can't underestimate how important, you can't overestimate how important it is to invest in education for the broader corporate and government landscape and to have them see that supporting this is not some moral hazard, that that means you're anti-reductions or you're working against reductions. We need both. The IPCC says that. Everybody who looks at it carefully knows that. You're, how you're a part of the solution, how your economics work, and how their early investments in you fundamentally can change the curve that will benefit them and benefit everyone. And then the second is, you know, everybody needs role models. We all do. So I would say, you know, the advantage of getting one customer is you have the ability to use them as an example, of, particularly if it's someone they respect, of someone who made this choice and maybe use that to help get a second customer and a third customer. And getting your customers talking to each other, particularly when you have some forward-leaning ones, I think that can make a real difference to help get others who are sort of at a tipping point to maybe tip in the direction of taking a chance rather than sitting on the sidelines. Yeah. Last market question because we switched to standard setters. Going forward, what are you seeing on the market? Volumes, prices, anything you can share? You, you mentioned sustainable aviation fuels. At the end of the day, that's my favorite interview question, like how, like how do we make CDR attractive in light of sustainable aviation fuels? What are you seeing well, on the market? Well, those are two as separate questions. So, <laughs> Uh, m my team is closer to it. I think I'm encouraged. Look, $180 a ton is probably not what the industry needs given the current price point. I think it would actually be exactly the right subsidy in the 2030s when we can get costs hopefully down to 400 and we're subsidizing down to the low 200s. You know, I, 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 but I think, I think the 180 is a bit short now, but it is a meaningful amount of a subsidy. Like, it's a hell of a lot better than any of us thought a year ago on this day we were going to have coming out of the U.S., and hopefully other countries will get close to it. Look, we were, we were hoping, including the subsidies, I mean, with subsidies on top, to seeing prices in the, in the low to mid 300s. I think that we're not quite there yet, to be honest. We're starting to see things getting close, but probably not quite there. But I feel like that's the range where I think you'd start to get a lot of early entrance. You, you know, I showed you that curve. You're even at, you know, 300 or 325, you know, which would be 500 after the subsidy, you're not going to get a lot of players in, but you don't need a lot right now. You need enough to be able to build some of these early plants and get things going. And my instinct is we're not quite there yet. We're maybe one generation too early for that. But that's what I think could make a difference. But, you know, you all are in the market. I'm not. So I may be too optimistic or too pessimistic. So I, I don't want to overstate relative to the expertise that sits in this room. Yeah. 
Well, turning to standard setters, yeah. science-based target initiative, UN, at, at the end of the day, they are determining how the market rolls, right? They like yes, the rules, very much. How, how we play. Like in your point of view, like what is the role they play and what does it mean for them? I think, and I'm not saying anything I haven't said to SBTI. First, I have enormous respect for SBTI. The world is better because they're here. They're in, a, they're in a world where the amount of demand for what they do is scaling up dramatically. It was, it's an NGO that was set up, you know, that's got enormous scaling. So I want to say this with tremendous empathy for what they're doing. But I think that it's really, I'm really hoping that one of the evolutions they'll take soon is to put more legitimacy on removals as part of the pathway, not just within a sector. So a cement company is allowed to do CCUS but not you know, someone who's out of the sector. A food company is allowed to invest heavily in regenerative agriculture and have account, but not a non-food company. I'm really hoping that they'll see that the power of removals and get to some economic requirements. Well, you have to spend at least so much per ton. Like, we shouldn't be able to play two and five dollar a ton games and get credit. I mean, this isn't about the old avoidance stuff that you know, we were reading about, some of which has legitimacy issues and should not count as being different from reducing. But I think, with, with enough of a cost parameter around it, I think that having them recognize removals as an important pathway is important. But I think the starting point, to me, the clear starting point is DAC. Because one, it sure isn't cheap, right? So no one's investing in DAC because there's some huge cost savings project there. We all know that. And two, DAC is the universal, you know, you, whatever this, I don't know this molecule of carbon dioxide, where it came from, who produced it, whether it was here when the dinosaurs were here or whether it was here last week from a power plant. But what I do know is when I put it back in the ground, a thousand feet under the ground, and it eventually solidifies that, that it doesn't matter where it came from, it went back in. And so for me, DAC, provided it's verified, you know, all the MRV stuff we talked about earlier, provided all that, to me that is such a clear and obvious place to work with no moral hazards, with encouragement to build an industry that everybody knows we desperately need decades from now. And the only argument I hear against that, that I feel has legitimacy is, well, we know it can never get cheap enough to be part of the solution. And since we know it can never be cheap enough, then we shouldn't bother to invest now because that's a dollar taken away from doing something else. But in my mind, the whole history of humanity, including in this space, solar, wind, batteries, is that these technologies go so much further than where you think they can go on day one. And that to take one of the most obvious solutions and not do everything we can to give it its best shot to work before we write it off is really doing a disservice to the planet, to people all over the world, to our grandchildren's generations. DAC will not so much touch our children, but it'll have an enormous impact if it works on our grandchildren's lives. And I just don't see why you would, you would having looked at other technologies, be so quick to come to a conclusion, well, this one can't work, so it's a waste of money, so put your money into you know, the last ton of removal or reductions or something else. But I do think that's, I think that plus the moral hazard that people should only focus on reducing and removals is an excuse to not reduce, or you reduce everything and only in 2050, back to your earlier question, then it's okay to do removals. I think first we need it faster, second we can't get it cheap enough unless we invest. So I don't, I don't, I think that's a little of the logic, but we need to change that logic. Rich, thank you. Those are very strong points to end on. Again, it's a big pleasure and privilege to, to have you with us. Thank you. Well, thank you for all you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, that was really super. What a great introduction to the topic. Let's drill a little bit deeper now and get some of the insights and experiences from Microsoft. Now, Brandon Middaw is Microsoft's Climate Innovation Fund uh, Director in their Environmental Sustainability team. She couldn't be here in, per in, in person, but has sent us this message. In 2020, Microsoft made a commitment to be carbon negative by 2030, and to remove all of our company's historic emissions by 2050. This is our carbon moonshot. It's a bold commitment, reflecting our values and our determination. It requires us to be all in, transforming our operations and mobilizing our supply chain, our investments, and our policy voice toward a shared net zero goal. Since we made this commitment, the urgency has only increased 
The 2023 Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Synthesis Report makes it clear. We're at the crossroads of a planetary climate emergency. To keep warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius will require rapid, far-reaching, and unprecedented changes in all aspects of society. We need bold, decisive action as the window of opportunity is narrowing. To that end, Microsoft is taking action across three concentric circles of influence, our own operations, our network of customers and partners, and our place in the global economy as a leading technology provider to empower others. Within our own operations, we aim to reduce our carbon footprint by more than half this decade, and then to remove the rest in our journey to becoming carbon negative by 2030. This requires us to source low carbon substitutes and carbon free energy to power our businesses. Upstream, that means a focus on sustainable semiconductors and hardware, sustainable construction materials and sustainable fuels. Downstream, it means a focus on logistics, customer power and waste elimination. And on the other side of the carbon ledger, it means a commitment to high quality, durable and additional carbon removal in both nature based and engineered forms. Among our network of customers and partners, our commitment to sustainability means an imperative to develop and offer the technology and tools that the global economy needs for measuring carbon to mitigate climate impacts. And finally, in our role as a global corporate leader, our commitment requires us to pull all the levers of climate action at our disposal, committing our capital and lending our voice to push for climate solutions at scale. In 2020, I spoke for the first time with Christoph and Jan by video in the early days of the pandemic about their vision for commercializing Climeworks solid sorbent DAC technology. And then last fall, I had the privilege of visiting the Orca plant outside Reykjavik, Iceland to see their vision in action. The Climeworks team has blazed a trail for rapidly taking ideas from the lab to the field and scaling them up for climate action going from presenting a thesis in 2015 to commissioning ORCA for initial operations in 2021 is practically a land speed record. We continue to be encouraged as Climeworks has begun delivering real tons of permanent carbon removal and has honed its verification process in partnership with DNV. The mindset of doing the right things in the right ways is one that will be critical to scaling carbon removals in the years to come. In parallel, here in the US, after years of relative inaction on climate, late last summer we saw passage of the Inflation Reduction Act, mobilizing American policy, capital, and ingenuity toward meaningful and unprecedented climate action. This, paired with the EU's Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive and other policies, means that there's been enormous progress on the policy front in recent years, and there's much to be hopeful about. There are many reasons to celebrate how far we've come. And this gathering today is one of them. Today's Climeworks DAC Summit is both a celebration of how far this community of carbon removal innovators has come and a recognition that for the world to reach net zero, we need a whole lot more net negative technologies and projects to come online in a short time. To achieve a 1.5 degree future, even with 90% electricity decarbonization and 100% electrification of vehicles and building heat, we're going to need carbon removal at scale. In the US alone, our goals require between half a gigaton to 1.8 gigatons annually. This needs to happen alongside all our other climate investments as a society in grid decarbonization, clean fuels, materials, and nature-based sequestration. We know that climate change does not have a single solution. And within the portfolio of climate technologies, including removal, it's important to develop the range of innovations and pathways to drive down the cost of carbon abatement. As a buyer and an investor in this market, we're convinced that early demand and early capital need to come together to drive the growth of highly durable and additional carbon removal solutions. In terms of early demand, we know we must establish a robust demand signal for carbon removal, and my colleagues are hard at work on procurement at scale. In addition to our early contracts with partners such as Climeworks, Heirloom, Carbon Capture Inc., 
Our recently unveiled purchase agreement with Orsted underscores the sheer scale at which we're willing to engage to create carbon removal capacity. Microsoft is planning for a portfolio of roughly 5 million metric tons per year of carbon removal in 2030 across nature-based and engineered solutions. And we know that long-term contracts are needed to jumpstart the development of those projects. We estimate that most of the carbon removal capacity that will be online and available in 2030 will have been designed by 2025, and nearly all of it designed by the end of 2027. We're committed to meeting this moment, so we're active in project origination and collaborative design to make it happen. As we survey the field of potential carbon removal suppliers, we're heartened to see the influx of talent entering the field and the get stuff done, get stuff built attitude that we encounter. This field attracts highly motivated long-term thinkers who will roll up their sleeves to find the solutions to tough problems, and that's all for the better. At the same time, it's important as an industry to avoid over-promising on pricing or timelines. After all, if you promise to build Rome in a day, my procurement colleagues will expect you to deliver. In terms of mobilizing early capital, Microsoft's Climate Innovation Fund was created to do just that. In the past three years, we've committed nearly $700 million to emerging climate technologies globally, including DAC investments in Climeworks Orca facility in Iceland, and to support the broader burgeoning ecosystem of innovators, including Climeworks, Heirloom, Climate Robotics, and others. Additionally, we're a philanthropic participant in backing first-of-a-kind projects with Breakthrough Catalyst. This can help to bridge the gap between first-of-a-kind deployments and commercial operation at scale. Finally, one of the most important market dynamics that we're observing today is the importance of engaging and consulting with frontline communities that will be affected by carbon market development over time. We're eager to see more developers engaging deeply in incorporating community and justice factors in their carbon projects. The pace of DAC adoption needs to be exponential, but it's not unprecedented. In fact, we've seen solar and onshore wind follow an even steeper adoption curve. As costs come down and production scales up, a virtuous cycle of supply and demand have taken hold in those markets. We need to apply that same playbook to carbon removal, and we need to collaborate across industries mobilizing support for these technologies to reach the scale and price at which more corporate buyers will be eager to participate. The role of voluntary carbon markets is to drive climate action, even in the current absence of a comprehensive compliance market. To do so credibly and sustainably, these markets will require clear standards, a consistent and interoperable approach to carbon accounting, and technological tools for monitoring, reporting, and verification at scale. Microsoft is investing across those dimensions to enable the voluntary markets. Our investments in startups such as SustainCert and Perennial are aimed at improving the certification and verification processes for carbon market offerings. At the same time, we're partnering with governments and civil society organizations to spur action on building the frameworks for carbon markets, such as the Carbon Call with ClimateWorks Foundation. These same issues will be critical to proving out DAC and carbon removal writ large. As an example, Climeworks efforts with DNV to verify the carbon removals at Orca is a great example of showing the work. And we look forward to seeing other organizations roll out their measurement and verification approaches to clearly show the math. We believe that a strategy of transparency is absolutely crucial to solidifying confidence in carbon market solutions. Sunlight is a keystone of our own internal decarbonization efforts, and we're committed to publishing our progress and our lessons learned from our overall sustainability efforts and our carbon removal activities in particular. We see this transparency and educational contribution as being at least as important as all of our other work, because mobilizing others is the best way to have a multiplier effect. By pulling all the levers of climate action, we're working to go farther faster to demonstrate that the path to carbon negative is achievable and it's here. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today and have a great rest of the summit.
So our thanks, of course, to Brandon and to Microsoft, who are key partners uh, for Climeworks. Um, so how does this matter, or how can we make this relevant to your company? Well, that's exactly what we're going to try to find out. How can your company help drive up carbon dioxide removals? Uh, our next session is going to be a panel discussion, and we're going to speak to business leaders who are doing just that. You will be able to ask questions as part of this panel discussion, so uh, have your brains at the ready. Uh, and for now, I'm going to hand over to Brian Kahn from Bloomberg to host this session. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, well, it's a pleasure to be here today, and it's great to see such a great turnout for uh, such an interesting event. Um, so one thing that I am really excited about is it feels like we've seen, as a journalist, you know, one thing that really excites me is seeing, it feels like every other day, there's a new corporate climate buy for CDR. Um, and yet, it's still a relatively small number of purchases and a small number of tons removed. So today, I want us to talk a little bit about what you all are thinking about when it comes to thinking about how to scale up demand, the roles that your companies play or the roles that you can play in advising companies, and ultimately how CDR fits within a broader net zero plan. Um, one of the things I've heard a lot today is this idea of reductions versus removal. And um, we've heard it from scientists, from various folks on the stage. I'd really like to hear how each of you is thinking about reductions versus removal for your company or for those you advise. So um, Rachel, I just want to dive right in and turn it to you. Yes, I'm Rachel. I'm the CEO and co-founder of, uh, of Sweep. And uh, Sweep is a um, data, you know, SaaS, a data platform. And we are helping our customers actually to, to the corporates and financial institutions to reduce uh, their carbon emissions in their business and their entire uh, value chain. So we are um, working with customers uh, in the early days, I would say, of, the, of their climate journey, because we are here to collect the data, to measure, and to, you know, to help them to track you know, their uh, progress in terms of reductions. And of course, uh, what I can tell you about reduction versus uh, removal is that uh, we absolutely have to do both at the same time. So my work is to, my role is to make sure they are um, understanding that um, and put them in the safe uh, environment where everything is precise, everything is uh, yeah, auditable, so that from the emissions that they are, you know, from the carbon uh, that they are emitting to the, the actions they have to put in place, um, everything must be uh, measurable, precise, and this is, uh, this is why we need uh, technologies like uh, carbon removal, DAC, who are, which are super precise. But everything has to be, uh, to be done at the same time. So we are in an urgency, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Misha, uh, Swiss Re has been doing this kind of work for, for quite a while, so I'd be really curious to hear how you're thinking about it now. Yeah, so <clears throat> my name is Misha. I'm from Swiss Re. Thanks a lot for uh, having all of us here uh, doing the buyer's panel. Um, it's a very fundamental question that you have here uh, to begin with, you know, what's uh, the importance for a company between avoidance and removals. I think the importance, A, is to understand the difference, and this is not a given. So there it needs a lot of communication by the CSR professionals within every company to, to explain what the difference is. We shouldn't also, you know, name one better than the other necessarily. For us, it was important to say that carbon finance plays an important role in the international fight against climate action and how the private sector can engage. Uh, we said we've been supporting good climate reduction or carbon reduction projects since 2003. If we now just unplug that carbon finance from those projects, we saw during the financial crisis in 2008 and 9 what happened. A lot of sunk costs, those projects did not deliver any more mitigation outcome and this is something that we should prevent. We should give a perspective to climate reduction, car uh, carbon reduction projects that they need to find new financiers. Under the Paris Agreement, the ratcheting up mechanism means that there will be less and less outcomes to be sold from one country to another or even to uh, a, 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 a private sector player. So the private sector needs to go towards removals, but that shouldn't happen from today to tomorrow, also in order not to create this impression of there is a hype or something. So Marcus showed you the data, it's not a hype. Uh, most of the money still goes to the conventional way of uh, doing compensation measures. Uh, what Swiss Re did, we said we're going to basically just announce today that we phase out the use of avoidance credits and we ramp up at the same time the use of removal credits so that by 2030 we go from 100% avoidance 
in 2020, 200% removals in uh, 2030. That gives a perspective to the market. It shows every player what we are about to do. We also gave a price tag, which is, which is important. It started at 100, where we can then you know, buy the mix of avoidance and uh, removals so that we land at $100 per ton, but that price increases over time to $200 per ton, um, and everybody knows what our willingness to pay will be in 2030. Thanks. And let's see, Michael, how is Mammoth thinking about carbon removal yeah. versus production? Yeah, thanks a lot. I'm obviously not an expert in, in carbon removal uh, as I'm running the supply chain at Mammoth, uh, but it's fantastic to see the passion and the energy here in the room. And it's as well a privilege to present more or less the work of the team, our corporate responsibility team and all employees who have done this. And I guess for us it is important to have a clear strategy and also having discussed and also looked to the, to the right-hand side uh, to Misha and to, to, to Swiss Re. So our climate strategy is we want to do our best and then remove the rest. So we also take a conscious decision that we don't want to work with avoidance credits, but we do everything that we can to reduce our carbon footprint. And there will be some residual that we are going to remove. And this is where we started to look around and find ways how we could do that. And obviously, for us, uh, corporate responsibility is a hygiene factor. It's not a differentiator in the outdoor market. Uh, as you know, there are many players in the market, and also our customers are very close to that, which is fantastic because they love the mountains as we do. But there is something that we can do, and we also want to be the forerunners and also join the fantastic teams that are out there who are doing that. And being on the front line is for us some sort of an obligation it's also a technical mountain brand. We also want to be close to the technical removal technology and also present this to our customers as a solution and also have some sort of bit of, a, I would say, um, educational or at least an information obligation on the market when customers come in and ask, okay, wh what is it and uh, what do you do about it so that we can also answer that and advocate and find more supporters to, to that movement that we see right now. Excellent. Well, so I actually want to stay on that for a second. I'm very curious, do you view yourself, um, you know, you're a very customer-facing company. And so what role do you see your company playing as far as making cover removal more understandable to the public in general? It's, I think it is just a, a starting point. And as we heard it today from, from Howard, from, from Rich, and as well from, from Marcus, which I liked a lot, is some sort of, it is about the words and how you how to transport the message. And therefore, it is really difficult uh, to get closer to the customers and educate, but not being an evangelist and say, okay, this is what you have to do, but get some sort of feedback from the market. What we see as well when we work with our retailers, that it is an obligation if you want to be listed with certain retailers that you have to fulfill certain requirements. And that's the one thing. And the other thing is that that has to be done. We want to do the right thing. And therefore, this is an important, let's say, part of the entire strategy that we also take this removal into our overall portfolio of what we do. Great. So, Misha, your company is in a bit of a different place in terms of how you can influence the carbon removal market. And I'm really curious to know, you know, I understand that there are maybe three pillars and three ways you're looking at it. I wonder if you can tell us a little about those three pillars of how you're thinking about carbon removal at Swiss Re. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, it's a bit of mantra that I'm trying to convey. It's a theory of change where I believe so. Brand before talked about three levers uh, of the private sector, and she walked us through the value chain, essentially. I think you can go higher, one level up. Uh, the three levers I would like to talk about is the private sector can do three things. You can de-risk clean technologies, you can finance it, and you can buy that stuff. The fourth would be advocacy, but uh, I leave that to others. And if you look at that, the insurance industry is really perfectly positioned, if not the most perfectly positioned industry, to do all three in parallel. Because yes, we can finance, we're an in institutional investor, we're going to you know, invest those premia that we earn uh, until the claims come in, right? We can buy, we have the necessary coins, I, I dare to say that out loud uh, as a you know, member of the financial industry. But we can, on top, really offer those risk transfer solutions to upcoming solutions uh, in order to uh, make more capital from different places flow uh, where we think uh, you know, the climate journey is uh, supposed to go. So these are the three pillars that you mentioned and uh, very, very thankful for uh, letting me uh, basically play this figure of change. It's uh, not that easy as it sounds, I can tell you. So it's uh, much easier to buy things, to convince somebody to buy the right thing. That's how we started. 
it was possible to convince our asset management to invest, to really do the due diligence. Uh, we don't have a venture mandate, but they did the due diligence. We placed an equity ticket to Climeworks. Um, and now I'm working on the third one, how to uh, ensure that. So I'm very grateful that we had Natalia here on stage. It probably takes the smaller ones uh, in order to you know, do the pioneering work before the big uh, conventional casualty underwriters are really getting into the space. Thanks for sharing the three pillars. I hope they catch on with everyone here. <laughs> um, Rachel, I'm wondering if you can tell us a little about the companies you work with. Do you, you know, how do you make sure that companies see the ROI when it comes to really thinking about carbon removal as being a core part of their climate planning? They're not there yet, definitely. Um, I, the, the, the customer base I have are already, um, you know, just um, kind of, this, the, the, the level of maturity is absolutely different. Uh, you can take, you know, uh, uh, in Europe, for example, same industry, you know, same size of corpor two corporations, you know, of same industry, same size, and you will see the, the maturity regarding the climate journey that is absolute, that can be absolutely, absolutely different. So, how I see things coming, you know, so it will be my role from my software, you know, to mask the complexity of showing them the ROI that they can, uh, they can get, you know, out of, out of it. But where, where I strong, strongly believe in all those dots who are being connected at the moment is that you, in Europe, you, you all heard about the CSRD coming, uh, okay, for companies, and it, it's, uh, it means that just measuring, you know, and understanding the carbon footprint uh, will be mandatory, you know, under regulatory uh, uh, constraints. And this is good because once you have it, it means that, and, and there is much more coming with the CSRD, there is also, you will have to show, you know, a capex, you will have to show initiatives of reductions, etc. And hopefully, this is when that kind of software, you know, that I've been building, will be able to show those customers, okay, and now that you're here, we are masking the complexity as well to, 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 to uh, direct you to the Climeworks, to what you have to do from a, from a removal standpoint. So, and hopefully, and uh, you know, all the policymakers will understand that uh, today, hopefully we will need uh, that CSRD as well, you know, for, uh, for removal uh, coming. But uh, yes, I think that, you know, uh, uh, that connecting the dots to capture, you know, the attention of uh, our customers when it comes to helping them to reduce and uh, make sure that they are compliant uh, uh, and that they are transitioning to a low-carbon uh, uh, economy. I hope that we will uh, make this, um, yeah, we will uh, that captivity mode, okay, to uh, show them how important it is to uh, to then to yeah to to remove and to go even beyond that because, as you mentioned, they are not all educated about it. Uh, it's super difficult to understand, you know, uh, uh, what, what has to be done, reduction versus, th there is too much of a reduction versus removal, while, while actually it's, everything has to be done at the same time. So hopefully my role, uh, you know, and other platforms li like mine are, uh, you know, um, we have to mask that complexity to make sure that it's thrown to the, that next step, you know, and uh, yeah, I'm working for you guys. <laughs> And do, you, do either of you deal with this internally at your companies? I mean, it sounds like they're thinking, it's certainly Swiss Re and women are thinking very much about climate and how to sort of master the reduction versus the removal sort of side of things. But I'm curious, what is it like to have to communicate within your company and make sure that you are making those steps happen? Yeah. So maybe I've thought, and uh, what I'm wearing today is our trail running collection, and uh, that's the first fully decarbonized collection worldwide. And the amount is 250 tons per year. And uh, the total, what we have, is more than 50,000 tons. That, that puts it a bit into perspective. And obviously, what we do internally is that whatever is important is starting with the reduction first. So we have set the programs in place that we get from 50,000 tons, although we want to grow economically, uh, down to 25. And then, if we take that into perspective, then the removing 10%, 20%, what we heard uh, before, is just uh, a starting point. And we wanted to show, first of all, to our colleagues internally, but also to the world, that it's possible. And what it would mean, that it's really tiny at the start, but it can be, become much, much bigger. But we need the capacity on the one hand side, but there is much, much more to do in terms of the reduction first, 
before we then enter this terrain. And, and balancing that out, I guess that's also some sort of the difficulty that we have. And uh, thanks for, for, for that message, uh, uh, Rich, earlier. It is to do both. So on the one hand side, it is full focus on reduction. And then on the other hand side, keeping investing into, into the removal. And it's quite, uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a company, important to understand, OK, where do I put my, my dollars in? Yeah. So in this project or in that project, and to find the right balance, this is what we try to also uh, communicate and educate and, and win, first of all, our, our employees, but as well then, obviously, the consumers and clients out there. Mm -hmm. Misha, I'm curious, like with Swiss Re, it's really interesting because I know you know, you say you're carbon neutral due to the offsets, and you're in the process of, the goal is to phase them out, to make the cross from offsets to removal. And that comes with a price premium. So is there any consideration of that? And how do you sort of, I guess, how do you get you know, buy-in internally to actually make that switch, given that you could buy cheap offsets, right? But buy-in removal is a serious investment. Yeah, as I mentioned, um, we did really not want to go through the annual budget process to go every year and say we're going to need that in order to do something on climate. Um, we felt that an internal carbon price is the perfect thing to do for us because we can have that as a policy over 10 years, which then we communicate and everybody learns about and we get a lot of press and then it's hard to undo that, even if you have a complete change in management. So it's kind of protecting our ability to, uh, to raise the funds that are necessary to, to do this switch. Indeed, it's a big cost increase and there could have been a strategy for, to go from high quality avoidance credits to low quality removals, almost no difference there, $20-ish per ton. Uh, but we knew that it's not going to happen. Looking at the market, the first full-fledged value chain demonstrated uh, CDR from DUCS was by Climeworks in Iceland, and that was definitely way more than $20, as uh, everybody in here probably knows. So we needed to find a way how to finance that up front. And it wasn't possible to go from zero to 100% right away. We need to have some kind of a balance. So the way how we tackled this question was how much are we willing to pay today one on the dollar was what the UN Global Compact is calling for since 2016, so nobody did it as a real internal carbon price. That means real, you collect it and you spend it, balance sheet impacting. Um, so one on the dollar was a good communicable starting point, but we knew that this is not even enough in 2030 in order to then be at 100% removals at the quality that we had envisioned. And uh, eventually, we are just hoping that this is, uh, that market is going to develop, thanks to our own early engagement and market signal, that the $200 will be enough. I completely share the concerns that this is often an overpromise, um, and it will be tough to get there. But I'm also not concerned that we don't fulfill that pledge, because we did everything on the way there to send our market signal. If the market is heavily short in 2029 20, still, um, at least we've done our best to kind of prevent the situation, but we, we might be then able to, to stretch the target uh, and say, well, if the market isn't delivering today, um, we can do more, we can do more impactful buying, we can do more advocacy in order to get others into these long-term off-take agreements, but I'm not so worried that this is not going to happen. I'm just, I can't tell now, who can tell the future? <laughs> Rich, I know you see. Go yeah. ahead. No, what, what, we, what we've seen uh, recently is that, uh, you know, we are trying to productize the whole uh, climate journey, okay, within, uh, within SWIP. Of course, we were starting with the net zero, etc. And what we've seen recently is that we've, we've been switching that semantic about net zero, and it's working far better with our customers when we are presenting them and talking to, to them about contribution instead of that net zero battle, of course, it's science-based, we have to. But let, let's, let's be pragmatic, let's start. And when you, are, when you are talking to them about, OK, the contribution, how, do, how does it start? It starts with a carbon uh, internal, uh, internal carbon tax. Let's say that, uh, OK, so you are starting to measure the, the internal carbon tax. OK, what does it mean if you are uh, benchmarking it with the, the, your, the ETS? Uh, that you have close to your, in your country or else. Or else okay, it, let's say that you have uh, two millions in terms of budget that you have to uh, uh, invest or that you have to, where you have to buy carbon uh, uh, f um, uh, with. Um, they understand that um, having, having that, when you are talking about contribution, they are, they, and when they understand that they can buy with this budget the kind of uh, projects that, that they can buy from the kind of project projects they are, that are important for them or that are, that are located in the countries where they are operating uh, in um, when it's, uh, when it's uh, a very 
technical tech company, okay, they like to in invest into removal or else. The story and the engagement of all the stakeholders within the company is uh, happening right now, you know, and it's uh, already engaging money, etc. In instead of talking about the world net zero, you know, and the more commitment they are uh, uh, doing, having that very um, clear strategy, okay, the more they are also breaking free of pricing volatility, the more they are getting rid of very bad uh, quali uh, quali um, quali um, carbon quality um, mm -hmm. uh, projects. Sorry for my uh, vocabulary. But uh, wait, so the more we are engaging our customers and productizing that contribution instead of right now, you know, that net zero approach, it's, at the end of the day, it's quite the same, right? But there is this uh, urgency and this everything is going faster, you know? Uh, because they understand that, uh, okay, they will never manage right now to, uh, you know, to, uh, to uh, be net zero because they are emitting millions and millions. We are working with large, large, uh, large emitters, uh, dozens of millions of, uh, of CO2, tons of CO2. Uh, but at least they are starting right now. And they are not forcing themselves to buy uh, two euros uh, uh, per, um, uh, tons of, enfin, per tons of CO2 you know, from very bad projects. So maybe there is also a reflections to have about what we are also asking companies and the semantic we are all using uh, to start now. Michael, I see you know, I'm curious to know, you know, you've made the purchase of some CO2 removal already. Is this something that you view as a, I guess internally, do you see a route to increase that kind of purchase going forward? Or is that something that uh, do you have to get, still get other buy-in for? Yeah. So I guess for us, the tipping point was, um, to integrate our climate strategy into the corporate strategy and also being owned by a private equity company, everything we do is to generate company value. So therefore, following as well this path was important to understand, okay, how can we increase the company value over the next couple of years? And can we reserve a certain portion of our net sales for exactly preparing um, for projects, investments into, into credits so that we have a portfolio that we can, can deal with? And that's the path that we have taken because as well from our, our investor side, it was very clear that corporate responsibility or sustainability needs to be part of the strategy. It's part of the, of the company equity at the end. And therefore, we have now the, the position that we can choose, like, like, like Rachel said, uh, we can decide in which project we are going to invest. Do we support a supplier who is building a renewable energy-based uh, um, plant in, in Vietnam? for instance, or do we buy uh, more credits uh, together with, with Climeworks, for instance. So this is the balance of the portfolio that we, that we now have, and it's also our obligation to work towards these funds and see where best we put in our money, so the investment, because at one point in time, I think it's also clear that uh, there will be taxes or there will be some sort of payments for the, the carbon emissions that we have, and to be best positioned, this is the path that we take now in the next years. And then increasing the amount, obviously, is, is one strategy because also we want to be with the first ones. If we now invest, I think we get a better return. And um, this is what we see right now. The cost will go down. And then if we can increase, we would like then to reach that level, obviously, to remove the rest as part of our 2030 target. Yeah. Excellent. Well, I want to open this to questions in a second, but I do have one uh, last question to ask each of you, which I'm very curious to know if, you know, let's transport ourselves to 2030 and we're looking back at the, you know, seven years in between. Uh, I'm really curious, is there, what's one thing that your company or the companies you're advising will have done to help make sure that the market has grown for carbon removal? <laughs> No big deal. <laughs> How are we? How have you helped grow the market for carbon removal by? Oh, if you're looking right. back from 2030. Yeah. I'm. Um, it's it's my responsibility to make sure that uh, our customers understand uh, uh, that they have to invest in a mix of uh, of uh, technologies, in a mix of uh, of uh, solutions. You know, it's not uh, my role. Is not just to to help them to make a, car a carbon footprint and uh, set up a, a trajectory of reductions. My role is to make sure that I am interfacing myself, you know, the, for myself, sweep, uh, 
um, uh, that I am part of that tech stack that is interconnecting all solu the solutions out there that, inter uh, that are interconnecting uh, the, 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 the Climeworks, the DAC technologies, the MRV guys, you know, uh, um, uh, beyond that. So we must promote all the solutions uh, out there, and technology is helping, digital is helping. So I'm doing my part on the digital side. Excellent. I would say we, we thought a lot in 2020 how to do that, so how to be most impactful by 2030. Hence, we set everything that I just talked about into place and, and, and putting us in the position to strike these long-term offtake agreements and then really go out and take the time to, to strike the world's first, I'd argue, at a reasonable price, 10 million over 10 year financial sector player, 10 million is not that much, I know, but it's a good signal towards outside. It creates a role model, right, like uh, Rich talked about, um, where others can, can say, hey, I want to have the same contract like Swiss Re did. Uh, so that helped a lot. So I, I could now sit back and do nothing. I said, I'm working on the insurance piece, which is a hard, hard nut to crack anyway. But all we can do is try to replicate or, or talk about these things that we've done because we really believe in it. Uh, it needs this long-term offtake agreement. It needs future revenue. Right. The problem is the lack of buyers. Fully agree with Julio yeah. here. Um, we believe that, you know, looking at CDR.fi1, it, it looks like you have uh, only 90 suppliers and then 150 buyers in balance, right? No, no, it's for the next 10x upscaling step, you need to fill up this capacity big time before you can talk about the you know, shortage of uh, supply. And uh, go out and talk about it. That's what we're going to do over the next seven years and strike more of these um, contracts uh, on the way. So we have more and more budget to do that. At the same time, that increase in carbon price motivates us to reduce the emissions in the first place. So we kind of created the marginal abatement cost in 2030. What we can reduce at $200 per ton, we have to reduce. Otherwise, it would make economically no sense. So that gives also a good incentive to, to reduce in the first place. So let's sit and wait whether everything plays out how we, how we are uh, supposed to, and talk about it so that more can use that as a role model. Yeah, hopefully the digital will give visibility to what's already working. Mm. This is crazy. 20, in 2023, it's already working. That's cool, right? We need to give visibility to that mm. and fund. Yeah. I think you said it all. We, we started with, with this collection where we, we did some sort of a, a buzz around it and also tried to, to explain a bit what, what carbon removal is. And it is walking the talk. So being part of it, being part of the journey, and then being in the community. We have a broad network of many, many suppliers that we work with. We have our retailers. We have our peers in the, in the outdoor market. We have these forums. We have hundreds of people here, thousands, uh, hopefully, on the screen. So please hear us and join us in this movement. And I think this just, there's not, nothing better than just doing it and, and talk about it. And this is what we do. <laughs> I like that. It sounds like the big theme across all of you is education, education, and more education for Visibility. everyone. Visibility. I love it. Um, well, I'd love to welcome Hannah back on stage and see if we have any questions out in the audience. Indeed, uh, Brian. Maybe we can open the floor, first of all, if there are any questions in the room for our panelists so far. Please just raise your hand. Well, if there are noth is nothing in the room, I certainly have some from our online uh, audience today. And maybe I think this is something that you've kind of hinted at throughout the, the course of this discussion, but I think maybe concretely from a, a corporate perspective, you know, what are the most important things to keep in mind when you're about to um, go into CDR purchases? What would your advice be, each of you, to somebody sitting in the audience who maybe hasn't made that step yet, but is inspired after today? Do you want to take this one? Yeah, I, I take this one. So the first thing is, obviously, you need to be clear about your strategy, so what you would like to achieve and how you would like to do that. And then you need to find partners, partners you trust with, either from authorities or let's say, private organizations that are doing it and um, then create the network and, and just approach them. We had the discussion about MRE, MRV uh, earlier today so that you get also the, um, some sort of security that what you're doing is the right thing. It, it's, it's, it's backed up by, by, by legislation and by authorities and rules. I think that's important. And then start and learn. And I mean, I think that's exactly what you were saying earlier. The, the most important thing is just to start. But Misha, come on, you've been in this business for a long time. You must have seen quite a lot of different 
um, approaches. You must have seen lots of different challenges along the way. So secure top management buy-in, otherwise you can't do anything. So this is uh, at the beginning. Uh, what we did, we took basically our CEO back then to the Hinwil Climeworks plant, and uh, mm -hmm. she coming from Stuttgart, from the automotive. For her, it was like, wow, this is... Uh, uh, so she saw something, and she could relate to it, so that helped a lot. Then secure the funding. So that's uh, absolutely key. Uh, you will never be able to enter long-term into any market if you don't have that funding secured. Um, these are the two most fundamental things. Afterwards, there is enough out there already to, to engage. You can engage strategically with preferred partners because you really want to access something, learn from it, get some, for us, risk engineering experience, uh, get the asset managers to the same table to learn how to invest in those upcoming things. Um, uh, this is, uh, this is uh, clear. You can also join one of the uh, aggregation exercises that are ongoing, next gen, frontier. If you don't, do one, if you don't want to have this work of entering a long-term contract, these are 50 pages documents by now, probably 100, <laughs> but they used to be two pages. I have money, I pay you that price, thanks. And, and that really, you know, we are at the, another level of, uh, of scrutiny today. Uh, if you've joined one of the aggregation clubs, much easier life. Mm -hmm. Or you go uh, over, the, over the counter to a marketplace like Puro, who is well established by now, and uh, have an even easier shot at entering that market. But just send that signal that you are willing to engage early to make your net zero target, your contribution claim, easier uh, for yourself, but also for the whole world. Thank you very much. Rachel, just maybe if we can develop this question a little bit further. What would your advice be to companies, you know, from, a, from their perspective? What are the most important things to consider when embarking on their journey? What are some of the um, things that you recommend to companies to keep in mind? I'm a, I'm a data person, I'm a geeky person, so I will, uh, you know, go back to the data. But uh, yeah, the auditability in this world where there is so much you know greenwashing just open the books open the books when you are measuring and assessing your carbon emissions but open the books about what you are doing to uh, reduce it and to remove it so the my my point is really to you know <laughs> send all the signals to companies about don't mess uh, with that make sure that you are in the safest environment pick up the right technologies to be auditable, because at the end of the day, your customers will ask you to open the books. And it's the same for the technologies, uh, uh, for, the, for the, 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 the removal technologies that they are picking. Uh, make sure that you are investing in technologies that are helping you to open the books to show that what you are doing is uh, helping. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, but it's it's uh, it's simple. At the end of the day, it's about uh, opening the books from end to end. We are in a world where you can't you can't not do that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Customers are here to tell you, uh, you uh, as individuals are here to, and companies are under uh, under threat. Yeah. And if they want to become forever companies, they have to understand that they have to open the books from end to end. So, well, voilà, precision and, uh, and celebration of technologies who are, uh, who are, uh, who are uh, precise. And uh, voilà, showing the, where the world is heading, where we are standing currently, where we are going if we are not uh, investing that amount of money by X years. Yeah, we are going into the wall, so let's do more. We have the figures for that. Donc, voilà. Thank you all so much indeed. Uh, Michael, Misha, uh, Brian, and Rachel, thank you. Merci. Please take a seat in back of the audience. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, Climeworks actually recently si signed a landmark agreement for carbon uh, removals. This is the, the biggest agreement that they've signed in their history, and it was JP Morgan Chase. So we're going to hear now from their head of um, sus operational sustainability at JP Morgan Chase on what their position is when it comes to activating the carbon market and how that is helping to drive market or carbon uh, removal numbers in their droves and scaling their industry. Please give a warm welcome to Brian DiMarino.
Thank you very much, Hannah, for the introduction, and thank you to Climeworks for having me here. Um, I didn't trip on the way up, so the first fear of public speaking was avoided, so that's good. Um, I'm here because JP Morgan announced a commitment uh, to $200 million of CDR offtake, about 800,000 tons uh, of carbon removal in the next nine years. Um, part of that commitment uh, was with Climeworks, uh, which was mentioned, um, the largest CDR offtake from Climeworks. And so a uh, huge thank you to the team uh, at Climeworks for developing what they did, uh, viewing us as a, as a, a real buyer. Um, and negotiating with us to get to this point. Um, I am not, you know, I'm not an engineer, I'm not a scientist, I'm not someone who has been working in this space a really long time. My role at JP Morgan uh, running operational sustainability goes back only two years. Um, I'm a 17 year veteran of JP Morgan, um, but I've only been doing this for a couple of years. Uh, but something I've learned being in the corporate space for that long is that you have to bring people along on a journey with you. Uh, if you truly believe in what you're doing, and you believe that what you're doing can make change, you should bring people along on that journey. And so about a year ago, uh, JP Morgan started writing a paper. Um, we released that paper in conjunction with announcing these carbon offtakes. Um, and that paper talked about our principles around the carbon market. What do we believe as a corporation uh, as a global citizen, uh, is important around carbon removal. Um, and so we put that into words. And it took us quite some time to do it, um, but we also looked at it from the perspective of a financier. Uh, we're not just a buyer, we're a bank. And so as JP Morgan, we can also underwrite um, these companies, we can finance them, we can do project finance, we can do equity raises, uh, we can do a lot of different things. And so how do we think about that from that perspective? Um, and as we were doing that, we came upon a very simple realization, which was simply writing this down is not enough. We have to do something. Uh, JP Morgan has been buying carbon credits uh, since uh, 2007. Um, uh, obviously heavily nature-based, uh, pretty much only nature-based until a couple of years ago. Um, but there was a clear recognition that we needed to do more and we needed to move uh, closer to the CDR space. And so, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the voluntary carbon market and sort of this question around how can it structurally drive the industry, but I also want to define the carbon market maybe in a different way than you think about it. Um, and so the way I think about it, and I'm a pretty simple guy, so I think about things in pretty simple terms. The way I think about it is it's, well, break it down. First of all, voluntary. I look forward to the day when we can drop the V, uh, and this is no longer a voluntary decision for corporations or governments or individuals to take accountability and stewardship for their emissions. For now, there's a V, but I would love for that to go away one day. Carbon, we all know what carbon is. I hope you do. If you don't, turn to the person next to you. They definitely know what it is. Um, and then it's a market. But what is a market? A market's a place for people to come together to trade things. Uh, historically, it was a place for people to trade livestock and food. We've just used the term for years and years now to trade other things. Um, but what the voluntary carbon market is not, it is not renewable energy, it is not hydrogen, it is not equities, it is not commodities, it is its own unique thing. And it is young, and it is relatively immature in that way, and it needs to find its place, but I know that we can all help it get there. And so one of the ways we believe we can do that is by putting our name behind certain companies, many companies if we can, um, to support the market. Uh, so, what could the market do, right? So what, what do markets do in general? So it can help deploy proven technologies at scale. Uh, it can help innovation and in bringing new technologies uh, to us. Um, it brings integrity to those technologies uh, through the scale and volume of trading in those markets. Um, it can offer an implicit price on carbon, maybe even explicit price on carbon. Maybe we can get there. I think we can. Um, and it can allow companies and individuals to access these things simply and efficiently without long, complex bilateral contracting. That's what markets need to get to. That's what the market needs to get to. I can tell you, and Christophe and Jan will know, it took us a solid eight months uh, to get our contract signed. Um, it was a long process, but it was actually a relatively fun process when I look back on it, which I think things are when they're arduous. You look back on them and you sort of recognize what it took you to get there and the work that went into it, but it was truly something that we uh, enjoyed getting to. But what I think is important about the voluntary carbon market 
it is still a very disaggregated market. You can go to Climeworks website and buy carbon dioxide removals. You can go to Puro and buy carbon dioxide removals and nature-based things. You can go to Patch. You can go directly to brokers. You can go directly to project developers. It's still this very disaggregated sort of messy spider web of ways to access carbon removal. Um, but the other thing that the VCM is, is it's us. It's everyone in this room and everyone on the phone. It's the scientists and the technologists, and it's the engineers, and it's the buyers, and it's the project developers. It's us. We are the ones developing this market right now. The people on the stage who I've had the pleasure of getting to listen to all day today um, and said many, many important and technical things about the market. I'm a more philosophical person, so I think about this stuff in a very philosophical way, and that's how I'm going to talk about it. Um, how, by the way, as a philosophical person, I survived uh, in a bank for 20 years is anyone's guess, but, um, but here I am. So I wanted to talk a little bit, it's sort of an ask, and I wrote these down while I was listening to everyone today, of how I, this is how I asked my team to interact with these markets and how I asked them to interact with project developers and anyone we talk to who supports the work that we do in this space. And I'd ask you to do the same if you can. Um, so the first one is be solution oriented. The problems are abundant, I know that. They're, very, they're out there and they're super easy to see. If anybody rides motorcycles or flies airplanes, there is one rule that you always learn very early on. You don't look at the obstacle. If you look at the obstacle, you will hit the obstacle. Try to look past the obstacles. Try to see solutions and be solution oriented. When I was a kid, my first job in high school was working at a pizzeria. Um, I was a line cook in the back. I guess they didn't want me out front making pizzas, but um, one day, I was back there, it was a Friday, I'll never forget, it was next to a movie theater, super, super busy night. Um, I was making, I don't remember what, um, but I went to get some sauce out of the pot of sauce that had been boiling for the entire day, as sauce is supposed to be. And um, I smelled like a burning smell. And if anybody knows anything about Italian cooking, if you burn the sauce, you've ruined the day. And I had burned the sauce. And so I went out front to Rick, the owner, and I said, Rick, I burned the sauce. And Rick said, the first step is identifying the problem. And I immediately realized that my reaction to this problem was the wrong reaction. The reaction was, should have been to find a solution, not to just identify the problem. And so we will all identify problems along the way, but be solution-oriented. Find a solution. Try to look past the obstacles. Um, and I think that will help a lot in moving this market forward. Uh, the second is be decisive and act with urgency. Um, and when you do make decisions, be bold about them and talk about them and be boisterous and tell the world you did them and don't be modest. It's so important that when we do these things in this space that we talk about them and we tell people why we do them and that it matters to us and that, you know, I think one of the issues I've seen with this space is right now the people who are loudest are project developers and, and verifiers and rating agencies and that's good. But it is ultimately or ultimately could be viewed as self-serving. Buyers need to step into the space and into the light and say, listen, this matters to us. This is important to us. We believe these technologies are ready to scale and ready to be purchased at scale. We are ready, and I think that goes a long way. So be bold, but don't take decisiveness and urgency as acting with haste, right? So think long and hard about what it is that your corporation, your business, your whatever needs and solve for that. Um, and so something I learned a long time ago is if you have 10 seconds to make a decision, think for nine. And so I apply that to this space. We have to act with urgency, but we need to do it uh, in a very thoughtful way. Um, the next is be an educator, not an elitist. It is so easy in this space to feel like you know a lot. It is a barbell. Some people know nothing, and some people know everything. And when you're on the everything side, do everything you can to bring people across that traverse and help them understand what this space is and why it's important. Um, and talk to everyone, but I'll double down on that. Get into schools and talk to kids about this stuff. We are talking about solving a problem for the next 100 plus years. We are not going to solve this problem. They're gonna solve this problem. So if you have the ability to and you're comfortable doing it, find ways to get into your local community and get in front of kids and talk to them about what climate change is, what the technologies to solve it are, um, and how they can be a part of it. Because that to me is so important that we bring them along on this journey. Um, be humble. Learn, 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 learn. 
You might think you know it all, you don't know it all. I guarantee you anyone who's been on this journey for more than a few years has learned so much along the way. They thought they knew it all at the beginning. They've learned so much now, now they think they know it all. But learn. If you don't understand organic, organic chemistry, learn about it. That's what this entire space is all about. Go re-access that part of your brain from high school and call your chemistry teacher and say, you were right, I did need this. <laughs> I'm so sorry I thought I didn't. Um, if you don't understand investing and you think that's a problem in this market, go understand investing. Understand how capital gets deployed. Understand how investors make decisions. Understand how you de-risk things. Understand it. Learn, 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 learn. So important. Um, be collaborative. You're not, we're not going to get this done on our own. Uh, JP Morgan doesn't, so we work with everyone out there. We work with Carbon Direct. We've joined Frontier. We've used B0. We use Silvera. Um, we don't believe that we're going to make any decision on our own. Collective action is how we will solve climate change. Um, be resilient. We talk a lot about the positives and the direction of travel that we're heading in, and it, all the graphs show that we're, you're doing great. Um, there will be setbacks along the way. Be resilient. Um, you know, be ready to deal with those things. Be ready to push through. Be ready to find the solutions and move through them. And then I would ask you to be flexible. Um, there's a quote by George Bernard Shaw that goes something to the effect of, those who cannot change their mind cannot change the world. And so again, back to that learning and educating yourself piece, constantly learn about this space and change your mind. It's okay to be wrong. It's okay to do it differently um, as long as you feel like you're on the right course. And lastly, be persistent. And so I want to finish with a little bit of a story um, uh, that goes something like this. So uh, about 16 years ago, uh, a young analyst at J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, sitting in a cubicle at 10 p.m. at 345 Park Avenue on the 11th floor, clicked send on an email to Jamie Dimon. And the email said something to the effect of, hey, Jamie, you don't know me. I'm an analyst here. I recently read an article that said that we were recycling ceiling tiles and carpet when we were renovating one of our branches. And I think that's pretty cool. I bet we do a lot of stuff around sustainability. We should talk about it more. I would like to establish some green teams, random, just made sense, it rhymes, right? Some green teams around the bank to be more vocal about this stuff. I went home, questioned a lot of my life choices in sending the CEO an email on like my third week uh, on the job. By the way, it's me, in case you guys were wondering who the analyst was. <laughs> um, and uh, I came in at 6 a.m. the next day and I had an email from Jamie. And the email said, great idea, love it. Here's a name for someone in corporate responsibility. You should talk to them about this. About the same time, Jan and Christoph were sitting at ETH Zurich talking about carbon capture, uh, a DAC, and you know, trying to build this incredible machine that we're all sitting here celebrating today. Um, over a 16-year period, they developed Climeworks. And over a 16-year period, I developed into the head of operational sustainability at JP Morgan. And we got together about a year plus ago, Jan and I met at 383 Madison, and we talked a little bit about how we could work together. Then I came to this summit in June of last year, and I sat where you all are, and I listened to everyone speak, and I thought, how can I be a part of this? How do I do more? How can I use my platform and my voice and, and the, the name of JP Morgan to do more? And um, the next day, they invited me to their office, and I sat down with um, a few of the uh, Burks and Barbara and Christoph, and we chatted a bit about it. And Christoph challenged me, and he said, listen, I know you want to do a lot with us. Let's do something. Let's just start with an offtake agreement. Let's just start somewhere. And that kicked off the eight-month process of the contract that we signed. Um, the how we did it and how we got JP Morgan there is complicated. Um, as you can imagine, it wasn't an easy journey. Um, there was a lot of initial resistance to it, but initially, like I said, if you bring people along on the journey and help them understand what you're trying to do, you can get there. And so I'm happy at any point today or in the future to talk about how we did that, how we built the business case internally, how we built a portfolio of solutions that ultimately nets to $250 a ton so that we could get this through the conversation within our firm, um, how we supported multiple technologies, um, how we're trying to support the market. I'm happy to talk about that stuff. Um, but I have one last ask of you as my time is running out here. 
um, beat us. Beat us. Do a bigger contract. Push the bar. We move the bar from here to here, move it to there. Somebody is out there who is in the audience today who will be here next year. You guys can do it. I'm looking forward to it. Challenge us, challenge yourself, um, and thank you for the time today. Good luck. Thank you so much, Ryan. That was great. I loved your story uh, about Jamie Dimon. Um, okay, it's time now for a break. Uh, when we come back in about 30 minutes, we are going to deep dive on policy frameworks. We're going to look at carbon removal beyond the US and Europe, and we're also going to talk about environmental justice. Hello, hello, welcome back. Congratulations. We're almost there. I know we have covered a lot of ground, and I know that you're excited to keep continuing these conversations that we're having during the networking. But don't worry, this is our last session, but it's a goodie, I promise. Um, we're probably going to go in quite hard at the start because we're going to now focus on policy frameworks. Now, this is incredibly important, and our first session is going to be a panel discussion that's really looking at that uh, journey for policy frameworks when it comes to voluntary carbon markets. So without further ado, I would like to hand over to your host for this first session, Naeem Merchant, who is from Carbon Removal Canada, but you may recognize his dulcet tones from the Carbon Curve podcast as well. Naeem, the stage is yours, thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks so much for being here. My name is Naeem Merchant. Uh, I'm the Executive Director of Carbon Removal Canada, and I'm excited to be moderating this panel on setting up the right policy framework for scaling up CDR. Um, and that's because I believe that designing, you know, well-designed policies are absolutely critical uh, to growing the CDR industry in a rapid and responsible way. Uh, now, I'm a little biased. Uh, I'm starting a, a carbon removal policy initiative called Carbon Removal Canada. So think Carbon 180, but within the Canadian ecosystem. Uh, but I'm really excited to get a chance today to learn from some of the foremost experts on carbon removal policy in the world. And so I'd like to introduce them uh, and have them come up on stage. It's uh, Noah Deich from the Office of Fossil Energy and Carbon Management at the US Department of Energy, Gianna Amador, Executive Director of the Carbon Removal Alliance, Helen Brave, VP of Climate Policy at Puro, and Eva Tame from uh, Climate Principles. Thank you all for, for joining us today. All right, okay, so let's start with the US policy landscape um, with, with you, Noah. Um, can you give us you know, a high-level summary of what your office at the Department of Energy uh, does and maybe some of the recent carbon removal policy wins that we've seen in the US lately? Yeah, happy to. And first, congrats to the, the Climeworks team. Amazing turnout. Great to see how much you, you've grown over the past uh, few years. And I, I think where I'll start is the US has comprehensive and ambitious climate policy for the first time ever, which is amazing. What's even more amazing is that carbon management, and specifically direct air capture, is a key component of that. Small, but absolutely significant, and I think relatively incredibly important. And what that means is that the US is now doing the three things that the direct air capture and the broader carbon removal field needs today, which is one, support innovation from science to tech to pilot to demonstration to actual commercial early of a kind projects, mm -hmm. supporting incentives, both through tax credits and soon a purchasing program. And then three, figuring out the standards, the measurement, the verification, everything that we're gonna need to scale this into the future in, in carbon markets. And so it's a really exciting time in the US because we're working on all three of those elements and recognize that we need to not just pioneer that in the US, but figure out how to help other governments around the world work on all three of those buckets, because we need this to be global to succeed, and we need all three of those pillars if we're actually gonna make the progress we need and hit some of the 2030 interim targets that are gonna get us to that 2050 goal of, of net zero and beyond that we need. And it's great to hear that there's uh, a focus on helping other countries um, kind of achieve some of the same 
policy wins or, or different policy wins that are supportive of carbon removal around the world. But more generally, you know, what makes public sector support for some of these kind of demonstration projects around direct air capture and other carbon removal methods, what makes that so important? So what makes it so important is that these projects are expensive today compared to voluntary markets. And there's a whole bunch of things that governments need to do, both to make those projects less expensive and make them more investable. And so I think that's where the combination of subsidies, grants, and broader certainty about the framework that the US policy world provides now is essential. Because without that, we have seen a lack of projects to date. And the amount of interest that we're seeing across the US carbon management ecosystem is really night and day compared to two years ago when the policy framework was much less evolved on those dimensions. And, and maybe to shift over to Gianna um, in kind of thinking about the US policy context a little bit, can you give us some background on the Carbon Removal Alliance as a kind of new entrance to the CDR policy space? Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate the opportunity. So the Carbon Removal Alliance is a new organization. Our goal is to unite the carbon removal private sector in um, and in particular, the innovators who are building the new carbon removal industry. Um, so our goal is to sort of align interests across this very diverse field and to champion high quality carbon removal. And for us, that means carbon removal that is additional, verifiable, net negative, permanent, and also minimizes harms to communities while also maximizing co-benefits for the communities where these projects are located. So I really see our real value in sort of two places. I think one, servicing the challenges that entrepreneurs are facing when they're trying to commercialize these technologies and feeding that directly into US federal policy. And then I think two, really harnessing the power that the private sector has to be able to advocate for the development of this field to hopefully, to be able to move faster um, and to move better to support these technologies is coming to scale. Yeah. yeah, and on that point around the need to move faster, you know, and, and, and going back to some of the kind of policy achievements that, that Noah was talking about earlier, how should we be thinking about or designing policies going forward, building off of the successes that we've seen so far? Yeah, um, I think the first thing we can do is, is do more. Um, I think we are really, I'm really impressed and thankful for the amount of policy progress that we've had so far, particularly in the United States, and I think we're already starting to see those investments pay dividends, but ultimately in the scale of technology development, the amounts of funding that we've invested so far are relatively small, and so I think we need to um, grow the pie for carbon removal and of course for climate technologies more generally. I would say, too, a lot of the policy incentives that we see today in the US are very focused on direct air capture. And so I think there's an opportunity to expand carbon removal policies to focus on a full portfolio of permanent carbon removal technologies from enhanced rock weathering to ocean-based approaches um, to bikers' approaches. And I think in order to do that at the Carbon Removal Alliance, I think we believe that technology-neutral policy that's really principles approach, um, or really principles-based, is an approach that um, will allow us to really drive innovation across the whole technology portfolio and allow us to solve for the outcomes that we want instead of sort of predetermining what technologies are going to be winners. And I think that's really important because even five years ago, I think we couldn't have imagined the types of companies that um, are in the carbon removal space today. So we want to make sure that policy is really resilient and can grow with the field as opposed to being kind of cornered by it. Yeah, and so kind of acknowledging that we need this technology neutral approach, but recognizing that there are policy specific um, approaches to supporting these different methods, but yeah. making sure we're looking at the whole field. That makes a lot of sense. And now, and, and in re regards to kind of thinking about how different carbon removal methods face different challenges, one thing that comes to mind for me is measurement reporting and verification, MRV. How do we ensure that we are implementing high quality MRV in the kind of policy framework that you just described? Yeah, there, there's two things that I think about. One, I think we need markets, both public and private sector, to demand high quality MRV. Um, I think that really is what ultimately is going to drive investments in this space. And I think, two, we need science to be able to provide the information to govern 
both this, you know, the standards, the protocols, and the technologies in which we're actually using to implement monitoring, reporting, and verification in a market. I think there's a role for the government to play in setting those standards that allow us to compare carbon removal technologies across these different sectors, despite their differences, and to set a standard of what high quality carbon removal looks like in a way that I think will have ripple effects in both voluntary and compliance markets. And I think the last thing I would add is that I think there's a role for government um, to play in investing in hard technology and collaboration to help solve some of the MRV challenges, particularly around things that are a little bit tough, like open systems. And we've seen the Department of Energy with the things like their MRV lab call, um, starting to make some of those initial investments. That's really, that's great. And, and so before we kind of shift gears to thinking about the kind of European context, uh, Noah, I've got to ask, you know, how do we keep the policy momentum going in the United States? Uh, what, does that, what does that look like? So I think two things. First, build projects. Still too conceptual today. I love the models in the back, but we need actual projects at that scale yeah. to show the world what those projects look like. The second is to make sure that those projects don't just work from a technical or a business model standpoint, but engage communities and provide robust environmental protection so that people want carbon removal in their community and that's a big challenge, not just in the carbon management space, but across all of the infrastructure build out that we're going to need for a net zero future. It's tough to build stuff. And so we need to change that broader headwind. And when it comes to these projects, make sure that the communities, the workforces, the broader environment in that local region sees these projects as a boon for them not just for a global climate challenge that we're trying to solve. Right. Yeah, and that community engagement piece is, is really, really important, and just generally kind of that public acceptance. Um, and we'll, we'll get to that uh, a bit later on. Um, so I'm excited to dig into that um, in a few minutes. But let's, let's shift over to Europe. Um, Helen, can you give us you know, a broad overview of the major policy efforts that are underway and you know, what is needed to enable investment in durable carbon removal like direct air capture. Yeah, and first of all, thank you. Thank you to Climeworks and for bringing us together here as a community once a year, but also for what you do throughout the year and your latest publication calling for the clear distinction of emission reductions versus emissions removals targets is really called for and it should be restated that this is not about preserving business as usual. So thank you very much, Climeworks. If I may, I'm just a short moment on, on Puro Earth and what we do. We have a carbon crediting program. Um, we've certified durable carbon removal since 2019. We now have around 40 suppliers. And through the Puro standard, we create science-based robust methodologies for issuing carbon removal credits, what we call corks. We have an independent advisory body which approves all these methodologies, and all projects are independently verified. We also run the registry, which publishes all the issuances and retirements. This builds transparency in carbon markets. And progressive players such as Microsoft, Boston Consulting Group, JP Morgan, Shopify, Zurich Insurance, Klarna, and also demand aggregators such as NextGen and uh, Frontier have purchased or pre-purchased corks. So we see that high quality certification is essential. Buyers need to know what they're buying and suppliers need to be able to build trust. And if I may, building on what Noah was saying, it sounds like we've written the same notes, just first of all, four points on what we need, four pillars you need for an investable policy framework. First of all, you need national plans with this clear separate, the targets for removals and reductions. We also need robust certification and building on what the Integrity Council for the Voluntary Carbon Market has stated. It needs to have effective governance, it needs to have robust quantification, and it needs to make sure it has environmental and social safeguards. The third pillar is all around policy measures, and we can unpack that a bit more, but we need to have the business case for investment, and that can take a range of measures. We've heard about procurement, we've heard about tax credits, low-cost loans, innovation funding, but also looking at compliance markets, there will often be more than one policy measure to make that business case. And then finally, the fourth pillar, which probably overlaps with the other three, but is really important to emphasize, is the use case. We need clear clarity on how these corks, these carbon removal credits, can be used. 
and we welcome more clarity from the Voluntary Carbon Markets Integrity Initiative, as well as the Science-Based Targets Initiative, and from policymakers on the use case for durable carbon removal. We're certifying, as January mentioned, you know, enhanced rock weathering, bioenergy carbon capture, direct air carbon capture and storage, biochar, this range of durable carbon removals. Thanks. Great. And, and Eva, I, I'd love to get into maybe some specific examples um, around the EU policy frameworks. Uh, let's start with the EU carbon removal certification framework. What is it and what is it aiming to do and how do we kind of incorporate removals into that entire process? Thank you, and uh, it's great to be here today. Um, so getting into a specific policy framework now, uh, the carbon removal certification framework uh, was proposed uh, last November, and uh, we are discussing it here in the context of voluntary markets because one of its possible use cases is a voluntary market. And uh, it's essentially a quantification tool, if we put it very broadly, and um, it fills a specific gap that we have in Europe in climate policy because we just don't yet have a way of quantifying quality carbon removals in Europe at the moment. And the current climate targets don't include those removals. So to be able to do that in the future, we need to be able to start the, the, the quantification. So uh, this specific piece of legislation, which is still a proposal, so it's going to be discussed now over the next year and hopefully we'll get it adopted in the first quarter of 2024, divides removals into three types. We have permanent carbon removal, we have carbon farming, and we have carbon uh, storage in products. And the way this system is supposed to be governed is uh, where it's, it's centrally kind of managed by the commission that will establish the methodologies. So it means that it will not uh, have any rubber stamping of existing methodologies, methodologies that exist in the voluntary markets, but instead it will definitely learn from what is already out there, but then build specific EU methodologies for, for carbon removal. And it will rely in its work also in the carbon removal expert group, where I'm, I'm one of the experts uh, who will then advise the commission on, on the methodologies to, to adopt. And oftentimes there are questions, okay, the proposal is out, um, what's wrong in there? Like what, what could be changed? And the usual two aspects that come up uh, tend to be the definitions, the fact that removals there are defined partly also as emission reductions when it comes to carbon, uh, carbon farming. And in this case, I think many stakeholders are pushing for clarity and, and using the standard IPCC definitions. The second part is use. Helen mentioned we need this clarity, how voluntary market credits actually could be used. Um, in this case, it's even more complex because some of these activities are supposed to contribute to EU's climate targets, so some would go beyond. So we need more clarity on that. But I think the biggest question is what comes next? Um, because it's, it's clear for now that uh, uh, this aims for use cases like the voluntary market, but Post-2030, it's becoming quite obvious removals will be parts of the EU climate targets more broadly, broadly, also novel ones, and parts of the compliance markets. And this is kind of an intermediary step between like now and then, and we need a better understanding how that will change over time. Yeah. But it sounds like an absolutely essential component to successfully building carbon removal in a way that meets our kind of scale targets as well as doing so in this kind of responsible way. So it could have a lot of impact, but it sounds like there's some current areas where it, it's maybe falling a little bit short and, and could, could use some, some additional support. Is that right? Yeah, and I think one aspect that is relevant specifically for this audience where we don't have clarity is we need to make sure that where, however the certificates are going to be used, uh, that only permanent carbon removal will be used to balance fossil emissions. And currently, that kind of clarity doesn't exist in this piece of proposal. It also doesn't ex exist in other pieces of legislation that have been proposed where we were hinted in the past that those will solve it, but we really yet don't have the solution. So we, and we need that solution. 
Okay, so some, some real work to be done on, on what is otherwise a, a very, very exciting initiative that the EU is spearheading. Um, Helen, are there any other policy initiatives in Europe that we should really be focused on? Um, yeah, it's difficult to choose, actually. It's a super exciting time, and we just heard on the previous panel about the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, which is also super exciting. But I think the setting of EU's 2040 climate target is a key moment, and there, we, as a community, we can really carve out the space for what Europe calls uh, industrial carbon removal, and a little pitch here, the open public consultation is open until the 24th of June. I'm also pretty excited about the EU Green Claims Directive. Again, that sort of shining the light on carbon credits and the different types of carbon credits. It might be fun to do some strengthening under that uh, proposal, which is being politically negotiated. And I think also for, for direct air capture into geological storage, the EU's Net Zero Industry Act, which has CCS, hopefully, as a key industry, is a, a big backbone for the direct air capture community. I think, you know, um, that's just some examples. There'll be more um, that we can talk about. But what we need to focus on is looking at that business case and how all these policies fit together. Um, and we look forward to, to that discussion. And then looking outside of the European Union, really exciting sort of emerging discussion in Norway. There they're looking at you know, the carbon tax, which is around 200 euros per tonne, and could, you know, bioenergy carbon capture and storage and direct air cap cap capture and storage feature under there as a sort of reverse carbon tax. And we know that the UK government will be issuing um, a response to their emissions trading system consultation the business models and more information on certification. It's going back to the pillars we've been talking about, all these governments are moving forward. It's a, it's a super exciting time. No, it, it absolutely is a, a really exciting time. And, and one kind of other initiative that, that kind of comes to mind for me, um, you know, is, is Article 6. And I was hoping, Eva, you could talk us through a little bit about, you know, what is Article 6? Why is it important for carbon removal? Uh, and how can, how can stakeholders in the audience and, uh, and those who are listening kind of get involved in helping shape some of these frameworks around carbon removal? Yeah, happy to. So Article 6 is Article 6 of the Paris Agreement, just putting that out there to make it clear. And uh, within this article, we have, let's say, two mechanisms for carbon markets under the Paris Agreement. And the end goal of this article is not just to help countries achieve climate targets if they choose to use markets for it, and they can, that's a voluntary thing, they can you choose to use it or not. It's actually uh, meant to go beyond it, to increase the ambition of countries under the Paris Agreement. And uh, so there are two mechanisms, and sadly we don't have names for them, so we have the 6.2 and 6.4, so bear with me. I would say 6.2 is a f more flexible system, um, if you want to keep it in your mind with some kind of a uh, word, where countries can collaborate in different ways. They can link their emissions trading system, they can uh, trade uh, carbon credits from carbon crediting systems. Um, there are multiple ways they can do it bilaterally, multilaterally, it's, it's quite flexible. And it's already operational today. Uh, Switzerland, for example, is one of the countries who have been trailblazing in the space. And um, yeah, a lot of, of progress and interesting things happening there. And then the second mechanism is an Article 6.4 mechanism, which is a centralized carbon crediting system that will be built similar to those who have followed carbon markets before when we had Kyoto Protocol, we had clean development mechanism um, this is not like clean development me mechanism exactly, it's more like the other tool we had back then, which is the joint implementation. But basically, it's a centralized system that will then establish specific methodologies, including for carbon removal, that can be used under the system. But it's still being built, so we're not there yet. In the, in the governance system, they have a supervisory body for Article 6.4 mechanism that is currently preparing this general framework for how removals would be included under that me mechanism under the price agreement. So in your mind, you can think like we have the EU having the, the carbon removal certification mechanism, which is kind of a framework under which we'll have methodologies. And in, under Article 6.4, we also have this general framework being built right now, and then later on we'll have methodologies. But the thing is that this is currently not operational. 
Um, and I think what I, because recently there have been a lot of questions around Article 6.4 because of uh, some surprising documents or surprising content in documents that were published before the previous meeting uh, that were a bit biased on engineered removals. Um, what I wanted to say today is to kind of highlight that between these two mechanisms, it is quite obvious countries will lean towards using Article 6.2. This will be, I think, the bigger mechanism. It's easier to use. Uh, it's going to be cheaper to use. It's already operational. It's, it's kind of a no-brainer in this sense. And also, it's just it hasn't yet been used for, for removals. And voluntary market is going to feed into uh, also Article 6.4 to be operational, because some of the standards are already collaborating with the governments to make it happen. Now, the 6.4 is not yet happening. It will take, I think, quite some time to get it up and working. It's going to be more expensive to use, but it is so important to get it right, because if we establish systems under the Paris Agreement, uh, and we've, like, we've been through the same system under Kyoto Protocol, this is based on the consensus of close to 200 countries. So if, um, if we get this framework on removals wrong for some reason, then there is no way of really going back and changing it, because this is a de decision that has been adopted, and everything else will be built um, upon it. So if you think back, we had some issues with the clean development mechanism under Kyoto Protocol. And well, we couldn't really fix it. And now we are kind of starting from scratch and then bringing in some like, better things from the CDM because we couldn't fix it. So we need to get it right. And that's why removals community will need to keep uh, paying attention to it. And also, this is going to be the global you know, mechanism where we have international methodologies for different carbon removal methods. We, we need to make sure it's, it's of high quality, it works well, that it's, it's going to be the gold standard. Yeah. So really important we get this right. And the risk is, is that we're not kind of paying enough attention to how this is how this is evolving, but there's a huge opportunity here for the, the, the carbon removal sector to, to, to help kind of shape what this looks like um, in a way that is supportive for, for carbon removal. Now, th thank you so much for breaking those. These, some of these, these systems and, and these mechanisms are pretty complex, so thank you for breaking it down for us in a way that is uh, a little more understandable for folks. But I'd like to kind of pivot back to something that I think is relevant uh, regardless of geography um, and you know, it looks different in every country, I think, but uh, it's a challenge that we're all going to face in, in, in those of us who are thinking about adopting kind of uh, policies that are supportive of carbon removal. Um, so we can get all the policy wins we want, but I, my view is, is that they're not going to get very far if we don't build public acceptance for carbon removal more broadly. And so I'm, I'm curious to know, what can we do to you know, build that license to operate uh, for carbon removal projects? And how can we effectively respond to some of the concerns that are going to come up from policymakers, from different communities around carbon removal? I think that's going to be a really important thing that we're doing as we are trying to kind of shape supportive policies around, around CDR. And I'd love, I'd love to get everyone's take on this, and maybe starting with you, Gianna, around what, what your thoughts around this are. Yeah, I think it's a, a really important question, especially for the inflection point that the field's at. For me, you know, we've talked a lot about demonstration projects today sort of across the panels, and I think that is really sort of coming to light as we think about really this is the public's in, in many ways first like real touch point with carbon removal, and we've sort of reached a point in a field in which not all carbon removal is good carbon removal. So we have this really exciting opportunity to define what does high quality carbon removal look like? What do we want the future of carbon removal to look like? And how do we use some of these near term demonstration projects to highlight what that potential future could look like? And I think we need to tell that story in a lot of different ways. I think we need to tell the innovation story of where is the field now? What are our shortcomings? Where do we want to improve? And what does that trajectory look like? And be comfortable with the, the risk of, of failure. I think we need to tell another story about community benefits and environmental safeguards and community autonomy and decision making. I think we need to, to tell another story around monitoring, reporting, and verification and, and proving that these solutions are really credible as part of our climate commitment. Um, and I think the last story we need to tell is about the potential economic and jobs benefits that really come from these projects and actually begin to substantiate what that looks like 
on the ground for real people. So I think there's an exciting storytelling opportunity here that will build the public education and knowledge and comfort with these solutions if we do it right. Um, and we speak to sort of these different values across the sort of entire carbon removal or sort of more public space. Yeah, yeah and that makes me think about you know, Noah's comment earlier about the need to see projects actually, you know, get deployed. Um, Noah, how do you think about this, this challenge around public acceptance and license to operate? So I think, actually, the Climeworks example is a great one. If you had said you could put direct air capture at a geothermal power plant and sequester it, okay, if you can show that, it completely changes the game. And we've seen that happen. You have to walk the walk. Right. And so what I worry about is the public acceptance conversation. If we just go and talk about long term, Article 6, all that stuff is very important, but you never make progress on the public acceptance part until you build projects. And so what we need to do is pull the policy to the, the here and now, which is how do we fund demonstration projects around the world? And only by doing that will policymakers have the actual physical projects to say, this is what it is, here's how a community benefits, here's how we can protect communities from any unintended consequences. And only by making it real can we actually get to the place where we get to scale. And so I think that's the key challenge, is how do we get the world to build projects? And right now I see that happening in the US, but at a significant scale, it's not happening in the rest of the world nearly as fast as it needs to. Right. Yeah, and it seems like we have you know, a lot of catching up to do um, uh, you know, around that, but we can also design policies that support you know, the, the responsible deployment of, of carbon removal around the world and then showcase what that looks like in a way that is useful to, to policymakers regardless of, of where they are. Um, Helen, what would you add around you know, kind of thinking about this, maybe from a European context, on, on public acceptance issues and, and license to operate for carbon removal writ large. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to repeat all the good points that have been made by um, Gianna and Noah because that is, is really important. And I still think this 2040 discussion, the climate target in the EU, will, will be a, a license to operate moment. But I think maybe I reflect more on what can we do as a community and as, as carbon removers. I think in this discussion around the policies that we need, is we need to go to policymakers with, with evidence-based requests, but also with, with an open mindset. We're all learning. We've heard that today. Um, we all need to work towards you know, viable policy solutions. And they'll look very different depending on which jurisdiction we're operating in. And, that, and that's fine. So that would be my request from a kind of policy uh, person perspective. Thank you. And so getting back to the here and now of, of policy, Eva, anything to add on, on this issue? Yeah, it's always difficult to be the fourth one to comment on something, <laughs> but uh, lots of, of good things have been said. But I think uh, one aspect uh, that, in my view, is useful and, and I keep bringing it up every now and then in these conversations is uh, if we take a step back and don't think within the bubble of, of the carbon removals community, the reality is that we still need to do so, so much ca capacity building among policymakers because there are still those among them with whom the conversation is not about uh, how we do carbon removal, it's still about why we're doing it. We think it's self-evident, there are net zero targets and all of it, but it's not as, as straightforward. So first of all, we'll need to get all of them on board with like it's actually needed, and then demonstration helps a lot in building that credibility, and then I mean, looking at the policy side of things, we really need to get them to adopt specific carbon removal targets. It would be very helpful if we would have more clarity also on carbon removal targets in the, in the, um, uh, in the documents that countries submit under the Paris Agreement. It's so-called nationally determined contributions. Currently, they don't really need to elaborate there too much on removals. It would be helpful to have a lot more clarity there on removals and hopefully also on, on, on more durable removals because once that has been put in place, there's also more appetite to going into how we're going to make it happen. Great. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you so much. And thank you for indulging me on the question on public acceptance. As I said before, I think 
Policy is really important, but if we don't find a way to tell this story and get this narrative out around the benefits of carbon removal and having communities actually want to see these projects uh, uh, built, um, you know, they won't go very far. And so I think it's important as those of us who think about policy to also be thinking about uh, this, this public acceptance piece and community engagement. Um, we have a few more minutes, I think, for uh, some, some questions. So uh, I'll let you take it away. Thank you so much. Well, let maybe if we can start with questions in the room. If you have a question for our panel today, please do raise your hand. We have one question here and then again behind. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, Axel Michaelova, Perspectives, University of Zurich. So, Eve, you said, well, 6.4 is so slow, but um, so countries would probably go into 6.2. The challenge I see with 6.2 is, of course, that if there's a race to the bottom in 6.2 approaches, it might contaminate the compliance markets. So how would you see now the possibility that the community as a whole tries to bring really high quality methodological approaches into 6.4 that they then spill over into 6.2 because otherwise we really run the risk that we'll again destroy the compliance market as we did it under this clean development mechanism. Thanks. Okay, so that's an excellent question, Axel, thank you. I actually see that both mechanisms will end up informing each other because what will happen now in the next years under the 6.2, this more flexible mechanism, I'm sure that there are going to be methodologies used there that will then feed into the work of 6.4 and maybe in some shape or form be adopted there as well. But it's important for the stakeholders to be active to avoid any, any kind of uh, race to the bottom because it is tricky when you have something as flexible as the 6.2 mechanism where we don't have the specific safeguards and it's very um, appealing to go for because it's so much easier to use than the 6.4 mechanism, which is, I mean, even still being uh, built. So I, I think we should just all, yeah, keep paying attention to it and keep feeding into it and Hopefully, we will end up with some great methodologies under 6.4. I think I heard in the last supervisory board meeting it being said that, well, 6.4 mechanism is aiming to do things that have really never been done for removals, even in the voluntary market, that they want to look at all the difficult question and questions and like, kind of lift things to a new level and, and give like, really, really high quality material for, for this market. I mean, if that were to work out, that would be great. And if that would then be taken on as the expected standard also for the 6.2, that would be great. But I am not sure that we will actually end up there. We can just do our best to try. But let's be clear, too. In the list of things that we're worried about for the success of this field, that is not top of mind. I think the, the key thing right now is that we need to go build projects around the world. I might have said that before. <laughs> this does not affect that. <laughs> And what we need to do is figure out how to marshal the support and focus of this community to get governments around the world to put the resources to building projects. And that is not a question of Article 6.2 versus 6.4. Mm -hmm. it, it may be in the future, but right now, that's where we need to keep our, our eye on the ball. Helen, just, what just to jump in on that about timing, you know, we know how long it takes to develop policy measures. We're here in Switzerland, and Switzerland is a trailblazer, as we've heard. When back when they were linking the Swiss emissions trading system with the European Union emissions trading system, it took nearly 10 years. So, you know, is it too soon? Is it too slow? Is it too fast? Is it too cold? We call that a Goldilocks moment. <laughs> we just know that we need to take action now and we need to start these discussions around all the policy options as well as all the demonstration projects that need to happen. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, maybe quickly to react because it's always good to have some more like emotion in the in the panel discussion. It is completely fair to say that we need we really need projects and that's what removal reasoning re needs right now. But then like in the session where we're discussing the policy frameworks, it is very topical to discuss the, the most important international policy framework that we have that's being built and that's under the Article 6 of the Paris Agreement. So I guess we'll need to go at everything. Those who build projects are building projects, policy experts are working on the policy tools, and we just need to make it happen. 
I think a wise woman once said, we need more, and yes, absolutely. Yeah. We need more across all of it. What I worry about is that we are skating not to where the puck is going, but where the puck is going after that, and that there's nobody where the puck is going. And so it never gets there unless we actually advance the projects. And so I think figuring out how to shift the conversation to not be only on the Article 6 front and to know that that's a decade-long process and we need people working on it, but that we also need a lot of people working on a whole bunch of other things is the really challenging part and shifting the conversation so what we are doing now is not sufficient. It's necessary, but we need to understand that we need to do more. And I think that's, that's a real key. I love a good hockey reference. Like, <laughs> exactly. No, 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 please. Thank you very much for, indeed. Uh, our next question. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the panel. Uh, brilliant. I wish we had all day to talk about policy. Um, uh, my question was back to the public acceptance point and something that we're experimenting with. And by the way, I'm Rob Niven with Carbon Cure. We mineralize CO2 in concrete. Um, is is have, have you uh, have you thought and considered like direct investment uh, into local communities from the proceeds of these CDR projects, and have that have that investment co-developed with communities so that's most impactful, and, and it you know really putting your money where your mouth is and or where your feet is are to drive these projects and drive more public acceptance. Yeah, I can answer from the U.S. perspective and specifically at DOE we are requiring everyone that applies for our funding to have a community benefit plan in place. And that community benefit plan talks about workforce, it talks about economic impacts. It's a multifaceted uh, component of our application. And that's new for DOE. And so one of the things that we are trying not to do is over-prescribe that and say that every community needs to have a checklist because community engagement is not a checklist, unfortunately. And so I think the key for us is to enable those conversations to happen between project developers and the local community. And that sounds like a great idea, but we need to hear from the communities what they want and what the type of direct investment that they need most actually is. And so it's difficult for us to prescribe a specific set of investments simply because the needs are so heterogeneous. But yes, that, that is where we want to go and we want to encourage as much of that reinvestment as, as we can. What about from a European perspective? From a European perspective? Well, we're not, we're not project developers, we're a carbon crediting program, but what we hear is it's very important about that license to operate, but also with the local community. And without doing that, you can't progress projects. So first, it's fundamental importance, but that's for our suppliers to decide how they do it. It sounds we've got some great examples from the audience. So thank you for sharing. I've got a couple of questions here um, from our audience online. Um, I'm not quite sure where to start. Maybe, um, Noah, with you. Is the DOE involved in some ways in developing similar policy frameworks in other parts of the world? No. <laughs> we're, 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 and I guess from that answer, there's the, no plan for that. The US DOE. <laughs> no, I, I, so I would say where we engage is through um, primarily multilateral forums like the Mission Innovation Platform. The CDR Launchpad is a great place where we can exchange policy ideas, but the bulk of our work is fundamentally US-focused and US-based. And so we collaborate with our, our State Department and, and really try to make sure that we can provide that technical assistance to others, but are not sort of formally engaged in creating policy elsewhere. Okay, um, there's a lot of questions about how the voluntary market compares with other markets, for example, the compliance markets. How do you see long-term evolution of each of these markets? How do they compare in, in, in your vision? Yeah. Um, I can Please, maybe have, it, have a start at this. Um, so for a while, there was, I think, this vision that eventually the voluntary markets will kind of integrate into compliance markets, and, and that's going to be just the karma markets. But given that, in reality, we don't have all jurisdictions in the world that have a compliance market, so it's an obvious situation that we will always have voluntary markets that do play a role. And uh, as they are, this very nimble and flexible space for, and also a testing ground for, for new things, and we, the innovation will keep happening, right? There are always going to be new solutions that are not part of compliance markets. So for that, voluntary market will 
keep having a role, but it, it is very small right now, and even if it grows rapidly, it's going to be very small, I think, always compared to compliance markets, and things, unless something changes very fundamentally. Thank you very much. Are there any questions, last questions in the audience? Yes, we have one here. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. My name is Nick Beglinger. I'm the Clean Tech 21 Foundation. I wanted to ask about public acceptance. Don't you think that a price on emitting carbon would help public acceptance in terms of financing, investing, and capturing it on the other side? So, in other words, I think the general public has a gut feeling that it's cheaper not to emit in the first place than to grab it back out of the air. And doesn't there need to be a link there to put a price on emitting and then to get credibility on capturing it back? Would it help? Yeah. Of course. <laughs> Do we need it? No. And I think we're not going to get it in the US in the near term. And so from where we sit, it's a, we have the, the best available policy framework that we're going to get. And it's pretty good right now. So we're going to make the most of it. Of course, in the future, broader carbon pricing could help, but is it necessary now? No. Yeah. And I think what we've seen with other renewable energy technologies in the United States is that actually building an industry through research and development and demonstration early incentives is that we're able to build an industry that then creates winners, creates people who are employed by this industry, um, and that creates a really powerful political story that actually creates a positive reinforcing cycle, more so than I think a kind of like regulation um, or like compliance market approach first. So they reinforce each other. Helen. And, and this speaks to the, the regional difference that we have. So, you know, in the EU, we have a, a price on, on carbon emissions. And um, what's really exciting, and as a policy person, this is probably one of the most exciting things that can happen is under the revised version of the EU emissions trading system, Article 30, Paragraph 5A, um, has a requirement for the European Commission to look at the role of negative emissions under the compliance markets. We're policy neutral. Uh, in Pure Earth, what we want to do is have a discussion about where will this ultimately fit, fitting with whatever is said around, ultimately, this is about compliance markets. Thank you very much. I hope that answered your question. And I think we've run out of time, so thank you all very much indeed. Please take a seat. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to take um, a slight uh, change of gear, as it were, because we've got a very special video message for you now. And when I say very special, that is not an understatement. She is one of the world's leading climate scientists. Her book, Saving Us, a climate scientist's case for hope and healing in a divided world, has been dubbed as one of the most important books on climate change ever written. Um, I was just refreshing myself with her not so recent appearance on Jimmy Kimmel just the other day in preparation for today. So please put your hands together for this video message from Catherine Hayhoe from the Nature Conservancy. Throughout the day, you've done a deep dive into the challenges and the future of direct air capture. But I want to bring things back now, back to a focus on the big picture. Because as a climate scientist, I know that direct air capture is one key piece of silver buckshot in the fight against climate change. Why do we need silver buckshot? It's because we know that we're conducting an unprecedented experiment with the only home we have. This is a sobering reality that has to anchor our discussions. We know that today the planet is warming faster than any time in human history. We also know that as far back as we can go in the history of this planet, we've never seen this much carbon going into the atmosphere this quickly, not even at the time of the most rapid warming 55 million years ago. The primary reason for this warming is very clear. It's human emissions of heat trapping gases. But where do these gases come from? That's where it gets complicated because they come from all kinds of sources that are woven throughout society and even throughout our daily lives. You get the picture. And that is why when it comes to climate solutions, there is no silver bullet. But the good news is, is there is a lot of silver buckshot and direct air capture is one of those pieces of silver buckshot. So let's look at the categories of climate solutions. What do we truly need to do to tackle this issue at scale? I think of the atmosphere like a swimming pool. And the level of CO2 in the atmosphere is like the level of water in the swimming pool. Back at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, our toes could just touch the ground. 
But that's when we stuck a giant hose into our swimming pool and we've been turning that hose up year by year. We turned it down 7% during the first year of the pandemic, but we turned it right back up again the year after that. And because of that, the water in the pool is rising and not only is it rising, it's rising faster and faster. So what is the first thing we have to do? We have to turn the hose off. But our swimming pool also has a drain. The drain takes carbon out of the atmosphere. We have to make the drain bigger. And then the third thing we have to do is we have to learn how to swim because our toes don't touch the ground anymore. Those are the three categories of actions we need. So what type of solutions fit into turning off the hose? The first one is one that all too often we skip right over. Energy efficiency, also reducing waste, especially food waste, and changing our behavior so we don't need as much energy. That's one way to turn off the hose. We also can turn off the hose by transitioning away from fossil fuels to clean energy, and we need to do that as quickly as possible. We can improve our land use and agricultural practices to turn them from sources of heat trapping gases often into sinks. And then lastly, we do have carbon capture and storage, which basically diverts the hose before it goes into the swimming pool and puts that water or CO2 elsewhere. These are the different categories of ways we can turn off the hose. What about making the drain bigger? Well, a big part of that drain, in fact, the majority of that drain is nature. We have too much carbon in the atmosphere, but putting that carbon back into soil and ecosystems is actually good. So protecting the ecosystems we already have is number one. Restoring degraded ecosystems, number two. Regenerating ecosystems, this is where something like tree planting comes in. It's not at the top of the list. There's a lot to do in addition to that. Climate smart agriculture. For the country of Canada, our biggest potential for natural climate solutions is actually not in forestry, it's in agriculture. When you put together all of these solutions around the world, up to a third of the hose could be taken up by making the drain bigger through nature. But nature is finite. So this is where direct air capture fits in to make that drain just a little bit bigger because we know that every little bit of carbon counts and anything we can do to make that drain bigger will make a difference. But we can't forget adaptation, learning how to swim, because we know that although climate change affects all of us, it doesn't affect us all equally. So to paraphrase John Holdren, we basically have four choices. Turn off the hose, make the drain bigger, learn how to swim, or suffer. There is no silver bullet. We must do as much as we can of each of the first three choices in order to avoid as much suffering as we possibly can. And the science is clear. If we don't turn off the hose, we will not reach our targets. Not just the one and a half degree target, none of them. We have to reduce our emissions as much as possible as soon as possible. But the science is also clear. The more carbon that we take out of the atmosphere, the lower the level of water in the pool. The less adaptation is required, and most importantly, the less suffering there will be. All of these are essential steps to a better future. We need every single piece of silver buckshot we have, and we need to deploy these solutions as fast as we can, as much as we can. Because to quote the IPCC, every bit of warming matters. But there's one more thing we can't lose sight of. And that's the fact that we face multiple crises. We face a climate crisis, a pollution crisis, where one in six deaths around the world occur prematurely as a result of pollution. We face a biodiversity crisis, inequity, injustice, and war. All of these lead to suffering and climate change is, as the US military refers to it, a threat multiplier in that it takes the impacts of all of these other crises and it makes them worse. We don't have time to tackle these crises individually. And so that's why it is absolutely essential that we invest in climate solutions that also, that also what? That also give us cleaner air and cleaner water that also protect us from disasters like storms, wildfires, and floods, 
that also improve and invest in our physical and mental health, that also provide more, not less, affordable energy, that reduce our gender, racial, and socioeconomic inequalities, that create healthy ecosystems and foodscapes, solutions that give us a safer, a better, and a more just world. So when we find solutions that tick multiple boxes, the only question I have is, what are we waiting for? How do we get this giant boulder of climate action, which is already rolling down the hill in the right direction with millions of hands on it, how do we get it going faster? And the answer to that is something that's so simple, we often overlook it. How do humans ever do anything together without communicating about it first? So as you leave, take the information that you have heard here, take the inspirational stories that you've heard, take the challenges that you've heard and share them. Share them with people that you work with. Share them with people who are looking at investing in climate solutions. Share them with researchers who are lending a hand. Share them with business people, engineers. Share them with teachers. Share them with your kids. We need every single person's hand on that giant boulder, pushing it down the hill as fast as we can because I'm convinced that together we truly can build a better future. Well, I hope that was inspiring. I know we have yet another inspiring video message for you a little bit later, but before all of that, um, despite the conversations that we've been having so far and the perspective that very much covers the US and Europe when it comes to carbon dioxide removal, this is a global phenomenon. So let's have a bit more perspective outside of the US and Europe. And please welcome James Mwangi, who is going to speak to us now from Africa Climate Ventures. James, welcome. <laughs> Thank you, uh, and thank you to the Climeworks team for the work you're doing and for bringing together this amazing community. Uh, less thank you for, make, for putting together such an intimidating event, coming at the end of really some of the world's experts in just about everything I'm gonna talk about, and standing between those experts and their drinks and relaxation. Not a great place to be, but I'll, I'll, I'll try and do my best. Um, I want to talk about the CDR industry, the carbon dioxide removal industry, and how we make it a global industry. And I want to start with a basic point from first principles. We got into the mess that Catherine just described with a hose that was feeding in, that was built by the most globally integrated marketplace in the world. Fossil fuels, emitting technologies, we moved resources all over the world to the places where they could be used most quickly to deploy. Right? So we don't have most of the emissions where we get our fossil fuels from, for example. They are, the fossil fuels are burnt elsewhere. It stands to reason that the same efficiencies that got us into this mess now need to be leveraged to get us out. We need to make sure that all of humanity is mobilized around the question of growing that dream. So as the name of my organization suggests, I'm very focused on Africa. And usually, when we talk about Africa, we begin with the idea of Africa as the quintessential climate victim. Didn't do much to put that water in the pool, struggling to swim, don't have the resources to swim. So you have a continent that is already on track to lose, to face a headwind of about negative 5% in GDP growth per year from the climate change already locked in. An example of that, until 2019, my country, Kenya, was one of the fastest growing economies in the world. Ran smack dab in addition to the COVID pandemic, which has its climate, uh, some would argue is in part related to climate in terms of human-animal conflict. Um, but in, in addition to the pandemic, we had a four-year drought. That four-year drought has placed a measurable drag on the economy and taken it in some ways off track. Second thing. The economies are too small to meaningfully invest in some of the solutions that are needed to, to, to bolster their people. And finally, as you think about how to reaccelerate the economies of places like Africa, we're finding that this part of the world, which had the least to do with the current stock of greenhouse gases, 
now faces the challenge of having to grow its economies, generate opportunities for its people without leveraging the technologies of the 20th century to do so, because there's simply not the political or the financial support for doing that anymore. So very often, that's where the conversation ends. Africa, climate victim, people feel bad about it. Um, there's a debate about where might we be able to secure some resources to help the people of Africa d deal with their plight. But let's first focus on the bigger problem and the trillions of dollars that need to be deployed to solving the challenge. And I would argue that's a mistake. So the sheer scale of the problem suggests a different role for Africa. Now, we are heading for the stock take. Uh, Marcus talked about it. And I think we can predict a couple of things. We will be reminded that right now, if we're serious about getting to net zero by 2050, by the way, I made sure to take out any actual numbers from my conceptual slides because I realized I'd be presenting them to many of the sources for those numbers, and you never want to have a typo in there. So this is conceptual deliberately. Some countries cannot aim and are not aiming to reach net zero by 2050. They are in the peak of their industrial acceleration. They're talking about dates in the 2060s, 2070s, 2080 even. Some countries have made net zero promises, and I think what the homework that we're getting graded in a few months' time at the stock take is going to show is very few of them are on track to live up to those commitments. That means we have a whole pile of emission, additional emissions beyond what we need by 2050 already on, on deck. Arithmetic, if it works still the way that I was taught in primary school, means that we must be expecting some countries to remove carbon at massive scale over and above their own emissions. To essentially go, I used to say carbon negative, I prefer to say climate positive. Now, Africa is the continent that's closest to net zero today. Our per capita emissions are the lowest on the globe. It stands to reason that there's an opportunity there to go in the other direction. Now, this is increasingly recognized, and very often people jump to a legitimate conclusion. There's a huge opportunity in protecting that Africa's natural ecosystems, which are already some of the last remaining protected ecosystems or relatively untouched ecosystems of the world, and perhaps expanding them. So we did some analysis um, looking at a different carbon prices, what might be possible. And this picture here suggests that, you know, call it between one, at, at $100 a ton, and granted, we just wanted to set it out there, just say, if price was not really an issue, right now we're seeing prices between 10 and $20 a ton, but it wasn't an issue, Africa could probably do something like 1.3 gigatons between protection of existing ecosystems, uh, which accounts for about 750, gigaton, uh, 750 million tons a year, and about 600 million tons a year of removals from actually expanding nature-based solutions. That's what Africa could do in this space. We should do that, right? We should create the incentives to do that. That's beginning to pick up momentum in a number of countries. A lot of attention now going to things like what the voluntary carbon markets can do to create the jobs and the opportunities. You can, there's a version of this that shows that this creates something like 140 million jobs just doing this, just caring for and expanding the nature base. Now, not all of these are new jobs. Some of these are livelihood improve improvements to smallholder farmers uh, and so on. But there's a real economic opportunity here. And it's a broad-based economic opportunity. However, it's not the only opportunity. There's a potential for a whole other type of opportunity that builds on Africa's other attributes. And what are those attributes? A superabundance of renewable energy is one. 40%. 40% of the world's terrestrial solar energy hits the African continent. Despite that, only 1.2% of the world's installed base of solar is in Africa. And actually, in 2021, the last date for which we have data, only 0.6% of global investment in solar went to Africa. Now, there are a number of investors here. If I told you that you were leaving your best raw resource on the bench, while deploying your limited supply of, of photovoltaics and other resources to places with less good solar, you'd say, we're making a mistake. The second thing, limited emissions that renewable energy can be used to displace. This is an important challenge. We've talked about the fact that most of the pathways in DAC will require energy, large amounts of energy. 
we've also acknowledged that the first priority has to be shutting down existing emissions. And that means that as this industry begins to scale, we're going to run into a logical challenge. Right? And there's no way around it. Where does the marginal unit of energy go? Towards powering another DAC plant or towards shutting down the remaining fossil fuel infrastructure? Now, sometimes that choice can be avoided. But in many cases, it really does rule out a lot of the more established economies as places where you can do this at scale without, in some ways, unnecessary trade-offs. We've got large endowments of land and other natural resources, including our subterranean geology, right? Massive continent. The one I'm most excited about is our large and entrepreneurial young workforce. Back in the, in the first picture, Africa is a climate victim. Africa is the youngest continent. 2.5 billion people, a quarter of the world's population, will live in Africa by 2050. Try inspiring those people with a story about how they're the victim of the world's other actions and they are passive in the face of the disaster that's affecting them. That's not a way to motivate anyone. That's a course for disaster. So how do you motivate them? How do you give them a purpose? How do you activate them? And finally, all those people are going to need to live in places. They're going to need to build. Much of Africa's infrastructure has not been built yet. 40% of new urban dwellers in the world between now and 2050 are going to be in Africa. The fastest growing urban environments in the world are going to be in Africa. That's a whole lot of concrete into which you might be able to inject CO2, among other things that you could do. You can build an entire infrastructure, which is already starting to be built along new principles. Let's not repeat the mistakes of the 20th century. Now, in all of this, the one that I always come back to is the young workforce. Uh, Jason Hockman of the DAC Coalition has been great at pulling together, helping us pull together and connect people in Africa, in Kenya, and other countries that are concerned about climate change and want to engage in climate action into the broader DAC community. And he made an interesting point, and I'm attributing it to him in case it doesn't land. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, we talk about Ma Malcolm Gladwell, uh, you, you may have heard, you know, makes the point that one of the, if you wanted to be a landmark corporate lawyer, the best place and time to be born was a garment district in New York in the 1930s at the takeoff of corporate law, takeoff of corporate finance. Uh, that put you in the right place. If you wanted to be one of the titans of the technology industry, you could do worse than to be born on the west coast of the United, United States in the mid-1950s. There's an argument that says, given these resources, to be a young person born around, 19, uh, around the year 2000 in places like the East African Rift positions you really well to be one of the titans of that trillion dollar industry by 2050. And that's the vision we're going after. So let me give some tangible examples of what this potential looks like. Um, this is Kenya, home. Yeah. Um, on one level, you have Lake Naivasha, or Karia, the center of the Kenya's geothermal industry. Um, similar place to Iceland in many ways, about 900 megawatts of electricity produced there. They're adding 100 megawatts every year. The reason they're not adding more, there's 10 gigawatts of potential, is there's no demand. No demand even for the 10 gigawatts of pure geothermal. We haven't touched on the world's best wind and some of the best solar. We'll come back to that in a moment. Naivasha is an industrial town. It's a growing town. There's lots of young people coming there with various skills, various technical attributes, looking for jobs. You go further north, Lake Turkana, the world's largest alkaline lake. Right next to it, Lake Turkana Wind Farm, the largest wind farm in Africa. It's 300 megawatts, but it could do easily 1.5 gigawatts, and it's next to several others. This is the world's second best performing terrestrial wind farm, period. Right? The second best in the world in terms of its uptime. And the reason it's not expanding, no demand. Literally, we're saying, who needs gigawatts upon gigawatts of renewable energy, we've got it for you, alongside basalts, alongside lots of water, some of it alkaline, that might be useful, um, and alongside a young workforce. So how do we unlock it? Some of that is just bringing the pieces together. You need various industries to show up, expressing demand. Direct air capture is a good one, because you're not shipping anything out. Once you've installed the capacity, um, it's there, and you're just monetizing it. But there are others as well, green ammonia, the whole hydrogen economy, a whole range of other energy-hungry industries. So this is the shore of Lake Turkana. Sparsely populated, really, really needs the investment, and has the potential to be one of the major 
renewable hubs of the planet, re renewable energy hubs of the planet. But it needs to be unlocked. And that's the work that Great Carbon Valley, a company that we're backing, is getting into, is how do we make sure that the storage, the mineralization capacity is in locations like Lake Trucana and Naivasha, that we bring together the energy providers, that we bring together players in DAC and other climate smart technologies to do something at scale and do it quickly. Not just for the planet, but to also transform this economy. And to realize a vision of global decarbonization and climate positive growth. And climate positive growth is a real possibility for Africa. If we look at the traditional picture right here of what economic growth has typically looked like, you look at countries by GDP and emissions per capita, all of Africa is clustered as close to zero and zero as you can get. The traditional path has been you grow your emissions and then you grow your economy. That's not going to be available to Africa. Africa is going to need to do three things. The first one is embrace low emissions production and consumption for its own needs. Leapfrog to e-mobility, leapfrog to green agriculture, and so on and so forth. 2.5 billion people, they cannot increase their emissions footprint the way that the rest of the world did. Otherwise, we are locked into disaster. The second thing Africa can do is be a hub for emissions intense industries or energy intense industries that could use those terawatts literal terawatts of renewable energy and raw materials that the continent has to offer. And the third thing is it can go past the zero line and build a massive industry, be the home of that trillion dollar industry that is carbon removal, and thus grow its economy while actually increasing the global carbon budget. No one has ever managed that. Someone is going to have to if we're going to make it to net zero by 2050. So, the obvious questions, typically, when I'm out here talking about Africa doing this or that, folks will say, well, but are the governments engaged in this? Do people understand this? Interestingly, you're starting to see policymakers on the continent understand that this is their shot. For decades, the challenge has been, how do you break out of a set of poverty traps that are really difficult to break out of? And people are realizing that Africa, by virtue of missing out, on a lot of 20th century style investment and growth is actually uniquely positioned to be a winner in climate sensitive and climate smart 21st century development. So there are new policies and regulations that align with Kenya's climate centric growth agenda that, the, that, that, that our president has adopted. There's a national carbon removal roadmap. Kenya is one of the very few countries that's actually saying, what's our policy around creating a space for this industry across engineered and nature based methods? How do we make this a real hub for this type of work? There's a commitment to taking our grid, which is currently 92% renewable, to 100% renewable by 2030, and growing it from 3 gigawatts, nothing to write home about, to 100 gigawatts by 2040. The resource is there. It's mapped. The question is, can we find the demand that attracts the investment? And then finally, how do we move this narrative? How do we move the thinking of folks from Africa as a climate victim to potentially the key to achieving a climate positive future for the planet? And that's the basis for the Climate Action Summit that's planned for September 4th to the 6th. It's a gathering, yes, focused on Africa, but in a different way. The goal is to make the case, here are the ways that Africa can, in addition to deserving investment and support by virtue of having not caused this, is actually a place you should invest in proactively because it offers some of the best returns as a, as a place for proactive solutions. And we're hoping to start to bring together a different kind of climate community of innovators, investors, and actors to come to Kenya, understand the continent's potential, and begin to think about where we might be able to deploy and execute. Hope to see you there. And as we say in Kenya, asanteni sana. That's thank you very much for your patience. And uh, see you in Nairobi in September. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, James. Okay, it's now time for our final panel session for the day. Once again, you'll be able to ask questions. Um, I'll get them right here on my phone, and we'll be opening the floor as well in a moment. Now, I think it's fairly well documented that disadvantaged communities 
continue to bear the brunt of the effects of climate change, of global warming, while having contributed the least. So what role can direct air capture and CDR play in benefiting these communities? We're going to have a deep dive now on the role of environmental justice. And for that, I would like to welcome to the stage Ugbad Kossar from Carbon 180, Simone Stewart from the National Wildlife Federation, and Nikki Batchelor from XPRIZE Carbon Removal. Hi. <laughs> Welcome, come in, sit down. Um, so I think I've gone some way in it, trying to explain what uh, environmental justice is, um, or certainly highlighting the, the, the challenge that we're facing. So maybe I can speak to you all as to what is environmental justice? What are we talking about here today? Nikki, maybe you can, I can start with you. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Nice to be up here today. And I just maybe might take a small step back and think about the conversation really around what is responsible deployment, and I would say, you know, environmental justice is a key component of that, but also it's important to think about, you know, what are environmental impacts and harms and risks of these projects? What does it look like to have equitable and just deployment in the communities that we're going to? What does it look like to start engaging communities and recognizing that there are past harms? that have occurred and especially in a lot of the frontline communities and you know I think that having a holistic perspective on the topic is important but I'll, I'll let my colleagues join in sure. here. Sure, yeah I'm happy to, to hop in. Um, I know that environmental justice has come up a lot more in recent years especially in the carbon removal conversation um, but it's actually a really long-standing both social movement and a field of study so there's a lot of scholarship that's out there there are a lot of experts that specialize in this work um, and there's a a broad umbrella, especially in the context of the US, which is the context in which we're speaking of, um, of a history of it being rooted in civil rights, in occupational health and safety, in labor movements, um, indigenous uh, sovereignty and protections. And ultimately, what it's trying to do is address um, the history of environmental racism in the US. This can be applied to a lot of other conversations, but this is really where the root of the, the movement came from and where it was based in. Um, there's no single legal definition for what environmental justice is, but there are a lot of sort of common themes like um, healthy living environments, protections for all, access to clean air, um, access to open space, all of these sort of thematic um, pieces fall under the broader definition of, of EJ. Um, and that's a little bit different than climate justice, although there's a lot of shared ideas and principles because what would the difference be yeah so climate justice is actually looking at um, the climate change or looking at climate change through a human rights lens so acknowledging the fact that climate change is going to impact different people in different ways and specifically it's going to impact those that are least responsible the most so we're looking at from a global context global south countries places in, in where my family's from, in, in Somalia, and I know we were just having a conversation about Kenya, um, places in Asia, um, whereas environmental justice is more of like a place-based, sort of looking at local conditions, looking at local impacts like air quality, like water quality. So there's a lot of shared themes, but these terms are not necessarily interchangeable. I think it's really interesting that you, so you've explained to me the, the, the current situation, but Nikki, you brought up this great, um, a phrase which is who's responsible you know responsibility who is responsible for this i mean we're at a direct air capture summit is this our responsibility surely this is the kind of responsibility that lies with governments simona yeah um thank you so much for having me everyone um i think that the responsibility question is one that people are really interested in getting an answer to because communities feel as though they have borne the brunt of you know harmful industries for a very long time whether it is you know heavy industry or we're talking about oil and gas and so i think when we talk about responsibility that's something i frequently hear um, in the cdr sector or in the dac sector is we weren't responsible for the previous harms so how come it is now integrated into our workflow, our strategy that we have to care about environmental justice. And I think that one of the things that I always like to point out when we have conversations with communities or community development groups or individuals, um, you know, oftentimes people in the sector are talking about their concerns. So whether it's applying for DOE hub applications or even in conversations between developers, we're saying a community is concerned about this, they're concerned about that. But I, what I think that we don't ask communities enough is, 
what is your vision for your future? And how does direct air capture, how does CDR play into that vision? And I think that when we think holistically, like Nikki was saying, about the role CDR plays in creating a healthy and sustainable society, then to me it becomes obvious answering and addressing this question is a part of the work that we have to do in order to move forward to that future that we can co-create with communities. Mm -hmm. Uh, Nikki and Ubad, you actually just um, co-published a report on some of the challenges that we're facing when it comes to environmental justice. Nikki, maybe you can explain a little bit more about what you found. Yeah, so just for context, um, we published this report a couple of months back, and it was really to focus on this topic from the lens of the XPRIZE carbon removal, which I manage, and we were trying to start to gather data around how all of the carbon removal startups are thinking about this topic. So there was a, a component to the milestone round submission that we did last year that was a questionnaire of like, how are you thinking about all of these different environmental justice topics? We kind of collated that data and did some analysis around how people are, are looking at it and then worked with Carbon 180 and a team of EJ experts and practitioners to then like craft recommendations based on that for the companies themselves. So one of the biggest things that we saw is that many people still immediately equate environmental justice with job creation. Mm -hmm. That is like the first thing that people think of. It was the most frequently cited reference in all of the answers. And so that's something you know, that we've been talking a lot about is, yes, that's important, but that is a very narrow view of what environmental justice is and should be thought of at a company. And so trying to then broaden the thinking to include like understanding what the communities have experienced in the past, starting to think about like what it might look like to go do engagement. I'll let Ukbag to, to speak more about some of the recommendations that we came out from. But the the report itself is both meant to be, you know, a reporting of like the state of the the companies and how people are thinking about it right now, but also something to move us forward because we really need more resources on the topic. How often are companies even thinking about this? Pretty often, actually. Okay. Um, I think it's, it's definitely a growing conversation, and I think more and more companies are starting to understand not only is it maybe there's a moral imperative where you want to do the right thing and you believe in that, it's important that everyone is involved and everyone is protected, but there's also a business case for this as well of it builds resiliency into your business. It helps with really good deployment. It makes sure that you're not hitting those road bumps that come when you are doing deployment that hasn't been thoughtful or doing deployment that hasn't had community buy-in. I know social acceptability has come up, public license has come up. All of these terms and all these ideas are tied back into the principles of what environmental justice is, which is making sure that projects happen where they are wanted and in a way that they are wanted. So these are really important pieces. Um, and just tying back to um, what Nikki said about the report, one of the things that we, what we recognize is people know, people want to do this work Developers, early startups, large-scale commercial, I mean, the, the entire span, but they just don't know how to get started. And I think that's where a lot of the work is, is how do you do in, uh, community engagement really well? How do you know where to reach out to and how to have that conversation? And, and I think that's where the crux of the recommendations that we're trying to get at is, which is not only doing it to do it, but to do it well. Okay, so I'm, I'm guessing that one of your recommendations is this engagement with Absolutely. your communities. Um, what do you mean by that? Uh, yes. Give some ideas into some steps for, for, for companies that are watching. Yes, so community engagement is not just getting a community to agree to the project that you're trying to do, and I think that's a really important piece to underline. Um, community engagement is a two-way learning and conversation. It's you as a project developer having an idea or um, some sort of project that you want to deploy or you want to explore, and you're looking into where can I do it and how should I do it. Now, the community engagement piece, the two-way piece comes in when you are not only answering questions, but you are also receiving questions and you are um, asking them as well. I think the other piece that's really important is when you go into a town hall or um, maybe DOE is hosting a session, whatever it may be, you are actively listening with the idea to input 
the feedback you get back into your business plan or your deployment. It should also come out with some sort of characteristics that are going to change from your project based on what you're hearing. So whether it's specific pieces of the project you're doing, whether it's thinking about other co-benefits that can come from your project and, and being really creative about that, or ultimately, in some cases, maybe rethinking the location that you're going to be deploying altogether because it's just not wanted. So I think that two-way piece is really important and making sure that it's really transparent and accessible as well. And I mean, I think, especially from a startup perspective, and please, I, I, I just want to play devil's advocate for a second, yeah. but you know, surely um, this kind of engagement with a community is just a nice to have. I'm, I'm guessing it's not, but uh, Nikki, Simone. Yeah, no, I think that, um, you know, it is, it is nice to have, like Ubad said, like there is a, a moral component in it that we should care about others and that we are doing the work we're doing because we care about the climate and the climate is all something that we share as a planet. So there is an idea that it is just good to do, but I also think that it is, it's more than just good, but it's responsible. I think building community engagement, building um, environmental justice into the strategies and plans that you're creating should just be a part of any type of project that you do. Any type of project, even when you were in school, you know, you made room for feedback. Your teachers would write little notes on your essays to let you know what they thought. Hopefully you would take that feedback from them and then you would incorporate that into the next paper and get a better grade on it. It's not something that I think most of us are unfamiliar with, but I think that for a very long time, large industries have been able to operate without having to consider the communities that they've operated in. And I think that that's what's put us in this this you know situation in the first place that communities haven't been considered and i think that oftentimes communities have ideas. They are, you know, if you can get people in the room, people are eager to talk about their perspectives um, and share. And I think people feel more comfortable doing that with people that they trust and people that they know are going to incorporate that feedback in order to steer the project in a direction that is not just good for the project developers, but that they know is going to be good for their community. I have a mechanical engineering background and migrated into policy um, from that. But one of the things that, you know, I talk about and I always say is I am an expert in mechanical engineering. I am an expert in policy. I am not an expert in a community's lived experience. People that have lived in those communities, oftentimes for generations, that have familial ties back to them, that have really, really solid culture built in these places, are experts in that culture. And so in order to have a conversation with people, just as you would hope, the people in this room, would hope that people would respect your expertise. You know, I don't want to be told how to be an engineer because I know how to be an engineer. You should come with that same respect to communities, to respect their knowledge of their community. They know what's going to work best. They know what hasn't worked in the past. So I think not trying to put one um, you know, expertise above another, but really trying to marry the two of them is what's most important. Do you just, have any? Yeah. I was just going to say, I'll just yeah. add two other kind of layers for the consideration. I agree with everything you said, but I mean, there, there are other lenses to look at this from, from a business perspective. If you're thinking about you know, the potential risks of your project being cited in a, a community that is not supportive of where you're going. So there's kind of a social license to operate element here that people can justify their work on the topic from a business perspective. And then also, I think just broadly as a community right now, we're building something new that is very unknown and unfamiliar to a lot of people. And there are a lot of iterations of what it might look like beyond just direct air capture. We're talking about enhanced weathering and ocean solutions and things that you know, have public perception risks. And so the first handful of demonstrations that really get built and talked about out in the world will have a large impact on how this community can scale, how we can really, you know, build more projects and all of that is critical to addressing the climate challenge as we've been talking about all day. So thinking about this as part of your, you know, commitment to the ecosystem as well to have projects go smoothly and be supported by and, you know, desired by the communities that you're trying to go and work in is important and thinking about the other side of that and the benefits that you're bringing with those projects is, is key. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is this something that we can learn from other industries? We, we've talked about that already as well today, but is this community engagement, is this environmental justice something that we can learn from other industries? And, and if so, how? 
But uh, sure, I'm happy to start. Um, absolutely, I think uh, that's the only real resource that we have right now is looking at similar or similar like um, industries. So whether it's thinking about what happened in the renewable space, deployment in some places went really well because there was great community engagement at the outset. There was buy-in, there was co-creation. I mean, there's even small scale like community solar that mm -hmm. has really sort of reinvigorated the idea of understanding technology is not the enemy, it's the way in which it's going to be implemented mm -hmm. that really makes or breaks it. Um, there's, uh, with the renewables piece, I mean, jobs is something that comes up all of the time when you hear uh, an environmental justice benefit. And with the uh, renewable energy sector, I mean, sometimes those jobs didn't necessarily come to fruition, and that actually caused blowback to the solar industry and trust from a lot of the developers with the co communities in which they wanted to deploy. And so if you're going to think about the benefits, being really realistic and saying these are the ones that we absolutely know we can bring, and here are the ones that we need to honestly have a discussion about of whether or not it can come to fruition, that's a really big lesson I think that we need to take away from other industry. I think also, um, you know, maybe learning from what industries have done and learning from what industries haven't done. Uh, oftentimes, a lot of people's skepticism in these communities is because of oil and gas and heavy industry. And so looking back, it's really important, I think Nikki said it, that we really understand the history of what has happened in a particular community. I think it's very difficult to create a path forward for a community without understanding how they got to the place that they're at. And so doing the research on the community, talking to people about the experiences that they've had, I think really should shape the way that that engagement looks going forward. When you know that someone has been harmed in a really specific way and previously, you're going to do everything in your power to not repeat that. So I think, you know, also taking examples and lessons from specific things that have happened in renewables, but also looking at, you know, other aspects of the energy industry from the past and thinking about how we can move forward with that information now that we know it. Mm -hmm. Nikki, maybe you can explain a little bit more about how these relationships have been developing and um, some of the good points and some of the challenges that we're facing in uh, connecting with the community. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the key piece of this conversation is recognizing that the projects are hyper-localized. And so the communities are not one size fits all. It's a completely different set of considerations, experiences, locations, geographies, demographic makeups. And so, you know, when we're, a lot of this perspective too is, is US driven with a lot of the environmental justice movement, but now we're talking about a global industry and deploying projects all over the world and companies crossing borders, you know? Mm -hmm. Maybe you started in the US, but you're deploying in Kenya or wherever it may be. And so recognizing you know, that that lens that you're bringing might be completely different to the context that you're going to. So the key piece of doing community engagement from the outset is really understanding what those considerations need to be and what the needs are of that community, what their experiences are that they're bringing to the table because maybe you're you know, in a rural fishing village and they know nothing about DAC, they don't maybe need to if you're working on an ocean solution and they might not have any you know, predisposition to oppose it, they might love it. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, there's I think a range of experiences and representing like hundreds of startups, I'm seeing that everybody has a different reaction to this topic and by saying, you know, we want you to think about this from day one, you know, for some it's really easy and for others it's a lot harder because of kind of the communities you're going into or the technology or solution you're bringing to the table brings its own kind of risks potentially mm -hmm. with it. Yes, please. Can I hop in that? Um, I think something else that maybe take, is taken for granted is that you are understanding what the community is asking or saying and they're understanding you. I think the carbon removal field has a bit of a communications issue, <laughs> um, to put lightly, where there's not necessarily shared language across the board, and there's a lot of acronyms, there's a lot of verbiage, there's a lot of jargon. There's it, peeling back that language and having a really shared understanding of what it is you're actually talking about. Like, this is what director capture is or isn't, and it is not point source CCS for these reasons, but there's these similarities in these instances. I mean, having that type of conversation will take you very far because when, we, when I engage with a lot of environmental justice organizations or local um, advocates, 
half the time we're just making sure we're talking about the same thing before mm -hmm. we can actually dig into the details and really understand where the risk or the the, um, the pushback is actually coming from. I mean, this is something that I wanted to bring up as part of our conversation anyway, because I know that you three work on educational projects specifically to kind of cut through that jargon. But maybe if I can circle back to, the, to that at the end, because before I do that, I want to understand, sure, we engage with communities so that we can have better relationships with them, but how does environmental justice and how does all of this that we're talking about, how does this help scale the business, the industry that we're ultimately in. Does it have that feedback loop? I think that Nikki kind of touched on it, that you know, it's about, we talk about social license to operate, but I think that it's very, um, it's very evident that, that you know, one drop can poison the well. And it's very difficult to move forward when there is a bunch of negative press around a particular project. As Ugbad just said, there's a lot of times and circumstances where we're really just pointing out the differences between what CDR is versus CCS. And now, if there's issues within CCS, to once again take another step of nuance to say, well, this project isn't that project, and that's how they're different, um, I think it's really difficult. It sometimes may be frustrating as people who are working in this field or advocates of this field, because you truly do believe in the technology and what you think the technology can bring to a community, but oftentimes communities don't necessarily have the bandwidth to handle all of the nuance that goes into the conversation. And, you know, I think that is a, a ramification of, especially in America, what we're experiencing and historically these communities have experienced. And so I think it's not just about getting communities on board, but once again, kind of getting community feedback to understand how we can become better engineers, better developers. And I think that it, you know, sourcing that information, crowdsourcing that feedback allows us to become more inclusive of the entire process. Because when I think about the future that I want, I think about the net zero, zero carbon future. I want it to be a future that everyone participates in. Because for far too long, we have had only certain people making decisions, certain demographics of people, certain types of people in certain industries. And well, we, we understand that's where we are right now. So I would really like if we're going to improve and make things better, I think we really, it's integral to bring everyone into the conversation to make it really inclusive. Okay, so what are some of your recommendations then, Nikki? I mean, I'll add another kind of layer onto that question that you were just addressing too. I mean, if you just think practically about like the footprint of what it looks like in the technology like scale up journey here. If we can't convince a community that it's a good idea with the smallest size plant <laughs> that could be beneficial that people could wrap their minds around, how are we gonna get to that support at a scaled up version? So I do think it is critical to be thinking about it now because mm. if we're off to the wrong start now, it's gonna be very difficult to catch up if the support you know, really goes awry and that builds momentum. So I think that that's really important. The recommendations piece, I mean, I would, we've talked about a couple already. I think um, I would add into the mix, like this concept of a trusted messenger. We've talked about how important it is to kind of understand the perspective and experience and expertise of the community. It can also be powerful to bring on representatives of that community, either directly or advisors or as a kind of a liaison between the, the company and what they're trying to do and you know the community because they have all those relationships. They understand how to speak both sides. So I would say that that can be a powerful vehicle to explore if it's something that you know, your company has the ability to do it. We've been like on the side trying to encourage other funders to continue supporting this work. And I think ideas have been thrown out around like maybe fellowship programs where people can be trained on like how to go into different areas or maybe even you could like apply and get some funding to have someone from your local community come onto your, your team for a period of time. I think there's a lot of really cool ideas that could be explored here. And now that there's definitely interest and in growing demand and trying to figure out how to do this, not just that it matters, but like, how do I get started? Give me a roadmap of 10 steps. I think that's what I'm hearing from companies who we're asking to. They're, they're thirsty for that. So there's an opportunity for more resources to be put out. I think also bringing it back to DAC specifically, because um, that's what we're talking about here, there's a lot of work to be done in think being creative about the co-benefits that can come with director capture. So yes, there's the very obvious 
carbon removal, permanent sequestration potential, and the broader climate good that that will bring. And then there's the idea of jobs that keeps coming up that we can talk about. Um, but being creative about what other benefits, if, if they do exist, and if not, how can we be forward and upfront about that? I raise that because what I hear all of the time in the work that I do is, we want trees, and we want soils, and we trust this, and we're familiar with it, and it's safe, and it brings us clean air and clean water, and it brings us um, access to open space, and just all of these things that, and these benefits that make their day-to-day -day lives better and addresses the immediate concerns that they have here and now today, which is access to all of these things. So when we think about direct air capture, we need to also be starting to think about how does this intersect with that? And if it doesn't, we need to have a conversation about mm -hmm. that as well. I think that um, Ubad really makes a good point and that oftentimes I tell people in the industry, we have to get creative about this. Um, you know, I think that oftentimes the technological um, development, everybody says, well, it's good for climate, so it's good for that community, so the community should get on board with it. Um, and I think that's kind of a, a narrow perspective uh, because what people really want in their daily lives is for their needs to be addressed. And oftentimes what we've seen come out of the environmental justice movement as a branch of the civil rights movement was that people's needs, people's humanity was not being addressed. And that's what's continued, that's what's been added on to by you know, previously toxic industries in these communities. And so I think it's okay to think outside of a very kind of like linear capitalist perspective of like, I need to develop this project and I need to make money off of this project. But I think that you know, thinking a little bit abstractly is, is to, as to what the benefits really can be and how the benefits are linked to not only people's daily lives, but changing the systems that we live in that create the problems that people are experiencing in their daily lives. Oftentimes, these disadvantaged communities are very disenfranchised. And if you, know, if you talk to me, you've probably heard the example before that one day I was getting a, a car share, um, and I was on the app getting ready to order the car, and all of the images of the car had a little American flag on the app. And I was like, I wonder what this is. And it was actually a promotion that the car share operator worked with local communities to offer discounted rides if the person was going to a polling place that would allow them to vote. And so that was able to increase access in disenfranchised communities where maybe people would ride share or share with other people. Um, you know, the two of us, we could split a ride share to go vote. And that was something that was empowering for the community. So direct air capture might not be something that you automatically connect to going to go vote. But thinking about creatively about the way that we can use the technology, the companies, to benefit the communities that they're in in a way that can change the systems that have led to the oppression of these people is, is the creativity that I really like to see. Oh, well, I'm, I'm very much enjoying that story <laughs> and, and the possibilities that are out there. Um, I can see that some of the questions are already coming in online, and I want to get to them. But I did want to talk about education. And I guess we've also been circling around this conversation as well throughout this about the lack of communication, yeah. about the lack of people understanding what direct air capture is. They relate far more to trees than they do to a great big metal plant. You know, what, what needs to be done? What education needs to be out there to close this gap? But yes, so I will shamelessly plug <laughs> that at Carbon 180. Um, we work directly with EJ organizations to do this exact thing, which is education. So we have three EJ env uh, environmental justice organizations that are based in different parts across the United States. And they were very apprehensive, if not skeptical, if not outright opposed to carbon removal when we initially reached out to them. But the thing about them was that they were very open to learning and they were very open to having a conversation. And we spent the past year with them just going through Carbon Removal 101, not only talking about the great benefits of DAC, but we talked about the limitations of all these different pathways. We talked about the risks. We talked about the unknowns that's out there. We talked through the communications narrative, what's happening in reporting, what's happening um, in the, on the Hill and with um, policymakers and legislation and how do all of these different pieces intersect with what's happening in their community or what could happen in their community. Um, and I'm not gonna say, I know Aaron mentioned earlier, they're not necessarily you know, gonna go out and protest for carbon removal, <laughs> um, but they're far more open to the idea and they're taking the information we gave and bringing it back to the communities that trust them. And they're that first source of information and that's sort of that, that organic, sort of education that we're wanting to hopefully 
inspire and, and really create this sort of self-sustaining grassroots movement for carbon removal where it's not technocratic, it's not top-down, but it's really for the people, by the people, and we're just there as resources for education and to answer questions and to honestly rethink our assumptions in the way that we work as well. Mm. I mean, one of the questions that's come in online is, you know, what is the role of education in community engagement? And I guess you have really kind of outlined it, but maybe I put it to you that, is it that we have to go one step further? It's not just education. You said it yourself. It's transparency. Yeah. Yeah. So oftentimes when I tell people I work for the National Wildlife Federation, they, I kind of get a look like, what are you doing in this room? Or I get fear like you're going to protest and shut us down. <laughs> um, but the National Wild Wildlife Federation has a climate and energy policy program, and that's where I'm housed as an industrial policy specialist. The Federation also has 52 chapters across the U.S. and its territories. So the chapters are completely autonomous. They're really focused on what's happening in their state. And one of the ways that we talk to them is, you know, NWF is a historic conservation organization. We've been around for over 100 years. And the conservation that you are typically used to is exactly what CDR is. It's just a natural version of that. So I think really meeting people where they're at in terms of what is important to them, what is familiar, like Ugbad said to them, and then using that as a platform to then say, okay, you people that do conservation are very well versed in the benefits of carbon dioxide removal. So now let's take it another step further and maybe introduce some concepts that you aren't familiar with, like tech technological removal. Um, and I think, you know, we have a very broad constituency. I was joking earlier, earlier today that we're one of the organizations that has, you know, a public constituency. So we're in your inbox saying, the whales are dying, climate is changing, can you please give us $10 mm -hmm. um, sort of thing. And we reach people by, you know, talking about what is important to them and what they care about. Maybe that is a particular type of animal. We have a big hunting and fishing constituency. So we reach out to them and say, you know, in this particular region, people, uh, the hunting restrictions were changed around this particular species of deer, and hunters were upset about it. Do you know why it changed? It had to do with habitat loss. It had to do with species loss, and all of those things are connected back to climate. So I think public education, much like the engagement, is sort of a two-way street where you're not talking at people because, mm -hmm. you know, once again, using an education anal analogy, how many of us listen when our teachers talked at us versus it being a conversation moving back and forth? And so I think public education has to be viewed in the same way. It's a very kind of situational and local way of, of communicating ideas. Okay, let me open the floor then to questions. We've had a couple online already. Does anybody here in the room have a question for our panel now on environmental justice? I think there's one. Hi. Please don't be shy. Oh, thank you. Um, my name is Jaleed Kawaja. Um, I've got a question actually a request. So companies want to, um, to ha have social impact, right? They, they talk endlessly about it in their sustainability reports. <laughs> um, what are your top three pieces of advice for corporates to use their social impact programs um, to contribute towards environmental justice? Sure, I'm happy to hop in. Um, <laughs> the first thing that comes to mind for me is a lot of these companies hire big consulting firms to do research or to do analysis or to come up with their recommendations, hire someone local, hire a small community-based organization, hire someone from a disadvantaged community who knows the work that they're doing, who can bring that different lens, um, who can be very upfront and honest about what you are and are not doing and how it's impacting their day-to-day -day lives. I think that's the first piece that I would do. Um, similar to in that vein, but not just having external hiring, but internal hiring practices, I think are incredibly important. If you are hiring the same type of person, which I will call out is usually older white men, you're gonna have the same perspective on everything that you do and how you operate. When you really branch out and think about diversity, it's not just a, you know, a, a fun thing that's happening right now that's in diversity, equity, and inclusion. It genuinely does bring diversity of thought into the, the conversation. It brings lived experience. And people into, want to be seen yeah. by the, you know, you want to feel seen by the corporations that Absolutely. are in your communities. I want to know that there are people who look like me, who come from where I come from, because then I feel as though I'm being represented in that organization. Sorry to No, no, that was, that was perfect. Uh, as Simone said, um, I think you're also going to have that trust as well. If you have someone that looks like you, that came from a similar background as you, who's operating in this space, that message just lands differently than someone who 
honestly, the only reason why you're interacting is because of this one conference or this one conversation. So I, I genuinely think those two pieces alone are, are big things to chew off of for any sort of company to think of. I would add to that, you know, going back to the point about the voting that I mentioned, I would think big. I would think about the way that we can affect systemic change through the way that we are using our sustainability goals and our and engagement goals and community goals. I think that oftentimes we're too siloed in our area of expertise and deploying what we think is correct. And so I think, you know, trying to create systemic change that is going to lead to that inclusive future that I was talking about is a really big way of thinking. Um, and I, I would also just say that um, coming back to, to goal setting is looking at stuff that is measurable, the metrics as you're growing as a company, as you're advancing, to be able to look back and say, this is where we've come from. And so we're able to create a plan for the future. I think people want transparency. And when you're able to put markers in different aspects of your growth, that is a really easy way to start being transparent with people. Thank you. I'll add one more angle on this. I mean, if we're talking about in the context of buying carbon removal, I think there's a huge opportunity for corporations to say that this matters to them in their buying decisions. So I think, and we've been talking about the responsibility a lot so far around what the startups have on them to be responsible for in their deployments of projects. But there is also a responsibility, I would argue, on the funder side, the investor, philanthropic, buying, you know, anybody who's making those decisions and putting money into the space make this one of your layers of consideration, your screening criteria, or if you're not doing that directly, work with a partner who does. Great, any other questions in the room? Yes, please, thank you very much. For us, Dunkun and Finnish Parliament, um, the environmental justice discussion is of course very advanced in the US. Now we are in Europe and Climeworks has facilities in Switzerland and Iceland. And I'm not to overplay the differences between these countries and the US, but let's just say that they are quite different societies. <laughs> I just wonder if you have any um, ideas or perspectives on how the environmental justice discussion would be different in different contexts and different uh, countries like Switzerland and Iceland, for example. Absolutely. Um, I think very different, which is why I preface by saying that I was coming from a US-centric um, sort of perspective. But I think where the reason why I brought up climate justice and that global piece is that our economies are also connected around the world. And what you do in one place is going to impact someone else's livelihood somewhere else. So somewhere like Switzerland or thinking about Climeworks um, specifically, they're not operating just in Switzerland, right? They're operating in other parts around the world. There's supply chain considerations. There's long-term impact considerations. There's the, the global, the greater good conversation that we're thinking about. And so even though you are in Europe and the term environmental justice may mean something very different here. It may not have any meaning here, depending on who you speak to, but there are still global justice considerations that need to be included in the decision-making that you have. I would also argue that it may not be the traditional environmental justice in the way that we're talking about it, but there are still people who are less advantaged, I don't know what the term would be here, marginalized, there are different um, backgrounds, there's still some elements of what we're talking about that would hold true. I think it would be a little bit different, but I would still branch out to think about that global context in particular here. I think it also goes back to setting standards as a whole. I think environmental justice means something differently, and, and as Nikki kind of prefaced at the beginning that in America it comes from a very civil rights heavy context. There's a lot of historical kind of policy and legislation that led to where the environmental justice movement is today. So I encourage all countries who are interested in participating and thinking about how the history of their politics and legislation has led to marginalization of certain kinds of people. Because as far as you know, I know, no, no society is perfect. And so I think that, you know, even though some may be more advanced or the marginalized groups or disenfranchised groups may look a little bit different, there are still people who are going to be impacted. And, you know, maybe there are ways to also highlight how certain countries have met environmental justice criteria to say that because we know people here care about this particular thing, this is how we're meeting those needs that they care about in the work that we're doing. It may not look like, you know, brown people living close to a toxic waste facility is, is 
an example we use very frequently in the United States, but how are you meeting a community's needs that they ask to be addressed, and how are you connecting that to giving them a more healthy and sustainable environment? That itself is environmental justice. So I think, just as Ubad said, there's many contexts in which to think of it. Sorry, something else just came, and I... I go ahead. Okay. <laughs> um, I also think what's really important is, especially with like Climeworks, for example, it may be the first introduction of director capture to mm -hmm. people around the world. Yeah. And so the way in which they deploy and the considerations that they take is going to impact the impression of maybe what happens in the US and what happens in Kenya. I know that was brought up earlier. So there's also that, that responsibility of understanding we're really at the start of something huge. How are we going to take that responsibility? And how are you going to think about that public perception that's going to shape what's going to look like in 10 years? So it may not be environmental justice in the traditional sense, but you know, consent-based citing is mm -hmm. something that is still fundamentally felt across the world and should be considered. Um, community engagement, it may not look the way that we are describing it in the US, but you still need to do community engagement for the project that you're doing anywhere in the world and thinking about um, like I said, the global um, perspective, if you're planning on outsourcing any sort of work, if you're planning on having sites that are international, there's, there's a power dynamic there as well, and there's political dynamics there too. So really just being creative about how you're thinking about the fundamental principles that we're talking about and how it applies in your context is a little bit of homework maybe, but I think <laughs> something that's really important to, to think about for, for the future of not just the work that you're doing at your company, but honestly the entire industry that we're talking about. Well, I found this conversation absolutely fascinating. So thank you very much indeed for joining us. Please take another seat in the audience. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we're close to wrapping up the Direct Air Capture Summit 2023. In a moment, I'll be inviting Jan and Christoph back on stage for some very brief closing words. However, before we do that, we have one final video message to share with you today. And this person needs very little introduction. He's an innovator, he's a problem solver, he supports entrepreneurs, big thinkers, technology. There's not many opportunities for me to say this in my career, so I'm gonna get straight to it. Ladies and gentlemen, Bill Gates. Hello everyone. I'm pleased to join you today to express my appreciation for the great work being done to scale up direct air capture. Direct air capture is the gold standard for carbon removal. I've worked with Climeworks for several years and I'm grateful to them for bringing together so many of the innovative companies and leading voices in this space to work on the industry's future. The work taking place in direct air capture is very important and very exciting. Innovation in this space has advanced beyond what I would have expected just a few years ago. At Breakthrough Energy, we're seeing a lot of advances in climate technology happening very quickly. Every day, the team at Breakthrough and I are learning from entrepreneurs and innovators about their solutions which eliminate emissions in every sector. We, of course, need massive deep decarbonization, but for the hardest to decarbonize areas, we also need a huge amount of carbon removal. We need this carbon removal to be done in a way that is monitored, reported, and verifiable. I'm optimistic that we'll get there. In the United States, uh, the government has committed billions in tax credits and investment uh, to support this industry. We're seeing entrepreneurs and established industry leaders coming together to build direct air capture hubs and grow new value chains. Communities will see the benefits of direct air capture, including the creation of new jobs at these hubs. But of course, the US uh, can't be in this alone. Uh, like all of this work, we need to scale up a whole new industry, and we need to do it with a deadline. Thankfully, the European Union uh, also is developing a strong carbon removal certification framework. And that's a crucial step forward uh, so that uh, we know for sure that the carbon's being eliminated on a near permanent basis. In the future, 
uh, we want to link together the compliance market like the emission trading system, uh, but this requires a lot of additional work. So I'm sure that Europe will build on its legacy of climate leadership by making a long-term commitment to grow direct air capture in Europe. So there's a lot to do uh, to continue innovating, scaling up, and driving down costs for direct air capture. I'm optimistic, and I thank everybody doing the work uh, that's represented at this, the summit. Uh, I'm confident in the future. Thank you. Brief closing remarks. A theme I heard throughout the day was the power of small steps. That's a theme I'm personally very fond of. Was it the right thing to build Orca two years ago? Or would have, he, would have he been better to wait a couple of years and have 10x or 100x more capacity? Looking at what we got today, I can say it was the right thing for the whole industry to do it, to follow the puck, as, as Noah uh, said nicely before. The good news is, like Global Thermostat just started their plant, 1.5 announced they're starting their plant in, in, in 2025. Heirloom started a plant. And I'm sure all of those plants will create the same effect as, as we had with Orca and get this industry moving. And we heard this throughout the whole day, the power of small steps. In MRE, we heard it. We have to take the next steps. We heard it from the corporate buyers. It's important, well, obviously, to think big, but not forget about the next step to take in, in order to get it going. We heard it from Noah Deitch, it's important to build the next project. And very impressively, also by Rich Lesser, like pointing to the difference between 15% and 13% learning rate, which essentially results in 2x different cost. And how do we get 13% learning rate to 15% learning rate? Through, as Howard Herzog nicely said, determination and effort. And that's what I'm taking away from this day, I have the impression this industry is starting to march in small steps, and that makes me very happy. And when I look back over the past 16 years, over a very large portion of that time, our main concern was something like, how can we get this amount of CO2, get through that tube to get that capacity out of our plant? How can we get that prototype to work? How can we get that material to work? And it was really about the very, very essentials. Today, we spoke about many things, as Christoph has just mentioned, about the real implementation. We even, if you, if you listen to the discussions here, some of them actually took totally for granted that direct air capture is something that works and that can be done. So we were not talking about, is that prototype actually working, or things like that. We are not showing, oh, this plant has captured the first ton of CO2 from the air, but we talked about community engagement. It will be a big topic. Uh, as we move forward and install large-scale infrastructure. We talked a lot about MRV. So to me, this is, this is really a sign that this industry we are in has reached a next level and a next stage. And another thing that I realized and learned today, the cost of direct air capture was always the big question mark. Where can we go? Can we get to these famous $100 per ton, or maybe 200 or maybe less than that? And today, what I found very interesting that the cost was always spoken about in the context with scale. And today, when we're speaking about very low numbers, we always spoke about those numbers together with the scale of gigatons. And that is, I think, also something that we, that we have learned. What we, have, what we are doing has to become cheap and affordable, but it has to be deployed at a massive scale as well. So those were my takeaways. Very finally, I learned today that DAC is like, uh, like blood, like O negative blood. So maybe that's something we can also take away. Thank you, all of you. Thank you very much. <laughs>
<laughs> okay, so that wraps up. You can stay on stage or sit down. It's entirely up to you. <laughs> but that wraps up our Direct Air Capture Summit for 2023. For those of you joining us online, thank you very much indeed for being here. Uh, our session now ends. For the rest of you, thank you all so much for your inputs today. And our networking apparel is now underway. Enjoy.